Is the temperature okay for everyone? Not too cold, not too hot. I'm going to leave the air conditioning for a bit because yeah, it's um, fairly warm today. Fairly warm to who's in this kitchen? What's that? Fairly warm yeah. to who? Yeah. <laughs> for all room visits. <laughs> Here in Wingen, have summer about heat. <laughs> mm. Twenty-five degree heat. Oh, <laughs> terrible! Oh my god! <laughs> you got forty, right? <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah. Till ten o'clock at night, then it restarts at six. Yeah, right. <laughs> this wasn't down to Sydney, where he wants to hit it for like a half hour out of Sydney and goes to like forty. Cool, okay. So we're going to roll straight into aircraft technical knowledge. Uh, for PVLs. Um, lots of people find this subject really interesting. I think it's probably one of the more practical ones because you know it's directly relevant to you when you're flying the air um, and it's in your best in interest to know how the aircraft works um, for any sort of troubleshooting and that kind of thing. Um, moving further down the track, you know, once you do your seat gels, um, it becomes more and more relevant. If you look at buying your own aircraft, you want to know all the different types of engines and how they work and the avionics and all sorts of different systems. Um, so it's well worth putting in a bit of time to the subject because it'll, it'll give back to you. And um, there's a lot of value for pilots knowing the aircraft really, really well and the avionics as well. Um, that aside, it's just pretty interesting. Um, we'll do a few field trips throughout this um, course as well. I might try and get in one today just to the hangar. Um, Hamish tomorrow will probably do a few with you as well so you can actually see some of the stuff we're talking about. Um, it involves quite a lot of videos as well, and animations. And it's quite hands on, which is cool. Um, hopefully it'll, it'll keep you a bit more awake and a bit more today. Um, so yeah, feel free to sing out if you've got questions along the way. Um, pretty casual, just yell out if, if there's something that's not making sense or if you've got any stories or anything you want to add to it. Um, and we'll get cracking. We're probably not going to get through that much this afternoon. Um, I wouldn't mind going out to the hangar and just showing you a few bits and pieces on the aeroplane as well once we've finished talking about the airframe. Um, and then we'll sort of call it after the first couple of uh, sections. Um, and then Hamish is picking up tomorrow. I think it takes about two and a half, three days something to get through the whole subject. Um, so it's well worth just putting a bit of time to it because it'll, it'll get back to you as much as you can in that. Um, any questions so far? Everyone's got the red book. Oh, is it red or blue? It's actually blue. Eh? I have a red one. Because this is the CPL one. So if I give you references, um, you're going to be wrong. So I'll try not to. That's right. I'll see if I can track down my blue one. Um, so I want to start off with the airframe, and then we'll have a look at the engine. Okay, so it's a pretty critical thing. So for the first part, um, we're going to have a bit of an introduction, look at the, uh, the different key components of the aircraft in terms of the airframe itself, you know, the wings, the horizontal stabilizer, all that kind of stuff, tail section, 
Um, the basic flight controls, how they work, you guys will probably have a pretty good idea of that already because we've all done a little bit of flying. Um, undercarriage, engine, propeller, how we kind of join this together. Okay. Um, Alright, so that's TZK and it's all the paint job. Looks a little bit tidier these days. Um, but as you can see, it's a low wing aircraft. So the wings sit down here rather than on top. Um, it's a monoplane. So it's only got one set of wings. What kind of undercarriage do we have on that aircraft? Fixed. Fixed. What would be the opposite of fixed? Don't say broken. <laughs> yeah, retractable would be the, uh, the alternative to that, right? Um, so what's the uh, value of fixed versus retractable undercarriage? Drag. Yeah, it's a drag thing, but it's also a weight thing as well. So below certain weights um, of aircraft, um, it's, um, there's not much value in having retractable gear because by having retractable gear, it actually adds a whole lot of weight to put all the mechanisms in place. So that outweighs the, the loss of drag. So you're better off, instead of having retractable gear, just to have fixed gear, which are lighter, and then just put spats in there. So aerodynamically, it's going to reduce the drag a little bit. You'll gain about five knots of airspeed by having those there. Okay, if we took those off, then we will lose about five knots in the cruise. Um, all right, so this is the fuselage. Obviously, engines in there, propellers up the front. Pretty basic stuff, right? Um, that's what we call the empennage. Okay, the tail section, which consists of the horizontal and vertical stabilizer as well. Okay. It's basically the most simple um, example of an aircraft that we can really use as the aircraft that we fly every day, which is pretty handy. Um, and a few little extra bits and pieces as well. Um, ailerons, what do they do? Roll. Roll. Yeah. So when the ailerons deflect upwards and downwards, we control the aircraft and roll. Um, what about the pitch? What controls the aircraft's pitch? Elevator. Elevator. Okay. What do we have on the robin? Can anyone tell me? Trim. Um, yeah, we have trim. What else? Do we have an elevator? What do we notice about the uh, the horizontal stabilizer on the robin compared with the conventional light aircraft like a 172? Uh, it moves up and down. Yeah. What moves up and down? The, um, the Elevator park on it? Yeah, sort of. Um, it's a bit hard to tell when we don't have the actual aeroplane in front of us. I'll show you in a, in a bit when we go up there. But um, in the Robin, we've got what we call a. Um, it's a, an all moving tailplane. So it's it's not just an elevator, but it's a horizontal stabilizer as well. We call it a stabilator. Okay, because the whole thing moves. So there's no individual elevator. Um, so we'll have a look at two different examples of that as well. Right, what's that one? You know what kind of plane that is? Just generic term that we'd use for it. What's different? Yeah, it's a biplane. Right. It's got two sets of wings. Um, pretty stubby little thing, so it's an aerobatic bi biplane. I think it's a pits. Is it? No, no, maybe it's not a pit special. It looks like a pit special. Um, what about the undercarriage? What do we notice about that? Low to the uh, ground. Tail dragger? Yes, yeah, tail, tail dragger. Plane. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is pretty low to the ground. So in this situation, um, the single wheel is at the rear of the aircraft rather than up the front. And then the main gear are the, the front wheels, which means that when it's on the ground, yeah, it's, it's slightly behind us. Um, pretty common in, in light aerobatic aircraft because um, it reduces a lot of drag because they can make the tail wheel really, really small. Um, they're inherently a lot harder to control on the ground, though. You've got to keep the feet working pretty hard for that. Alrighty. Um, that's the construction of the fuselage there. Just see if I actually have the details. Give me two seconds. I'll see if I can find the blue box so I can actually give you the correct references for it. Might be a minute. Thank you. 
but it's still law, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, really? <laughs> you want to share? Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I found myself a brand new copy, but that means I can't put any creases in it, otherwise I get in trouble and I get charged for it. Alrighty. So, if you turn to chapter 2 on the airframe uh, for components, um, you'll see the fuselage here is what we call a uh, semi monocoque or a stress skin. Okay. So there's two ways of taking the models. There's the structure of the uh, frame, but there's also the skin of the aircraft around it. Okay, So both take a uh, load of the aircraft. Um, so it needs to be light, but it also needs to be strong. And so that's how it gains the, uh, the strength without adding too much weight. Okay. Um, so three different types. Uh, truss. So the one we see up here is a truss, um, where all the bending and twisting loads are uh, taken by the airframe itself. Um, a lot of the time, especially on older aircraft, the skin would just be like a fabric. Okay, so it's not very strong. All the load is taken on the airframe itself. Um, monocoque, which is um, all loads are resisted by the skin. Um, you don't often come across an aircraft like that where it's just basically a hollow tin shell um, because they're inherently not very strong. They're, um, prone to sort of bending and stressing and crumpling. Um, stress skin or semi monocoque is the most common, so all the loads are taken by both the skin, which would be like uh, some kind of sheet metal, and uh, the frame itself. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Cool. Um, a lot of modern aircraft use composite materials, like carbon fibre and glass fibre reinforced plastic, which is inherently a lot stronger. Um, the problem with that, though, is it's more expensive to replace and to search for damage as well, because the damage is harder to find. Um, older aircraft are, are all just metal, like the aircraft, um, the Roberts that we have um, currently. So not quite as strong, but it's easier to spot damage, and it's easier to fix damage as well. Um, are they okay. just aluminium? Sorry? Are they just aluminium? Yeah. Effectively, yeah. Um, all right, if we have a look. Uh, we'll just run through this quickly. So, back on page 2 1, it's got a similar layout to this. This is a cross section of um, a wide body jet of some description. You've got four seats and three either side. It's probably like a 777 or something. Um, so, strings are uh, the uh, long strings um, that run the length of the fuselage. Um, you've got the frames going around it, which create the shape of it, so they give it that circular shape. And then the longer ons uh, run the length of the fuselage as well, um, but they're a lot more sturdy than the strings. Okay, so they, they, they provide a lot of the rigidity of the aircraft structure, especially the fuselage. Um, lighter aircraft won't have quite this extensive um, configuration. This is more the sort of thing you find in heavier aircraft. Um, and of course there's a skin wrapped around the outside as well. Um, modern aircraft will have like a carbon fibre and glass fibre reinforced plastic um, for that kind of thing. Um, right, there you go, there's a cross section of a wing. There's also a really good one, page 2-3. So this is a fairly standard structure. 
Um, first thing we have which gives the aircraft its strength is what we call a spar, speed, S-P-A-R. Um, a lot of aircraft wings will have two spars, they have the main spar and then like a rear spar. Um, and the spar is typically like an I-beam. So if you look at a cross section of the spar, it would look like that. So that's how it maintains its strength, but keeps it pretty light as well. So that's if you're looking at it down in the middle of the spar. Um, usually the main spar is about a third of the way down, um, and then a little bit further back will often be a second spar as well. So they generate the strength of the wings. Okay, that's what keeps the wings um, holding the aircraft up effectively. Um, if there were no spars, then the wings would just bend on themselves. Um, okay, so in addition to that, we've got the rib. What does the rib do from that picture? It holds the two spars together. Yep, so it joins the two spars together. What else does it do? Stop them from flexing the other way, so forwarding. Exactly, yeah, so it provides a bit of strength in the opposite direction. Um, it also creates the shape of the aerofoil as well, so the uh, ribs are what generate the aerofoil shape. Um, and there's usually any number of ribs along the uh, aircraft wing. Um, a wing will also have stringers which run the length of the uh, wing, um, usually further around the outside, and the stringers are what connects the string to that main frame structure, okay? just like in the fuselage of the aircraft. Alright, moving further along, ailerons and wing flaps. Um, so we've talked about ailerons already, so ailerons generate roll in the aircraft, that's how we turn the aircraft, right? Um, wing flaps are also located on the trailing edge of the wing. So what's the difference between the flaps and the ailerons? A few differences really. Uh, the flaps both go down the same way, they don't go up. Okay, so they go down at the same time, they're not asymmetric. Um, and you're quite right, they don't go up. When we say flaps up, we don't mean up, we just mean yeah. level with the wing, don't we? Okay, what else? They generate lift. Yep, they increase lift due to camber, don't they? And in fact, that's the purpose of using them, is to generate lift. Um, why would we use flaps? So it's down. So it's down, so maybe coming in for landing, we might want to use flaps. What about taking off? Short fill takeoffs. Yeah, cool. So we use them for takeoff a lot of the time as well. We don't usually use full flap for takeoff, we usually use just a little bit, maybe 10 degrees in the light aircraft. Why would we do that? To increase the amount of runway required to uh, get the minimum speed. Exactly. So what they do when we put flaps down is they increase the camber of the wing. Um, and when we increase the camber of the wing, we're going to generate more lift. So at the same airspeed, we may be able to get airborne. Whereas if we didn't have flaps down, we may have to go a bit faster in order to get airborne. Okay. However, the further the flaps go down, the more drag we get as well. Okay, so we don't want too much drag for takeoff, which is why we don't use full flap. Whereas when we're coming in to land, we want extra lift so that we can land slower, but we also want the drag to help us slow down, which is why we use 35 degrees of the problem. Um, so. uh, ailerons, of course, will go up and down, okay, so they will deflect upwards. Um, and of course, they deflect in opposite directions. So that if they're increasing the lift on one wing, they'll be decreasing the lift on the other wing, so the aircraft can induce a rolling moment. Okay. Right, a few different types of aircraft there. So you've got a triplane up the top left, uh, an old Fokker 33. Um, it's also a tail dragger as well. Uh, bottom left, what's that one? That's the one. Or yeah, it looks like 172, I think. So it doesn't have that back window like 182 does. Uh, but yeah, you're quite right. Um, so that's classic. It's probably one of the most widely produced light aircraft in the world. Okay, you find it all over the place. So that's a high wing aircraft. Um, you'll also notice it's got struts going up to the wings. Okay, so some of the uh, strength is gained from those. Okay, and by having those, they are able to reduce the weight of the aircraft because it doesn't need as much strength in the wing structure itself. Yeah. Uh, the Cessna Cardinal, which is fairly similar to that, doesn't have the struts, and because of that it's quite a lot heavier because the wing needs to have a lot of integral strength instead. Okay. So it's kind of a toss-up between weight and strength a lot of the time. Um, little van 
Simmons RV Simmon. These are all over all over the place, especially at North Shore. Everyone loves a little light um, sports aircraft. So has anyone seen RVs around before? If you spend a bit of time here, you would have noticed them because every second hangar has one in it. Um, they're pretty cool aircraft. They're um, mainly home-built ones a lot of the time. Um, pretty little and uh, pretty light. Um, a lot of them are aerobatic as well, so they're good. Um, but not a dissimilar configuration from the Robin Man. So you've got low wing, um, low horizontal stabilizer there. Um, so a little bit like a serious aren't they? I mean, um, in some not. ways, like visually from the outside, they look um, similar. Um, however, once you sort of um, break it down, they're, they're quite different. Cirrus is a lot heavier. Um, it's not all that. Um, the wingspan of a Cirrus is longer than all of those ones. The wingspan is quite, quite the same. Um, and the engine is a lot larger in the Cirrus as well. Um, and then, of course, you've got a biplane over there, because that's both tail dragons there, right? Um, another configuration that you'll see on the uh, tail uh, on the Infinarch, these are all um, low horizontal stabilizers. Sometimes you'll see a T-tail, so that the vertical stabilizer like that, and then the horizontal stabilizer sits on top. Okay. Um, there's uh, different reasons for that. Um, some aircraft might have it to get engine clearance, so if you've got like uh, some of the, the light jets will have rear mounted um, engines and because of that they have to have a slightly higher tail. Okay. Other ones uh, just prefer it for stability, it works a little bit better. Um, there's various um, advantages and disadvantages of having a T-tail. Alright, empennage. So as I said earlier, the tail section as a whole is what we refer to as the empennage. Um, and it consists of the back of the fuselage, the horizontal stabiliser, and the vertical stabiliser. So here we have, looks like the back of the 727 or something. Um, and of course on the vertical stabiliser at the rear of it, we've got the rudder. And the rear of the horizontal stabiliser consists of the elevator. So the main flight controls. Elevator, which controls the aircraft and pitch, ailerons and roll and rudder and yaw. Okay, so those are the three main planes that we operate around. Everyone's <coughs> got that with that yaw done, effects and controls and all of your flying. Um, so let's break it down a little bit more. So, <coughs> how does the elevator, or in this case the um, stabilator, control the aircraft and pitch? What's it going to do to pitch the nose up and down? <coughs> Any ideas? Uh, like when you pull back on the control column, the um, elevator um, goes up, so the tail plane goes down, which pitches the nose up. Cool, nice one. Now, um, an all moving tail plane compared with an, a traditional elevator um, operates slightly differently, but it's the same concept. So, what it does is it changes the angle of attack. So, here it's reducing the angle of attack on the horizontal stabilizer which means it's reducing the lift, which is going to create a downforce on the back of the plane, which as you said will pitch the nose up. So hopefully that goes up, there we go. Make sense? And likewise, if we want to pitch down, we need to increase the angle of attack on the horizontal stabiliser, like that, which will create an aerodynamic force upwards on the tail, and the nose will pitch down. Pretty straight. Right, ailerons. Which way is the plane going to turn in this situation? Left or right? Left, right, right, right. Any other takers? Anyone think something different other than left and right? Roll. 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 Bank. So those of you that said right are correct. Okay. So this left wing, that's showing what it's doing. Uh, the aileron's deflecting downwards. What does that do to the camber of the Eric's of the surface? Does it increase or decrease the camber? Increase. Yeah, it increases it. Eh? So it was flat like that, but now it's more curved. 
which is going to increase the lift on that left wing. That's deflecting upwards, which is going to reduce the lift on it. Okay, so because of that, left wing goes up, right wing goes down, and the airplane rolls to the right. I hope it goes right. <laughs> Makes sense, everyone with me? Okay, lastly, the rudder. So the rudder is the same effectively as the ailerons and the uh, elevator, except it's orientated vertically. Okay. So it's generating lift to the left or lift, lift to the right. So because of that, it's going to yaw the aircraft. Okay. So in this situation, if the rudder, go, if the rudder deflects to the right, then that's going to increase the camber with lift effectively going to the left. Eh? So because the aerodynamic force is to the left, then the tail is going to move to the left, and the aircraft will yaw to the right. So we see the aircraft yaw to the right here. So that's what happens when the pilot applies right pedal. All right, we've kind of carried, uh, we've kind of covered undercarriage already comes in many forms as we discussed, so up there we've got a tail dragon with fixed gear, um, and also you've got a traditional tricycle undercarriage which is retractable. Okay. Um, a lot of aircraft which are light still do have retractable undercarriage, um, depending on the configuration. Um, but they're typically a little bit heavier than their counterparts. Oh, so what's that thing at the front? Prop. What does that do for us? Thrust. Yeah, it generates thrust, doesn't it? Which allows us to move through the sky. It accelerates a massive air rearward. Um, Alright, and in front of the propeller, there's this uh, cone. This one's blue. It's not blue anymore. They're all painted some white now. Um, what do we call that? No. No. Yeah. Specifically, though, the, the cone in the front. Any ideas? It's called the spinner. Now, why do we have a spinner on the front? What would happen if we didn't have it there? Aerodynamics, so instead it would just hit, um, basically, if you had a flat plane, all it's going to be sitting against that. Okay, so it's going to increase drag if we don't have a spinner. You're absolutely right. Um, the aeroplane will still work, it'll just fly a little bit slower and be less efficient. What else does it do? So it helps push air on the props. Close. It does, it does kind of do that, but what it really does is it deflects air left and right, and also down, which is until the engine intakes here. So you've got the engine intake down the bottom, and then you've got the uh, cylinders in there, which are air-cooled as well. Okay, so it helps generate airflow through the engine. Um, most flight piston aircraft um, have air-cooled engines, so it's important they've got a lot of air, th air flow going through them as well. Alright, so that's a bit of an intro to uh, all the aircraft parts, fuselage, and all that kind of stuff. Um, should we do a bit of field trip and have a look at that stuff? Sound good? Alright. We are going out to the hangar. Have you guys been out to the aircraft before? Yeah, did Stephen or Stephen? Yeah, What kind of engines do most light aircraft have? How would we d describe those engines? Any ideas? Piston. Sorry? Pin uh, piston. Piston, yeah, yep, correct. Mostly the piston engines. How else would we describe them? Combustion. Okay, yep, so there's some kind of combustion going on. Um, what do you reckon the standard cylinder configuration is? Four. As I explained with the robins, usually they're horizontally opposed, so it's two facing two, kind of sitting like that, uh, with the shaft down the middle going directly to the uh, propeller as well. Alright, so yeah, a bit of an introduction which we've kind of already had. Um, basic principles of the four stroke engine, um, valves and timing, how it works, uh, ignition and magnetos as well. This is all pretty important stuff practically when you're flying and when you're starting the engine every time. Um, this is all really, really relevant stuff for you guys to know, so it's quite useful. Alright, so a few different uh, configurations for the cylinders. What's that one down the bottom there? Anyone know? Four cylinder horizontally opposed. Yeah, four cylinder horizontally opposed. So that's exactly what we have in the Robins. The one 
one set of twos will have that as well. Okay, so it sits like that in front, and we've got one cylinder there and there, and the others on the other side. Uh, with that's the crank casing around the middle, and those are those cooling fins that we can see when we look through the, uh, the cowl. Um, they could also be in line, um, inverted in line, or radial, like we saw on the Yak, where they're all around the circle. Now the problem with inline engines, I think we've got a picture of them. There you go, is um, visibility is a bit of a pain, uh, as you can imagine. So if you're sitting there and you've got that sitting in front of you while you're trying to fly along, you can't really see much. Um, so the other issue, of course, is propeller ground clearance becomes a problem because um, Inherently, the engine needs to sit a little bit lower, which means the propeller gets a bit closer to the ground. And it's, they're not used anymore, very old fashioned one. I'm just going to go back on the slide as well. Um, pretty common in cars, though, to have it in mind for uh, sort of light motor cars. Uh, that's radial configuration. So that's what we see in uh, a lot of older aircraft with um, slightly higher performance. Um, beavers. Beavers are quite commonly used for um, for seaplanes. They get configured for seaplanes. 195, Dakota, Harbin, Stearman, of course the Yak we saw out there as well. Yeah, so those are all uh, radial engines. Uh, radial engines are really loud as well. Okay, um, they do generate quite a lot of power, but when you consider the power to weight ratio, they're not that efficient because okay, they take a lot of weight as well. There's a lot of um, inefficiencies in them. Is that because they normally have quite a amount, uh, large amount of cylinders as well? Yeah, exactly. Basically, when you're adding cylinders, um, you're also, because you're adding parts, there's going to be extra drag because there's more moving parts, and you're not getting a significant appreciable amount of, um, of thrust out of it. So each extra cylinder only generates you know, a negligible amount of extra thrust. Um, but, you know, it's still pretty cool. Um, a lot of the inefficiencies are due to Basically, the yeah. Exactly. Um, all right, so how do we can, um, fix this inline configuration issue with all the visibility issues and the low thrust line? Well, I thought, okay, well, we'll tip it upside down and see what happens. So they came up with the inverted inline configuration. Okay. So we've still got all four cylinders in line. But instead of having them sticking up, they've got them sticking down. Okay, so it alleviates a lot of the drawbacks of the M1 um, because it means you've got a higher propeller, so you've got better ground clearance, and you can also see over the top of it. Okay, so it's used for a lot of older aircraft like uh, the Tiger Moth and the Chipmunk, are both uh, inverted M1 engines. You guys know what I mean by a Tiger Moth. Uh, Kind of see the shape of the uh, of the engine through that picture there. Everyone see that? Okay. So you can kind of see the, the shafts that's there, and then all of the uh, cylinders. So you've got quite a high propeller line and high thrust line with all of it. Um, also, because it's a uh, tail dragger, the uh, propeller naturally sits quite high anyway. It's pretty slightly obvious. Okay, so okay, horizontally opposed. So it's often referred to as a boxer engine or a flat configuration as well. Um, it's conventionally um, what they use in most light aircraft engines these days. Um, that can be four cylinders or six cylinders. A lot of the um, sort of medium sized light aircraft will have a six cylinder engine, like the, uh, like the 185 with a six cylinder, 1260 for the guns. Um, so, yeah, a lot of them have six cylinders as well. Um, they're reasonably efficient, so they don't take up much space. As you can see, it's quite, quite a compact arrangement. 
Um, it's symmetrical, which is um, quite beneficial. Um, good uh, power to drag ratio. Um, really good for cooling as well, because they allow a lot of airflow through the engine, um, which means it's able to operate at higher power settings for longer. Um, power to rate ratio, I'm talking about our thrust line, is really good, because it just goes straight through the middle of it. And of course, propeller clearance and visibility are an issue, because it's nice and flat. Okay. Most of the bulk of it sticks out the sides. Okay, main engine components. So if we look at a bit of a cross section, I'm going to show you uh, a few animations and um, videos of this, and it helps with understanding how it all works. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to get a bit of an in-depth understanding of it. So we're kind of looking through the uh, cylinder and the crankcase at the moment, a bit of a cross section. Um, crankcase, so that's that part around the edge there. Um, cylinders, is basically this part here. The piston is the uh, little cylinder, cylindrical um, shaped thing in the middle which moves up and down inside the cylinder. The crank shaft is uh, through here, so it's basically going in that direction. Um, connecting rod, so that connects the uh, crank shaft to the piston, so it's turning an up and down movement into a um, circular motion. Uh, in addition to that, we have intake valve, uh, which is up the top in there, and the exhaust valve in there, so it's mixed in, which is air and fuel, compresses and ignites it, and then you get all of the exhaust coming out that side. Okay. This is a bit of a simplified version of it, but it's the best way to look at it. Um, what else? Um, camshaft. Um, and I don't think it's labeled, oh yeah, it's just up there. Basically the camshaft um, allows for the timing, timing of the opening and closing of the, the valve at the top, and it's also connected to the crankshaft. And spark plugs, which are up here, so they, they perform the ignition function. And of course, most aircraft will have two lots of spark plugs in each cylinder, so there's a bit of redundancy. And we know those are swift magnetos and right magnetos there. Any questions on that initially? We'll throw it in a little bit more detail as we go along. Um, if you need to follow along with the book, um, there's some pretty good diagrams actually as well. We are looking at uh, chapter 3, which is the engine. And we're kind of on 3-2, uh, 3-3 at the moment. Four-stroke engine. Does that remind are you, about, are you about to freeze over, are you? It's not fresh, yeah. Oh, that's the... Uh, it's always an issue because it takes the longest to get the cool air up here, but I'm the one that needs it. <laughs> I should take from the back. You've been saved. Um, right -o. Okay, crankcase. So it's basically the casing that houses all of the components. Um, it means there's nothing there, and it means you're not going to get lots of dust and any contaminants inside the engine. Okay, so it gives it the body. Um, cylinders, okay, so they form the main part of the chamber where all the compression occurs. Um, so that's the cylindrical shape. Obviously, this is a cross section, so if you imagine a round cylinder shape thing, which is what that is. And the pistons, so they form one part of the wall of the combustion chamber, okay, and they provide us the ability to change the, uh, the volume inside of the combustion chamber, which is the whole idea of combustion is that we can. Um, so that we generate some energy. Um, so they're movable, they move up and down, and they're sealed as well. So the seals, basically there's rubber seals that go through these rivets so that it's a nice airtight seal and no mixture can escape, so no fuel or air can go past the uh, seal uh, with multiple rings. There we go, there's the connecting rod. So the connecting rod is this part here, which connects the piston to the crankshaft. Like I said before, that's the part, and it's pretty key really, because it turns an up and down movement into a um, rotational movement, which is what we need for a propeller or for a car indeed to turn the uh, wheels. Okay. 
Um, so the big end is the crankshaft, and the little end is going to be the piston, as you see there. Okay, so there's a bit of a working animation of the crankshaft at play. Okay, valves. So we've got two valves, intake and exhaust. Okay. And as their names would suggest, one allows for the intake of the fuel and air mixture, and one allows for the exhaust of the uh, burnt mixture. Okay. So when we're describing it, we typically assume that the intake's on the left and the exhaust on the right, so that we've sort of got left to right room there. Okay. So intake fuel air goes into the cylinder prior to compression. The intake valve will then close, as will the exhaust valve. The compression and combustion occurs, and then the exhaust is uh, burnt air, which is escaping through the exhaust valve um, after the combustion. Okay, we'll look at the four cycles in a second. Okay, the camshaft. So it's driven by the crankshaft, um, usually gears or chains. Um, like combing engines, which is what we have in the Robin, is going to be a gear. Um, it rotates at half the crankshaft speed. And it has these little lobes um, which allow for the opening and closing timing of the uh, intake and exhaust valves by rocker arms. Okay, so it basically um, knocks the uh, valves open and shut them. Um, key thing to remember is it rotates at half the crankshaft speed, which we'll see why in a second. Okay? It's a common question that comes up in the exams. Um, out of interest, anyone know what kind of engine the Robins have? Looked at it yet? Holden? <laughs> oh dear. So if we look in the aircraft flight menu, does anyone know? That's the designator. It's a Lycoming, because they're manufacturer. And it's an 0235 L2A. Okay. Now, with the exception of the last three figures which are just the designator for the engine, um, they have a bit of significance. Okay, so any ideas what the O might mean? What they drive compared to like the direction they drive? Mm, it's pretty simple, it's not a, um, it's just the configuration of the engine. Any takers? The O stands for horizontally opposed. So the cylinders basically like that, with the shaft going down the middle there like that. Yeah. So horizontally opposed. Um, if it had an eye in front of it, that would mean it's fuel injected. Okay, because it's not fuel injected, it doesn't have it. Either. So it's a carburetor engine. Um, right, 235. Any takers as to what that might mean? It gives an indication as to the power generated. Horsepower. Mm, close. So it's a 180 horsepower. Oh, no, it's not. It's a light. It's 118 to me. It'd be nice if it was What's that? would be nice if it was 180. Yeah. <laughs> the system is a 180 horsepower. Um, so that's the cubic inches of displacement. Okay. So in a car, we often talk about cc's or liters. So cc's cubic centimeters. Um, so 2,000 cc is roughly equated to two liters. Um, so in American engines, we often talk about for aircraft um, cubic inches of displacement. Um, and so. In this engine, it's 235 cubic inches total displacement. Okay. Um, it's roughly equivalent to about 4 litres, or 4,000 cc, to give you a bit of an idea. So, a reasonably large car engine. Um, Alright, that's a good little aside. Okay, so a four stroke cycle. Um, it's often called the Otto cycle, um, and it's called four stroke because it's got four different parts to it. Okay. Now the key thing to note with a four-stroke cycle when we compare it to maybe a jet engine where it's a continuous cycle 
is that only one of the strokes or one of the cycles is actually generating any useful power. The other three are just a necessary part of it. So they're inherently not that efficient. Um, a jet engine is way more efficient because it's continuously generating thrust or power. Okay. So four cycles, intake or induction, where it takes in the fuel and the air mixture. Compression, which is where the piston moves upwards, compresses that mixture. Power, which is the power stroke, that's the only stroke generating the energy. So that's where it explodes and it pushes the piston back down. And then of course the exhaust, where it expels all the exhaust gases. Uh, out to the right hand side. Okay. So we'll just have a quick look at it. a couple of animations and to give you a bit of an idea. Have you guys done much stuff on engines before, in car engines? Um, you'll find that, um, in fact, the video I'm about to show you is an automotive one, not a, an aviation one, and they're, with the, a few exceptions, they're exactly the same. Um, you'll find the Robin engines are a bit more manual, so it's a carburetor engine and um, like mixture is controlled by the pilot, whereas a lot of car engines you know, have computers and it automatically determines what the most efficient mixture is. Um, likewise with more advanced aircraft it's automatically going to determine the mixture as well. Um, Alright, so this is the first one. basic lesson in the fundamentals of a four-stroke EFI gas engine may be helpful to your understanding of Mercury products. Here are the basic components of every four-stroke gas engine. A piston, a connecting rod, a crankshaft. As the piston travels up and down in the cylinder, this lateral motion is turned into a rotating motion at the crankshaft. The longer the stroke of the piston, the larger the displacement of gas and air occurs in the cylinder. To propel that piston, we need to ignite a tiny bit of gas and a whole lot of air. This creates expansion inside the cylinder. The fuel delivery system consists of an air intake manifold, valves, intake and exhaust, a fuel injector, and a spark plug. A four-stroke engine is called a four-stroke because four up and down motions are needed to complete the cycle. In the first stroke, the piston travels downward as the intake valve opens and a mixture of air from the atmosphere and a metered amount of gas from the electronic fuel injector enter the cylinder. This is called the intake stroke. On the second stroke, the piston travels upward, compressing the air and fuel to make a highly combustible mixture. This is called the compression stroke. At this point, the spark plug fires, sending the piston downward from the expansion of the air and gas mixture. This is the combustion stroke. The fourth stroke is the exhaust stroke. As the piston travels upward, the exhaust valve opens to release the burned air-fuel mixture. When the piston reaches the top of this stroke, the intake valve opens and the cycle begins all over again. It takes one up and down motion, or two strokes of the piston, to create one revolution of the crankshaft. RPMs, or revolutions per minute, is how many times the crankshaft rotates within that minute. At wide open throttle, the crankshaft may turn at 5,000 RPMs, or a dizzyingly 83 times per second. Meanwhile, the piston traveled up and down 166 times in that same second. Want to see how fast that is? Now, that's fast. Let's see it again. Amazingly, the four-stroke EFI engine does this smoothly, quietly, and reliably for years and years of operation. All right. Does that help? It's a good little animation, eh? Um, so yeah, interesting to note that's uh, for obviously an automotive engine, um, but it's exactly the same principle. What did you notice was one of the big differences though from that little bit at the end when he was talking about RPM? Yeah, it's yeah, pretty high RPM, they're talking about 5,000 RPM. Um, what would happen if we did 5,000 RPM in one of our aircraft? You'd break it pretty quick. Yeah, 
fall apart pretty quickly, yeah. Um, so yeah, typically the RPM, operating RPM of a piston engine um, aircraft is a lot lower than that of a car. Um, and the reason for that is it's a direct drive, so the engine directly drives the propeller, it's not geared, so the propeller's spinning exactly the same RPM as the engine. Um, so because of that, you've got a lot of aerodynamic drag um, on the propeller, so it just can't spin that fast, otherwise it's just going to damage it. Um, but it's simple, okay, and that's what works. Um, not all aircraft are like that, but some do have gears, so they might have a uh, step up or step down gear. Um, if you end up looking at basic gas turbine theory um, as you move through your training, then um, you look at things like uh, turboprops, so there's a, a jet engine driving a propeller, so those are all geared because otherwise the propeller would spin too fast because the, uh, the natural RPM of a, uh, of a jet engine is a lot faster. Okay, so in order to do that it needs to find a natural um, RPM which it's going to sit comfortably at. Um, but yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, I think we might finish up there today because otherwise um, we're not going to get too much more through it and there's a bit of complicated stuff which I think is best done on a fresh head. Um, any questions on what we've looked at with engines and airframes so far? Everyone happy with that? Cool. Um, what I suggest you do, I've skipped over um, chapter one because it's pretty basic stuff. Um, a lot of it's kind of high school physics, but I suggest you just have a quick flip through it. It talks a little bit about weight and mass and momentum, um, vector forces and things like that. If you've got any questions on it, um, bring them in tomorrow and Hamish can run through some of the stuff in there as well. The um, then have a go at the review questions on chapters 1, 2 and 3 as well. Um, chapter 3 you might not be able to do all of them, but you may be able to do the relevant ones which would be better for the initial parts. Happy? Pleasure, guys. Um, so Hamish will be with you in the morning at 8.30. Um, since I've got them, I might just in their faces. All right. Before we crack on, I'm Hamish. I'm an instructor. We'll finish tech together. That's about it. Um, I've been working here a couple of years, fly planes. It's pretty good fun. Bit of IFR stuff, bit of normal stuff, just cruising around. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to sing out. I'll write up my email on the board. So if you have any questions on this subject, you can put me an email and uh, sort it out. Just quickly, shoot around the room, tell me who you are, why you got into flying, what you want to do with flying, and uh, if you started or not as well. So where you're at. So uh, you can start up first. Uh, I'm Kai, uh, I'm from Australia originally, uh, moved over here last week uh, yep. with my girlfriend who's a flight tech at Andrew Dill. Sweet. Um, the sort of part of the reason I got into flying was because she sort of opened my eyes up that I could potentially do it. I yep. always had an interest in aviation but never thought it was possible. Yep. Um, wanted to go towards the commercial route but also just want to enjoy flying while you still can. Um, yep. And I've done no actual flying, uh, like ground school is the first part of yep. um, any aviation flying stuff I've ever done. So, cruising, nice. Yep, I'm John from Kuala Lumpur, just got here one week ago and I'm here for six months to, doing, to do the PPL. Um, flying is a childhood dream Yep. <laughs> and so I'm realising it now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Cool. Yeah, so you fine. haven't done any flying yet? Um, no, we'll be starting after the, this two weeks. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. I'm Devin. I'm doing my PPL right now just to, to see if I truly like flying and want to continue it, but I, the only flying in the room is from the gateway course. Cool. Uh, I'm Harry. I was also on the gateway course with Devin. I'm getting into flying because cool. um, my uncle's a pilot and I think uh, that I see how much money he makes and I went on the <laughs> <laughs> That's he's realistic. I'll tell you right now, he's lying to you. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Abby, and I'm currently doing my DBL. Yeah, I'm just kind of enjoying it, so just kind of like see. Sweet. Cruzy. All right, um, so what we'll do is we'll start going through this. We'll try and get through 
as much as we can today, but I understand you didn't get too much done yesterday. Um, but we'll just go through it. If you have any questions or anything like that, or you want to know more, or you're unsure, yep. Um, I was about to say, just interrupt me, but no. <laughs> <laughs> is, um, is, is Cam doing this contacted anyone that he's not here? Or we just... I've just got sick written on my sheet okay. here. Oh, so okay. That's what I'm assuming. Okay. Uh, but being that we're already running late, we're going to crack on. And if he rocks up, he rocks up. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. Sound good? Excellent. Yeah, so any questions, queries, just sing out straight away if you want to know more. Um, just yell at me and I will try and explain as best I can. Oops, I've broken it. That's not what I want. Oh no, just keep where am I up to? It's there. Please work. Did Matt have any issues with this yesterday? No. No, it's just me. I'm unlucky. So, as we go through, what we'll do is we'll mainly base what we're going to go through off the slides. Um, at the end, we'll go through some different... Um, we've got up to... Do you know what all the uh, parts of the block are and internal suck, squeeze, bang, blow? Yep. Do you remember it? Not really. <laughs> no, never quickly go over four stroke cycle again, because that's probably quite important. Okay. All right, so we'll start here. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll go through the slides as it is. We'll try and tick off all the things in the uh, in the syllabus. Towards the end, we'll just start running through making sure, and I'll just pop quiz you on random things to make sure that everything's still uh, up to speed. Sound good? Okay. Excellent. So, four-stroke cycle, otherwise known as the Otto or the Omen cycle, um, is what's in every four-stroke engine. So the four strokes are intake or induction, compression, power, and exhaust. So suck, induct, squeeze, compression, bang, power, blow, exhaust. That's how I remember it works pretty well. Only one of the four cycles provides power, so unlike the turbine, which provides continuous power, only every four strokes does the... Uh, that cylinder produce any power to the crankshaft. The rest is sort of taking energy away. Um, spark plugs, so a petrol engine needs spark plugs okay, to create that burn. So in the uh, most GA aircraft, they're running on petrol or avgas. They'll have two spark plugs in the cylinder, both connected to one magneto each. Um, and that way you get a slightly more efficient burning than what's in your car, where you have one spark plug generally in the middle. You have two on the sides and it burns in nicely towards the middle. So the first 
cycles the induction, so what happens is the cylinder moves down, right, creates a negative pressure, the inlet valve up here will open up. As that happens, that fuel air charge from the air intake and the inlet is put into the cylinder as the piston comes down. Once the piston comes down, it's got all of that charge in there, it starts coming up, the intake valve now closes, right? Piston starts coming up, starts squeezing that fuel air charge. What happens is that happens, or what happens to the fuel air charge as you squeeze it, as you compress it. Gets hot. Yep, gets a bit hot as well. Gains some more energy. Okay, then we get the power, so the spark plug will go off. Okay, that starts the burn. Okay, the gases will rapidly expand as they burn. Okay, it's, you, I'm sure you've seen the Americans from the southwest where they've got the, you know, they put a lynx can into a bottle of whatever and light it on fire and throw away and then it explodes, same thing. Um, so that increased pressure drives the piston down. So that's your power stroke, so that's the important one. Then piston comes back up. As it comes back up, it pushes all the gases out of the exhaust manifold. Okay? And then it rinses and repeats. All right, so that is the four stroke cycle. Most engines will have that cycle. There's very few two-stroke engines in aviation, and I don't think there's any in general aviation. So four-stroke cycle, induction, compression, power, exhaust, induction, compression, power, exhaust. Right, it just goes on and on and on, lots of times a second. Happy? Cool. Top dead center and bottom dead center. So these are terms to describe where the piston sits at certain points. And the reason why we have top dead center and bottom dead, dead center, or TDC and BDC, is to measure things like displacement and swept volume. Okay? So top dead center is the piston when it's at the top of the cylinder, or the highest point it can get inside the cylinder. So it's when the crankshaft's directly up and down with the piston. So you've got pistons come all the way up, it can't go up anymore, that's your top dead centre. Right? Bottom dead centre, as the piston comes down, the con rod and the crankshaft moves out to the side and then eventually it comes back down, so it's directly in line again. The piston can't go any lower than that, that is the bottom, bottom dead centre. So I think of top dead centre, it's at the top, the con rod's centred, bottom dead centre, it's at the bottom, con rod is centred. Right? Now, with those, there's bore, okay, so bore is the size of the cylinder, so it's the internal diameter, so if you have a large bore engine, you have big cylinders, if you have a small bore engine, you have small cylinders, okay? And then stroke is the total distance that the piston, or the top of the piston, will move inside the cylinder. So it's the distance from top dead centre to bottom dead centre, so that's the stroke. So if you have a large stroke engine, it's going to move further. So generally, you get large bore, smaller stroke, or you get large stroke, smaller bore. All right, so it's all about how far it moves and how big the cylinder is. That's what bore and stroke's about. Then we have swept and unswept volume. Swept volume makes a lot of sense. Think of the piston as it sweeps through from bottom dead centre to top dead centre. What is that space? So what's the volume between this line here and here? So inside the cylinder itself, how far does the actual piston move? So it goes from here to here, right? So top dead centre to bottom dead centre. The swept volume is this, okay? The unswept volume is what's left above it at the top. Because if there was no unswept volume, it wouldn't work, right? Because you can't compress stuff into nothing. It wouldn't work. Well, I'm sure you probably can, and smart people can do that, but in general engines you need that to create um, space, because if you compress it too much, then the fuel air charge will spontaneously explode, and then you get issues with engine performance. So then you get compression ratio, right? So compression ratio, how much stuff are we compressing? Makes sense. So if you have a high compression ratio engine, they're taking a lot of volume, so a large swept volume, and putting it into a very small unswept volume. So they're compressing a lot of stuff into a small space. 
If you have a low compression ratio, then you might be taking not much stuff and squeezing it into a bigger space so it doesn't get compressed as much. So generally, high compression ratio engines will produce slightly more power, but they also have a shorter lifespan because of the fact that the, um, the burn or the explosion can be significantly more violent because that gas has been compressed on the lock. Um, so the compression ratio is the swept and the on-swept volume. So the entire volume of the cylinder above it at bottom dead centre, right? So the entire amount of the cylinder that's going to be compressed divided by the unswept volume. So it takes this whole amount, right? Top of the cylinder here, bottom of the cylinder, and then compresses it into this little space up the top. So that is your compression ratio. So how much stuff are you squeezing into the unswept volume? Does that make sense? Then we have ignition timing. So what is ignition timing? At what point the spark plug needs to go up or what point yeah. it's ignited? Yep. Why would that be important? Which part of the stroke it is? Because if it's still compressing, you don't want it to ignite before it gets there, otherwise you're, yep. you're losing efficiency and power. Ah, then we have spark advance, but we'll get to that in a second. So timing does depend on the fuel-air ratio, right? Um, so how much, or how quickly and how efficiently that mixture is going to burn. So we have the perfect mixture of fuel and air, which is called a stoichiometric mixture. I don't think you need to know that for PPL. But that perfect mixture creates, it's the most efficient burning. It doesn't necessarily create the most power, but it's the most efficient burning at that stage. As the mixture gets more rich, so there's more fuel and less air, you're going to get less efficient mixture. As there's less um, fuel, a little bit more air, sometimes you can actually get slightly more power from it but depends on the fuel air ratio when you have your ignition timing. Temperature, okay, because as you heat up that gas becomes slightly more volatile, all the molecules start bumping around a little bit more. Grade of fuel, again, volatility, how much power can you get out of that burn when you do it? So if you have a really high grade fuel like we do with Avgas, for example, it's 100 octane, that's going to give us a more powerful combustion than if you use 91 from the fuel tank, right? Um, compression ratio, high compression ratio, you're going to get a higher temperature um, and you've got more compression so it's going to get a uh, more explosive burn. Manifold pressure, what's manifold pressure? It's the pressure at the top of the cylinder, isn't it? When? Uh, at, the, at the top of the compression stage. Nope. Nope. I probably led you astray by saying we in the cylinder. So manifold pressure is the pressure inside the inlet manifold. So the pressure that's being pushed into the cylinder. So when the intake valve opens and that fuel air charge comes in, what's the manifold pressure? So if you have a low manifold pressure, it's going to push less stuff into the cylinder. So there's going to be less fuel air charge in there. If you have a high manifold pressure, it's going to be able to push more of that fuel air charge in. So think a turbocharger, right? That increases the manifold pressure, so that pressure inside that inlet manifold is really, really high, so it can push lots of fuel air charge into the engine. That's why turbocharged cars, turbocharged planes can go quicker, because they can get more stuff into the cylinder. Okay. Um, number of ignition points. So if you have one spark plug, that burn inside the cylinder is gonna take significantly longer and if you have two spark plugs at the out and they're burning in towards the middle, right? So that's going to affect when you do your ignition timing. Gas turbulence is another one. So you have a really high uh, manifold pressure. It's pushing lots of fuel air charge into the engine. And then, but it's going through all these sharp bends and turns. So it's spinning around. It's creating lots of turbulence, which creates drag. So now less of that charge can get in because it's slowed down because it's spinning around. That sort of Everyone with me so far? So they all affect the ignition timing. Now, generally, um, the spark is advanced, which means it occurs before top dead center. Right? The reason why is as you're compressing and it starts burning, you want to develop peak power. So you've got your... Where's my black pen? There. So if we look at a 
so, um, you know, we've got our, Jesus, I can't draw, here we go. We have our cylinder and we have our piston and it's going up this way, right? If we, and top dead center is here, okay? If at this point here, we made the spark go off, right? Spark's gonna go off, that fuel air charge is gonna start burning. By the time it develops max pressure, the cylinder, or the piston, sorry, has already moved back down, so when it develops peak pressure, it's down here. So it's not gonna be as efficient. Whereas if we advance it, so now the cylinder is, are you guys following me? Because it's drawing. <laughs> as the piston's coming up, if we spark it then, when the cylinder, uh, sorry, the piston, gets to top dead center, that's when just peak pressure's being developed, and then it gets this really powerful push down, rather than already being on the way down before we get the, the power from it. So that's why we have spark advance. It allows us to get significantly more energy from that fuel air charge. Cool. But if we advance it too much, then what happens? Becomes less efficient on the other side. Yeah, well, it's developing peak pressure while the cylinder's still moving up, which is trying to push this, while the piston's still moving up. So now it's trying to push the piston back down when it needs to go up before it can come back down again. Then you have all sorts of fun issues and start developing all sorts of terrible engine problems, which we get into later on. <laughs> okay, valve timing. So with valve timing, we have lead and lag. But the intake and the exhaust valves have to be opened and closed at the right time. Okay? Because let's say they were entirely at the wrong time and the exhaust valve opened when we were doing the intake stroke, mm. then it would all nothing would work, right? The engine wouldn't work. So we need to make sure that the valves are timed correctly so that as the cylinder's coming down, the intake valve is open, so then we get that fuel air charge in. As the cylinder's coming up, it closes, because if it doesn't close, then we're going to have, we're not going to get much uh, power or much compression, because it's just going to shoot back out the intake valve. So we've got to be careful of that. Now, they don't open and close at top dead centre and bottom dead centre. Same reason as spark advance, because there's slightly more efficient positions, rather than waiting until it's all the way at the top and all the way at the bottom, because things take time to happen. If it instantaneously, as the inlet uh, valve opened, we instantaneously filled up the cylinder, then yep, we would have them at top and bottom dead centre. Right? But we don't because physics, that's not how that works. So this diagram here explains intake and valve timing. It's real, real nice and confusing. But what this is showing us is basically the, the position of the crankshaft, right? So if we imagine we've got our crankshaft sitting here, and we have our conrod coming up and our piston sitting here, so that's bottom dead center, right? As we go through the cycle, this moves up and around, and gets to top dead center. Now our piston's at top dead center. Does that make sense? Have I orientated you with this uh, diagram in an adequate fashion? Are you following me there? So it's showing you what the, what the position is of the um, cam shaft while it's coming around, right? Happy? Gotcha, sorry. All right, so what you'll find is before top dead center, so before the cylinder comes all the way up, the inlet valve opens, right? The exhaust valves also open at the same time. The reason why that is, is as it's coming up, it's pushing all those exhaust gases out but if we just closed it at top dead centre, we'd still have those exhaust gases in that unswept volume at the top of the cylinder, right? So what we do is we leave the exhaust valve open while the inlet valve's open. So a little bit of that inlet mixture does go out the exhaust, but it also pushes all of the other exhaust gases out of the way. So now you've got rid of most of that old mixture, right? Then the cylinder gets to the top dead centre, it's pushed all that stuff out. As it starts coming down, the exhaust valve closes, right? Then the piston's coming down, 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 bottom dead center, right? And then, as it's coming back up, the inlet valve's still open. The reason why that is, is because this movement here, right, this 60 degrees, 
equals only a tiny movement of the piston itself. And because of the manifold pressure, you can get more stuff in there. There's not enough compression from the piston. There's more pressure from the inlet manifold. So there's more fuel coming in. So even though this is compressing it, there's more pressure so we can get more stuff in, right? So there's more stuff coming into the cylinder. Then as it's coming up, inlet valve closes. Then we get our compression stroke. So up, 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 up. And then we'll get our spark timing just before top dead center, right? Burn, power stroke, pushed all the way down. Then we have valve lead, right? And the reason why we have valve lead for the exhaust, so the exhaust valve's opening earlier, is so that as we're coming down, this 55 degree angle here is a tiny movement of the cylinder, of the piston. Why do I keep saying cylinder? <laughs> all right, so it's a tiny movement. So at that point, we've got most of the energy out of that, out of that power stroke. There's not much left to be had. So we open the exhaust valve early so that we can use that little bit of energy that's left to push out all the exhaust gases nice and efficient. And it comes down the bottom dead center all the way up. As it comes up, the inlet valve opens before it gets to the top dead center to push out the last of that exhaust gas, and then we rinse and repeat. And that is the four stroke cycle. Okay? So for the intake valve, it's gonna open about 15 degrees before top dead center. The reason why is that helps with gas um, scavenging, basically. So it helps push out the exhaust gases. Okay? It'll close about 60 degrees after bottom dead center, so after the piston starts moving up. That's called lag. So if it comes before it should, in theory, so thinking about when they should open and close in terms of top dead center and bottom dead center, if it's before where it should, then it's lead. If it's after, then it's lag. Okay? Exhaust valve timing, so again, that's gonna open about 55 degrees before bottom dead center. That's valve lead, okay? Because it's happening before it should. Then it closes 15 degrees after top dead center, lag, right? Which helps with that gas scavenging, okay? Now, the reason why it's tiny is if we look at the movement from here to here, right? This movement here is equal to the same movement as from here to here, right? So in terms of distance, this tiny movement along here is very small in terms of piston movement. This section here is where there's the most piston movement, right? Because that's mostly vertical. Whereas here, from here to here, this is mostly horizontal movement. So there's very little piston movement in terms of up and down. Does that make sense as to why the numbers are quite high in terms of degrees for the, um, when we get the lead and lag? Cool. All right. Valve overlap. So that's top dead center. So where both valves are open, okay, allows the engine to breathe and allows uh, better gas scavenging, right? Key word there. And it allows us to produce more power because we're getting rid of all those old exhaust gases. That's why when you smell, um, you shouldn't be sniffing exhaust gases. <laughs> But you can always smell some fuel, especially if it's a very rich mixture, because there's fuel coming out of the exhaust because of that gas scavenging. Okay. Engine RPM and engine power. Now the relationship between RPM and power is linear, right? In theory. It's never actually linear, but in theory, it's linear. Okay? Because as we move that piston down, we generate power, right? When we get that power stroke, we generate power. So if we do more RPM, more power strokes a minute, we're gonna get more power, right? Because power is forced on distance over time. So if we're doing it more, we get more power. Now, at a constant RPM, uh, sorry, in a constant RPM aircraft, so a constant speed prop aircraft, engine power is measured in manifold pressure rather than RPM. Why is that? What is a constant speed aircraft? Do you know yet? You won't because we're doing air tech and I haven't taught you propellers, but that's all right. So in a constant speed um, unit or a constant speed prop, what it does is it changes the pitch of the propeller. So you set a power setting and inside you go, okay, I want this much RPM. So inside the governor, there's oil pressure and basically with the setting you've made, it just adjusts the pitch of the propeller 
to get that RPM, right? So I want 2,300 RPM. So I set that on the RPM control, and then if I increase the power, what normally what happens on a fixed pitch propeller if I increase the power? What happens to our RPM? It goes up, right? So that's an easy way of measuring power because the RPM goes up. But in a constant speed prop, it just increases the pitch, so it's creating more force, but it's also creating more torque in the opposite direction, so the RPM never goes up. So that's why we have to measure pressure and manifold pressure, because the RPM doesn't change. Because if we just looked at the RPM, we could move it all the way in and all the way out, and it would stay the same. Right? Which wouldn't help at all with determining how much power we have. So on a constant speed aircraft, we have manifold pressure. Right. Happy with that? We'll go more detail into constant speed units when we get to the propellers section. Any questions so far? I know I've talked a lot in a very short period of time. Cool. Okay, ignition system. So, in most general aviation aircraft, we have magneto. So we have a dual independent ignition system. So they're both engine driven. It's not like your car, right? If you unplug your battery from your car, what happens? It, it doesn't start, but if it's going, it stops. Right? Because the spark plugs are powered off the battery. In an aircraft, if the alternator failed and your ignition system ran off the battery, what would happen? Emergency landing. Yeah. The engine would stop, which would be bad, right? Because we know electrical stuff breaks all the time. Now, if you're in your car and the battery dies, what happens? The engine stops and you just sort of coast on the side of the road and everyone honks and pulls the finger at you and drives past. <laughs> right. If you're in your car, it's a little, if you're in a plane, sorry, it's a little bit more exciting. So we have engine-driven magnetos. So that's one of the reasons also why you've got to be quite cautious with aircraft on the ground because if the mags are still on, because they're engine-driven and you lean on the prop, now you can start the aircraft, which is a way of starting the aircraft. It's called prop swing. Okay. So we have two... Engine driven magnetos, why do we have two? Why not just one? Independence, redundancy? Yeah, redundancy, right? Because if one of them fails, we also don't want the engine to just stop. So we have two for redundancy. Now, there's two spark plugs per cylinder, each powered off each mag. So this diagram may be correct for some engines, it's not for other engines. But if you get the idea. So your left and your right magnetos power um, the spark plugs to each cylinder and they alternate between which side of the cylinder they do the sparks on to try and keep it to an even RPM change um, because of the layout of the engine. So it gives you redundancy and it also gives you slightly more efficient combustion and it gives you a little bit smoother engine running. Because instead of Let's say most cars that tend to have the spark plug offset slightly, so we're looking top down in the cylinder this time, right? So normally the spark plug's kind of here, right? If it was really efficient, it would be in the middle, and then it would burn out nice and lovely. Doesn't often happen that way though. In a aircraft, we have the spark plugs here, so they burn out like that and meet in the middle so you get a real nice smooth combustion. Also gives you slightly more power because it happens quicker. Happy with that? Sweet. What does the starter motor do? Or what does the starter do? Oh come on. Starts the aircraft. Starts the aircraft. <laughs> Excellent. Good call. Um, how does it do it? Uh, by turning um, over the prop enough that it starts Yep. Generate its own electrical charge. Well, no, it's just, no, it's just, just going to get one spark going into the cylinder to fire it and then it starts running, right? Um, how does it connect? Is it always connected to the propeller or the drive shaft? No. no? You're right, no. Because the starter motor RPM is generally very low, something like 200 RPM. If it was permanently connected and the max starter motor RPM was say 250 and you run at 2500 RPM, every time you go flying you'd need a new starter motor, which wouldn't be very efficient. 
So what we have is what's called a Bendix unit. Basically, this is the starter motor here. This gear here, if you've been flying, you'll notice this is on the back of the prop. Right, so that's connected directly to the drive shaft, it's called a ring gear. In here, they have what's called a Bendix unit. Basically, there's a little gear, a little round gear, and it sticks on a spindle that goes in and out. So when you engage the starter motor, you have the ring gear here and the spindle here, and it goes boop, connects to it, starts it, and then when you disengage the starter motor, so you let go of the key so it's not in the start mode, then the Bendix unit pulls it back in, then the engine starts. That's why if you're starting the engine and it kind of catches, and you just keep, shoot, keep starting, it doesn't feel like the engine's going, and then you release the starter motor and then the engine picks up speed, right? that can also be why, because the starter motor might have enough torque in it that it's slowing the engine up here and down. Yeah. So, starter warning light, really, really important, that one, we check it works, and two, after start, we make sure it goes off, because if the starter motor is still engaged after start, that's gonna heat up very, 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 very quickly. Like I said before, if it's max RPM, say 250 RPM, and we're even on the ground doing 1200 RPM, we're severely overspeeding that, all the components inside it are gonna melt down and it's not gonna be very nice. So we really wanna make sure that after start, that starter light goes off. If it doesn't go off, what will we do? Turn on. What's that? Turn on. Yeah, shut down. Because otherwise things are gonna get very hot and when things get very hot, what happens? We have an impulse coupling as well. Now, what an impulse coupling is, is it's, think of it like a spring. So when you start the engine, it starts spinning the prop. What that does is it winds up a spring inside the magneto, okay? So it's normally on the right magnet. Oh, I'm gonna get this wrong. <laughs> um, who's got their books? Find out impulse, find impulse couplings and tell me which, which mag the impulse coupling is connected to. I've got a brain part. Impulse coupling incorporated in one magneto, usually the left magneto. There you go, I wasn't going to get it right. So the right magneto is retarded, the left magneto has the impulse coupling. Okay? So it's the spring, so you start it as the prop swings through a few times, it winds up that spring, and then the spring lets go. And what that does inside the magneto generates a really high power spark, so a really big spark that's bigger than normal. The reason for that is so you can get a really powerful first fire of the cylinder and then the engine starts nicely. So what they do is normally they have the left, uh, the right magneto is basically turned off or delayed okay, so that this impulse coupling can work. Because of the spring, if you had both of them going, you'd have the right mag would do a little spark and then half a second later the left mag would do a big spark, which you don't want. So it delays one mag and then you have this impulse coupling which generates this nice high energy spark so you get easier starting. Cool. All right, how do you use the ignition switch? What does off mean? Off. It's off, right? None of the mags should work. That's why before shutdown, you'll hear everyone go the keys all the way to off and back to both because they're checking that the mags actually disable them, they actually ground them because if they don't, and you lean on the prop, you can start the engine. Which if you don't intend on doing, is not very good. Okay? Right, right magneto only, left, left magneto only, both, both mags are working, start, engage the start motor. Normally what you'll have to do is there'll be a spring from both the starts, so you have to hold it in the start position, and you'll also have to push in. Right, it's not like your car where you just turn it, normally you have to turn and push. Right. Some aircraft don't have that, some aircraft do. It's just another safety feature, so you can't accidentally engage a starter motor while you're doing run-ups or something like that. Dead cut check. So dead cut check is after start. Okay. So we perform it at a low RPM. The reason why we do it is after start we go from the mags and just cycle through the mags, make sure they don't cut out. Because if we 
didn't do that, and then we run the engine up at a nice high RPM and go to check the mags, make sure that um, RPM drops within limits, then we're gonna get a nice big backfire, we might cause damage to the engine, we might cause damage to the other mags, because we're cycling through a mag that's already off. I'm sure you've heard people accidentally do it at a high RPM, go all the way to off and back to both, and normally you get a nice big backfire with this one, bam! Um, but it's not good for the aircraft. So at a low RPM, we'll go from both to right to left, to right, back to both. Um, if the engine cuts, that means one of the mags isn't working. Okay? So don't fly and don't check the uh, mags at a high RPM. Right? Go get it checked out by an engineer. Okay? Um, in 2120s, dead cut checks only uh, below 1000 RPM. So anytime there's a potential that we're doing the mags to off, always making sure the RPM is below 1000. It stops backfiring, it stops damage. Any of you guys helicopter pilots? Oh, good. Um, <laughs> what time <is> that? <laughs> um, so, normal mag checks are done at a high RPM, so it depends on the aircraft what you're doing. In a Robin, if you're flying those here, it's 1800 RPM. So then we'll go from both to left, we'll note the drop, okay? Go back to both. Then from both to right, note the drop, and then compare them. So, inside the flight manual, you'll have some limits. So, for example, a Robin, you can't have more than 175, and you can't have more than a 50 split between them. Okay? So that's meaning they're both performing at roughly the same level, but on one mag it's not you know, running 300 RPM lower, because again, you've got to think about what happens if, um, if one mag fails, for whatever reason, you are going to have to run off only one mag and fly. Which you can do, but in a Robin that already barely climbs, it gets quite exciting. All right, so a bit of information on the basic four-stroke cycle. How does that go? Oh, come on, guys. There's four different positions. Is that pressure? Nice. Do you remember that one? No. no. <laughs> All right. What is uh, what? What's the point of spark advance? Efficiency. What is spark advance? So before the piston comes all the way up, so that as it's compressing, it burns, and then when it reaches peak power, you can push this piston back down. Nice. What is valve lead? Where a valve is open before it's potentially at uh, yep. its ideal point, just to... Uh, so does the intake valve... Um, how much does the intake valve lead by, if any? 15. Yep, how much does it lag by, if any? 15. Oh, 60. 60, yep, so intake valve normally lags by about 60. How about the exhaust valve? Does that lead by anything? No. 15. <laughs> exhaust valve also leads, right? because the intake and the exhaust valve are open at the same time for a small period of time, right? Yeah. And then the exhaust lag, how much is that? Is there any exhaust lag? Did I just say the exhaust lead causes valve overlap? Because that's wrong. Okay, good. <laughs> Exhaust lag by how much? 60 degrees. Oh, that's valve. 15. Yeah, about 50 to 60 degrees. Depend Again, all these numbers are arbitrary. It depends on the engine entirely. Um, but they're sort of rough figures that work pretty well for most four cylinder, four stroke engines. Cool. Um, ignition, how, how do our uh, ignition systems work in most GA engines, piston engines? How does it create a spark? Using a starter motor. Fire main meter. Yeah. Fire, flint and rock. It's a little caveman sitting in there. Flint and a knife and just go fuck, fuck, fuck. Yep. What? Via a magneto. A magneto? Two, two, two magnetos. Two cylinder. magnetos? How many spark plugs are there in each cylinder? Two. Why? Uh, re redundancy. 
Yep, and efficiency. Yeah, slightly more efficient. Um, what's the correlation between engine RPM and power output? See. Linear. Cool. Um, ooh, here we go. Someone talk to me about the differences between diesel and petrol engines. I know we haven't covered it, but hopefully you guys can uh, imagine. Diesel doesn't require as big compression to fire. Nope. Diesel normally higher compression ratio. Right and there is a reason for it. What's the other name for a diesel engine? Sorry. Direct injection. Nope, that's an injection system for potentially a diesel engine. But yes, generally uh, direct injection. A compression ignition engine. What does that mean? Have a guess. What's compression ignition? How do you ignite something? Spark. Yep, which is something that's very good. <laughs> Hot. Hot. How do you if you get your links can and you put it on a on a on a flame or a, or a hot, you know, if you're cooking something with oil on a hot stove and there's no flame, you can still set the oil on fire, right? So it's heat. What happens when we compress something? It heats up. Well. It heats up. How do you think compression ignition works based off those two quite, quite straightforward hints? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, excellent. How did you know? Um, <laughs> So compression ignition works, so we've got our cylinder sitting in here. Fundamentally, it's still a four-stroke system, works the same. They will normally have glow plugs. Now what glow plugs do is they heat up the cylinder heads, right? So I get the cylinder heads nice and hot, because if they're cold, it's not gonna help with the compression ignition. Now what happens is you introduce the diesel, which is like kerosene, it's not a um, highly, it's not as volatile as gas, so it's not as explosive, it's more of a slow burning item. It's got a significantly lower flash point, which is why you can do it with diesel engines and not with um, petrol engines. So, comes up, put your diesel in, compress it. As you compress it, that diesel air mixture gets really, really hot. Right, nice and hot. And then eventually you compress it just enough and it goes and burns. Right, so you get the burn, and that's your power stroke. Doesn't actually need a spark. So, after some time, once the glow plugs have, you know, if you're in a, does anyone drive a diesel car? Nope, well, that ex explanation won't work anyway. Um, after some time, the glow plugs will basically turn off or do very, very little, because as this is happening, the whole engine's heating up, right? That's why diesel engines can be really hard to start on a cold morning, if you don't let the glow plugs heat up the engine. So if you guys ever drive a diesel car, you'll see a symbol that looks normally like this, sitting in the dash, like a little curly wire. Gotta wait for it to go that's out. That's the sign for glow plugs, so you gotta wait for it to go out. The reason why is that's heating up the cylinder heads. So if it's a really cold day, that, can take, that light can take quite a while to go out, because it's heating them up enough so that you'll get nice quick starting. Otherwise, you'll sit there cranking, waiting for it to kind of do its thing doesn't work so well. But that's how compression ignition works. So the diesel comes in, it gets squeezed, gets hot, gets to a high enough temperature, it burns on its own, creating the power strength. So it doesn't actually need a spark plug. Okay? But it doesn't burn on avgas, it burns on diesel, right? Now diesel in aviation is just jet fuel. Because diesel and kerosene, very, very similar. Um, and jet one is just refined kerosene. Happy with that? Mm -hmm. um, what else do we need to go through? Mm. Okay, we go go into injection later. So I'll cover this in a second. Also worth noting that diesel engines are generally direct injection. All right. Now we have to wait for 
this one's a load. It's going to type for me, but... <laughs> So what we'll go through is basic principles of a card, how it works. It's a pretty common way of uh, how we make that fuel air mixture inside the engine. Okay, the mixture control, how it works. Types of abnormal combustion, carburetor icing, and then we'll go through injection systems which is starting to become more common in fuel involved in Okay. Uh, so the carburetor, this is a very simple cross-section of a carburetor. So inside a card, you've got a fuel supply coming from a fuel bank into a what we call a float chamber. Now, this um, float chamber will have a float in it with a little needle on the top that blocks the fuel supply. So as you use fuel, float chamber moves down, that needle comes out, fuel comes in, fills up the float chamber, pushes the float back up, locks it. So it's self-regulating, so it can create a very constant amount of pressure inside this car. Because uh, let's say you were using a, um, let's say you were flying a 172, so it's got overwing tanks, but maybe you were doing a ferry flight from here to Australia, so you also had ferry tanks installed that were sort of below the fuel system, right? Fuel tanks, you've got the pressure of gravity pulling it down to the engine, that's the pressure you have. So if you had a carbureted engine, it would be calibrated for that pressure. But now you have a ferry tank and you have a fuel pump installed and it's pushing it in at a much higher pressure. It's going to throw everything out of whack inside the car if we didn't have this float chamber, if it was just fuel going straight through, right? We'd start putting more fuel through if the pressure was high. So what this does is it allows it to regulate the pressure of that fuel inside. Then we have a metering jet here. Now that's again calibrated with fuel so that we get the appropriate amount of fuel going into the engine for each setting, okay? Now, with this metering jet, this is sort of what you hear being talked about when, I don't know if you guys ride bikes or anything like that, then normally you can get different ones and you can pull them out, put new ones in, and you get different fuel flows based on what you want to do. So if you're increasing the airflow into an engine, you're normally going to need to increase the fuel flow, so you'll need a slightly wider um, metering jet. This then comes into the fuel nozzle, which sticks into the air intake, or the inlet manifold for the air. So this is where we get our air intake, so that comes in through the front of the aircraft, and it comes through this venturi here. So there's this little squeeze just in here. Now what happens is, because we've got all this air coming through here, and it's got to go through a smaller space in the same amount of time, what happens to the air? Compression. Yep. Goes faster goes faster, right? Because if you have to get more stuff for a smaller space in the same amount of time, it's got to go faster, otherwise you won't get the stuff through, right? So what that does is it increases the dynamic pressure, okay, because it's going faster. Dynamic pressure, that's like when you're running down the room, you feel the wind on your chest, that's dynamic pressure. Static pressure is like the atmospheric pressure you feel while you're just sitting here, right? Now, the um, Bernoulli's theorem says that as you go through a venturi, as you increase dynamic pressure, Right, the static pressure will drop. And what that means is this has static pressure because it's not really moving. It's got a little bit of pressure in it. This static pressure is going to be higher than the low pressure out here. Because of that, it gets sucked out. So it gets sucked into the airflow. Right? It's, um, imagine you're in a, in a river and you have a, um, I don't know, a bottle of food coloring or something like that. You point it downstream the river and that flow will pull that food colouring out of the bottle until the pressure equalises out, right? Same, same principle. So it allows it to pull out, the fuel then vaporises because this little venturi has sort of, imagine a, um, like a strainer on top with lots and lots of little holes in it. So it allows that fuel to come out and vaporise. So it vaporises and it mixes with the air. So now you've got your fuel air charge. Then normally downstream of that, 
you have your throttle valve, otherwise known as a butterfly valve. So if you go full throttle, so you push the throttle all the way in, full throttle, this opens up so you can get max airflow into the cylinder. So because there's more airflow, you're going to get more fuel, you're also going to get more air, more power. Right? If we close this, what happens to the airflow? Slows down. Slows down. So what happens to the amount of fuel that'll get pulled out of here? Less. It'll be less. So it's a very, very simple mechanism, but it works really, really well. They've been around for ages and they work very, very well. Okay? So the whole point of a carb is it provides the correct fuel to air ratio, air, fuel to air ratio for combustion. Okay? So one to twelve is the stoichiometric mixture, okay? which means the uh, I don't know, the the scientifically correct mixture by weight. Yeah. So in our carb, we have our Venturi, which is this guy here. Okay, so it's a narrow and dark, accelerates air, reduces that static pressure. Because the fuel's now at a higher static pressure, it's sucked into the carb, it vaporizes, the throttle controls the airflow, and therefore the fuel air rate getting into the air. Okay. Float chamber, or the float system, as we talked about before, it maintains that constant head of fuel, maintaining a constant fuel pressure into the metering jet, and the metering jet basically corrects for the fuel air ratio. So it has to be calibrated for your aircraft and the way it's set up. Or if you have a car or a bike or anything like that, works the same way. Right? So you can't take your, uh, yeah, I don't know, what's a, what's a crappy car that people are about? Um, civet. A, a what? Civet. Yeah, a civet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you take your civic and then you put two turbos on it. Right? Uh, civics, I don't think you're carved. But anyway, you take your carburetor civic, which is their rear as, and put two turbos on it. Now you've got boatloads of air coming through here. There's no way you're going to be able to provide enough fuel. So you're going to need to make that better and get bigger so you can get more fuel in there. So on top of that, there's some just different systems that have helped with that. So you've got an atomization or a diffusion system. Now what that is, is that's that strainer that's on the main jet. Okay? So it allows the fuel to break up before it comes out of the um, jet. So instead of just coming out of like a hose, it's like putting your thumb on there or putting a, something over the hose so that it sprays out before it's even... Um, had a chance to mix with the air. Okay. An idling system. So what an idling system does is, um, oh, we'll get to this in a second, but basically what an idling system does is when you close the throttle, there's very, very little air coming to the engine. Some engines won't run. Right? If you close the throttle all the way, there's just not enough fuel and air going to the engine, so the engine's gonna eventually stop. So an idling system, allows a little bit of fuel flow to come through and keep the engine running at those low power settings. Because if you close the throttle, you close the butterfly, so there's not enough air coming through, and if there's not enough air coming through, the fuel can't vaporise, right? So you get a little bit of air coming through, what an idling system does is it goes downstream of the throttle body and it introduces a little bit of fuel to help the engine keep running when, uh, when that pressure is too low around the main jet. An accelerating system, so none of you guys are up to circuits yet. When you guys start doing circuits, the first thing you'll do on a touch and go is go, oh no, we're running out of runway, full power, and you push it in really quick. And then as you do that, you'll increase all this airflow to the engine, but it hasn't had enough time to give it enough fuel, so the engine will go, pa 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 and then go, and you'll sit there and you crap yourself for about two seconds while that's happening. That's why you put your fuel pump on, right? Yep, that helps a little bit, but the accelerating system... Oh, so it's a different is, system. Yeah. Right. Um, so the accelerating system, if we didn't have that and you did that, you'd probably stop the engine. So we have an accelerating system, which if you move the throttle in quickly, puts a burst of fuel in to compensate for that sudden increase in air until the main jet picks up the speed. Because remember, there's lag. Because when you, have, when you open this, the airflow will increase pretty much instantaneously but it takes a little bit of time for the air, for the fuel out of that um, main jet to come back up to speed. So you get this spot where there's lots of air and not much fuel, so it doesn't run that well, so the engine has less power. 
So that's when the accelerating system does. A enrichment system, so that's when you're at um, full throttle, maybe this is calibrated for best power, right? So it's giving you the best amount of fuel air mixture for best power at full throttle. But with that, the engine's gonna heat up lots and lots and lots, because you're putting lots of fuel air charge in, there may not be enough fuel in there for cooling, because fuel also helps cool the engine down, right? So if what the enrichment system does is when you've got a full power setting, it, again, just downstream, adds a little bit extra fuel to help keep the engine cool. Yeah? So if you lean an engine right out, so there's only just enough fuel, that fuel air mixture gets to a really hot point, whereas if you have lots of fuel, um, it burns quite cold. It's the same as if you have, let's say you spill some fuel on the floor, and if you set that on fire, it wouldn't burn too hot. But if you spray a Lynx can, I don't know why this Lynx can's coming up a lot, but it's working quite well. Spray a Lynx can, set that on fire, that's really, really hot, right? Because it's vaporized, it's mixing with all that air a lot more. Whereas if you just sprayed it on the ground and let it sit on the ground or wherever it and let it on fire, it'd be nowhere near as hot, right? Because it doesn't have as much air mixed in with it. Everyone with me so far? Too many Lynx can analogies? Yeah. All right, so then we have the mixture control. So the mixture control is normally a red knob sitting in the aircraft somewhere, okay? Um, traditionally, it's red, so people don't touch it and forget about it. Because um, if you pull it out, what happens? Engine turns off. Engine. Like, right. it's just air, it's no, not... No yeah, so what happens to the engine? It turns off. Yeah, it stops. <laughs> right. So, what the... Um, so the, um, what am I trying to say? So the cup mixes, uh, mixes air by volume, okay? So it's all done with weight, and that's how we get the correct fuel mixture. Now, what happens with aircraft? Do we, are we like a car? Do we just operate on the ground the whole time? No. no. What happens as we go up? What happens to the air as we go up? It's less, uh, it gets colder. Gets colder? Yep. That's actually not the right path I want to go down. <laughs> what happens to the density of air as you go up? Does it get thicker or thinner? Thinner. Thinner, right? Can you breathe on Mount Everest without a mask? Not really. Right? So the air gets less thin. Okay? Um, yeah, don't say yes. <laughs> so you've got, you now have less dense. So you have less of those air molecules coming into the fuel inlet. You've still got the same amount of fuel molecules coming out. So it's basically the same as putting loads of fuel in. Right? Again, going back to our example of the Lynx can versus lighting it on the table, it doesn't burn as efficiently if it's not vaporized or it doesn't have the right fuel to air mixture. So we want to make sure that we get that right mixture. So as we climb, we're going to start getting less and less power because there's more and more fuel and less and less air. So what we do to make sure we get more power out of the engine is we start leaning the mixture. So we pull the mixture and it reduces the amount of fuel that's going into that inlet manifold, which makes the mixture what we call leaner. So if there's less fuel, it's leaner. If there's more fuel, it's richer. Okay? And that allows us to burn at that correct um, ratio. If we left it at full rich and climbed up, eventually we get to the point where there'd be so much fuel the engine would just stop. Right? So that's why when we're climbing, when we're up nice and high, we lean it out. So when you're flying small aircraft, you normally won't lean too much. When you're flying big aircraft with big engines, and you're flying up high, you lean sometimes even in the climb so that you can get the right amount of power. What do you have to be careful with with leaning, being that we just talked about fuel being used as a coolant? Doesn't overheat the um, cylinder. Yeah, it doesn't overheat the engine. You lean the mixture just to, before the engine stops running, the engine runs really hot. So that's why if you're, you know, if you ever do run-ups and you get one mag that's got a really bad drop on it, what you'll see the instructors do and what you guys will do eventually is run the engine up to a higher power setting and then lean the mixture out just till the engine RPM starts dropping. Because it makes the engine really, really hot, which burns off all the crap on the mags. But the important thing there is it gets the engine really hot. If you get the engine really hot, it'll overheat. If it gets too hot, it'll stop, which is not good. So, mixture, it allows the pilot to compensate for the altitude. Yeah. Generally, the fuel air mixture should be correct at sea level when the mixture control is set to full reach. 
okay, at a normal power setting. If you're on the ground at a lower power setting, it may be too rich. So again, when you start flying bigger aircraft, you'll quite commonly see people leaning on the ground to get that ratio right for the low power setting they're using. Cool. How do we use the mixture? So generally, full rich for takeoff. If we were at a high density altitude, so let's say we we're in an airport at six or 7,000 feet, or we're even at Taupo, which is at 2,000 feet, but it's a 30 degree day, you have a density altitude of about 40 to 45 degrees, you haven't gone into density altitude yet, judging by the look of your faces. Um, we'll go into that later. But basically, because the air's warm, it's less dense, so the aircraft feels like it's at a much higher altitude. That's density altitude in a 30 second or 10 second summary. Um, so then, if you went full pack, full rich, the mix, there's too much fuel and not enough air, and you're not going to get the most power. What do we want for takeoff? We want the most power. So when you're doing your run ups, you'd lean it out so you get the best power. So then that way, when you do your takeoff, you have the correct. Okay. Generally, full rich for the climb. Again, unless you're doing an extended climb, so you're climbing up above 6,000 feet. Um, as a generic number, that's what I do. Lean it out a little bit. Gives you a little bit better performance in the climb, but you have to watch your temperatures. Okay. For landing, full rich pretty much everywhere, because generally power is not a massive issue on landing. But if you're at a really high density altitude, you still want to make sure it was leaned out a little bit because if you have to go around, you want full power, right? All right, so how do we lean the mixture? To lean the mixture, we slowly move the mixture control to the lean position. Slowly is the key word, don't pull it all the way out, the engine will stop, things get excited. Okay? As you pull the mixture out, the RPM will slowly increase. Okay? Then you get to a point where the RPM will slowly decrease, and then you get to a point where the engine goes. <coughs> and that's when you've leaned it too much. Um, so you want to get it to the peak RPM, or what we call um, rich of peak. So lean it out until you get the peak, so you see the RPM come up to the most, and then just push the mixture in a little bit so the RPM drops a touch. You always want to be on the rich side of peak, because that gives you better engine cooling and better engine life. Right? If you were doing a long cross country, for example, flying from here to Australia, then maybe you'd have to run lean of peak to save fuel. But ideally, you always want to run rich of peak. Okay? Um, again, any time you change altitude or change power settings, you're going to have to adjust it. Using the RPM gauge is pretty inaccurate. Some aircraft have EGT gauges. So anytime, again, you're flying bigger aircraft with bigger engines, they will pretty much always have an EGT gauge. So an exhaust gas temperature gauge. Now, that's a really efficient way of leaning because it's nice and accurate and it gives you a really good pinpoint of where the peak is. Okay? So again, you do it exactly the same way. You'd lean it to the peak, and then you'd enrich it. Generally, it's about 50 degrees Fahrenheit is how much you'll enrich it. The reason why I say 50 degrees Fahrenheit, not Celsius, is because most of these gauges are always in Fahrenheit, so I might as well tell you what you're going to see in the gauge rather than a real unit. Um, but yeah. Happy? Cool. Overrich mixture, loss of power, rough running, we get spark plug fouling. Okay. So that's why on the ground sometimes you can get spark plug fouling if you're operating in a really low power setting for a long time. Um, also you can get a lead deposit buildup on the piston heads and valves because there is a lead in the fuel. Right? Avgas is leaded fuel, it's not like um, motor gas which is unleaded now. So avgas still has lead in it. Now with that if you do have a full rich mixture and it's not burning hot enough that lead won't burn out of the fuel. So it'll stick to the cylinder heads. Then what will happen is it will slowly heat up as you're using the engine. Then you'll get these really hot lead deposits, and then suddenly you've got something that's the same temperature as the spark plugs. So as soon as you introduce fuel, it starts burning. Then you get things like detonation and pre-ignition, which is not good. An overlean mixture, high CHTs, right? So cylinder head temperatures, that can be bad because generally if you've got a CHT gauge, you have limits on that. So you've got to keep the cylinder heads under a certain temperature. Detonation. So detonation is, when we think about combustion in an engine, normal combustion is where it burns nice and smooth. Detonation is where it just goes bang. Right? And that's a really sharp power increase, and it can cause some really severe engine damage very, very quickly. We'll go into that in a bit. 
Again, if we overlay the mixture, you get a loss of power. Think about how you shut down the engine. You pull the mixture, the engine stops, loss of power. Or you get a complete engine failure. Again, going through, pull the mixture, engine stops. So we want to be quite careful with that. Looking at those, what's the slightly better option? Overreach. Overreach. All right. Overreach and less power, runs a bit rough, spark plugs will foul up, you might get some lead deposits if you keep the temperatures cool, nothing bad's going to happen. Or if you overlean it, you'll overheat the aircraft, blow the engine up, lose power and the engine will stop. I know what I'd rather do. So too rich is always preferable for too lean. Now if you're flying a helicopter, they keep the mixture full rich at all times, but that's because helicopter pilots get nose leads above 1500 feet, so they don't even go that high anyway, so that's alright. Um, us, when you're flying in a Robin, once you're flying in the cruise above 3,000 feet, then you can start leaning the mixture, otherwise I wouldn't bother. If you're flying something like a 172 or a 182 or something with a bigger engine, then yep, you'd lean in the cruise regardless of what altitude you're at, but in a Robin, they're little engines, they don't, you know, there's not that much fluctuation, so it's not super important, but once you're up nice and high, you want to get the best power you can, because then you get places quicker, which is what you want to do, right? Idle cutoff, so what that does is it cuts the fuel into the carb. Makes sense, so that's when we pull the mixture all the way off. When you pull it out, you'll feel it'll go out smoothly and then there'll be like a little notch, right? That is the idle cutoff that you're pulling. So you pull it all the way and then you pull it past that notch, the engine stops. And that's what that is. So it entirely stops the fuel to the engine, okay? And then because of that, um, there's no fuel left in the engine. That's our normal way of shutting down because it means there's no fuel left in the inlet manifold, there's no fuel left in the cylinders. So if someone left the mags on and they leaned on the prop, it wouldn't start because there's no fuel in it. If you turn the keys to off, there's still fuel in the ignition, um, and if one of the mags was working, then it would um, start. But also if you turn the keys to off and one of the mags was working, you wouldn't be able to shut down using the keys, so you'd probably figure it out. But be really cautious. Cool. All right. What's that? Cylinder spark. Yeah, a spark cylinder. So that's normal combustion, right? So it's a nice smooth burn into the centre of the cylinder there. Okay. So normal condition, uh, normal combustion. So we have two flame fronts. So initiating from each spark plug, and it's a nice, smooth, steady increase in cylinder pressure. So it forces that piston down nice and smoothly. Right? We say smoothly, it's not really like a gentle push, it's still like a train. But compared to what it could be, it's a fairly smooth linear increase in power. Okay? Combustion, uh, sorry, abnormal combustion, so in this case detonation, is a very rapid burning. Right? So it's not even, it's more explosive, it's hardly burning. Okay? So that's when you see your uh, Southwest Americans with their truck tires and their spray leg stand in it and then light it and run away and it goes Poof! That's detonation, right? Rather than the smooth burning. Okay. So detonation when the charge temperature is too high and the pressure is too high. So high compression ratio engines can do this, right? Um, and then it's when the charge explodes. So the flame front can be 20, up to 25 times faster than normal which is huge, right? So normal burning is your car driving down the uh, road at 10 k's an hour. Detonation is someone overtaking you at 250 k's an hour. It's a massive difference, okay? Generally, it'll occur in all cylinders when it happens. Now the difference between detonation and normal is about, or detonation and pre-ignition, is pre-ignition will run quite a long time. You'll get plenty of, um, you know, you'll get you know, 250,000, 300,000 RPM before you have any major engine issues. Um, with detonation, you might only get 15,000 RPM before the engine just entirely craps itself. So it's a very severe issue. Generally, you'll hear a knocking noise. It's very hard to describe if you don't know engines. But it can be, you know, if you're wearing an active noise cancelling headset, if you're wearing a good headset, you're probably not going to hear it. 
but it's a it's a rough running round and it does kind of it almost sounds like it sounds like a knock. It's called knocking for a reason. Um, compared to what nor the normal engine sound sounds like, which is relatively smooth. If you have a cylinder head temperature gauge, you're gonna get really high cylinder head temps readings, which is bad, okay? Now, causes, you can have too hot a fuel air charge or too much fuel air in a high compression ratio engine and it heats up too much and explodes. Time expired fuel, so fuel can get more volatile over time, right? If you have the wrong grade of fuel, so let's say you put, um, 91 in a Afgas engine, right? That lower grade of fuel can be more volatile. It won't burn as effectively, but it's more volatile. So it's more likely to explode rather than burn. Overleaning, as we talked about before, it can get too hot, which then leads to detonation. An overheated engine also leads to it. That is a piston after detonation. That is not good for compression. Right? That, that generally doesn't help things. That probably actually flew out the side of the engine, which is why it's got a hole in it. So, it's really bad. Okay? So you can get very severe damage to the pistons. The valves, sometimes they can get bent, um, so then the valves stop working. Spark plugs, they can pop out the back. Um, you can get complete engine failure quite quickly. Minor detonation. You could maybe get on the ground if you recognised it immediately. So full rich, cool everything down, try and get on the ground, right? But you want to avoid it at all costs. Pre-ignition is when that fuel air charge ignites before it receives a spark. So it can occur in one cylinder rather than um, you know all cylinders. Detonation generally tends to happen overall because you've overheated the engine or for whatever, or you've overleaned it. Pre-ignition can be caused normally by build-ups or something like that. Um, sometimes even build-ups on the spark plugs, a little bit of lead heats up on the spark plug and causes it before we want it to. So normal ignition, we get the burn as it's coming up, nice and good. Pre-ignition, we get that nice power stroke before the cylinder's got the top dead centre. So as it's coming up, this fuel air charge is trying to push it down, right? And it's going to cause some very rough run. Okay. High power setting, mixture too lean can cause it, um, but generally it's from lead deposits from too rich a mixture and then going, oh no, the rich mixture's too rich and leaning it out and then you get too high a temperature, so you change quite quickly and it doesn't burn off in a slow, smooth way. Um, overheated spark plugs, so that's when you run out at a high power setting and the mixture too lean, spark plugs will heat up and create the same thing as lead deposits. Basically you get rough running, um, could get backfiring as well. So as the uh, when you get that exhaust and inlet valve overlap, it could be backfiring through that. You could be pushing a whole lot of fuel out like the other inlet valves. Cylinder head temperature will generally rise a bit. Um, can get engine damage from it. It will still cause engine damage, right? But it's nowhere near as severe and will not happen nowhere near as quickly as detonation. Okay? Knock knock. Detonation. <laughs> no, no, that was the joke. <laughs> it's a good one. No, it's not. <laughs> Fine. Maybe stick to the phone. You guys suck. <laughs> it's not. It's you guys that aren't funny. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so abnormal combustion. There's detonation and pre-ignition. Detonation will cause engine damage much more quicker, much more quickly then pre-ignition will, both of them are hazardous, right? So abnormal combustion you want to avoid. Basically, don't run the engine too hot and don't change any power settings too quickly. So don't go to a full power, very lean mixture really quickly. Slowly enrich in the mixture, slowly lean the mixture out. Because then if you do have any lead deposits, if you slowly lean it out, as it gets hotter, they'll just slowly burn off rather than sit there, heat up, and sort of stick themselves to the side of the uh, cylinder. Happy? Questions? Cool. You guys are easy. Um, all right, carburetor icing. So carbon icing causes a loss of performance. If you got really bad icing, it could cause engine stoppage as well, right? Because it covers the entire air inlet. In this one here, you can see a little bit of ice forming sort of around that throttle butterfly, and there's some just up on the edge up here as well, right? Yeah. 
So there's three types. There's refrigeration ice or fuel icing, throttle icing, and impact icing. Okay? There's a link and does it work? There's a link. Oh, it's a video. I haven't watched this one. Here we go. Hang on. Oh no. Why is it not going over? That one. There we go. As most pilots or shade tree mechanics will probably recognize, this is a carburetor and this is ice. And for pilots flying an airplane like this, one without fuel ejection, when these two come together, the results can be very disturbing. Carburetor racing can occur any time of the year, even on a hot day. But the most prevalent times are during cool summer and early fall days with high humidity or visible moisture in the form of haze or rain. The Venturi effect of air passing through the carburetor lowers the temperature considerably, causing water vapor to freeze and eventually, without correction, can cause the engine to quit. The first sign of carburetor icing may be a slight reduction in the RPM of the engine or a loss of manifold pressure. By applying carb heat, a flow of heated air from the exhaust melts the ice and eventually allows full power to return. It may be necessary to adjust the mixture to smooth out the engine, so consult your flight instructor for proper usage. If you do have carburetor ice, be prepared for a further loss of power when carb heat is initially applied, as water from the melting ice is drawn into the engine. Be patient and allow the ice to melt. Power will be restored in a minute or so. If the carb heat is turned off before the ice is completely melted, the engine may fail entirely. And with a cold exhaust, you won't have enough hot air to melt the ice and restore the power. A check of the pilot's operating handbook will list the recommended times to apply carburetor heat for your particular aircraft. Anticipate and check for carburetor icing by applying carb heat periodically as an anti-icer rather than a de-icer. And finally, be aware that the use of motor vehicle gasoline or MOGAS can dramatically increase the temperature range for the occurrence of carburetor icing. Carburetor ice can be fatal, but learning to recognize the signs of carb ice and knowing the steps to take to prevent it can work towards making every flight a safe and enjoyable one. Was a fairly pleasant busy. Yep, that's what I said. Alright. So, carb icing. Which one's my one? Hey. So, as the fuel vapor vaporizes, right, as it expands and absorbs light and heat from the air, lowering its temperature. What analogy could I use to explain that? Links, Links can, right, any deodorant can, any aerosol. As that um, gas aerosol mixture expands, it gets cold, right? So I'm sure you've all had kids running around high school spraying blinks on each other and burning them and that sort of thing. So that's where you get that fuel, fuel icing. So as it expands, uh, it gets cold. So any water vapour in the air will freeze. Then when it freezes, it'll stick to whatever's next to it, which could be the throttle body or the side of the throttle. Then you've got refrigeration ice. Um, which can also be caused by as that air speeds up through the um, venturi, that air pressure drops. The temperature will also drop when that happens too. So in combination with the fuel, also because of the venturi effect, the temperature will reduce. So any um, water vapor flowing through here will freeze. Same thing happens on the throttle body, right? Goes through a narrow gap, expands again, cools down as it expands, causes throttle rise. When are you most likely to get throttle icing? When flying in rain when it's um, under zero degree. What power setting? Oh, um, which? What power setting? Oh. Low. Think about what the throttle looks like when you're at full power versus low power. Yeah. If you're at low power, you've got a very narrow gap in the air intake, right? If you're at a high power setting, the gap's much bigger, so there's very little, you know, um, very little expansion and accelerating of the air, so there's going to be very little temperature change. Okay. Uh, Why you're turning the carb heat on when you're coming to land, because you obviously you've got less power yeah, going through. Exactly. So anytime you're operating the engine at a low power setting, you normally have the carb heat on, so stop that throttle icing. But also we have checks like safety checks and flight where we cycle the carb heat to allow us to mitigate the risk of 
getting car base as we go on. Um, conditions, so outside air temperatures up to about 25 degrees and down to about minus 10 degrees. Okay? Below that, the ice, the, um, the air is generally quite dry and the ice is not sticky. So it won't stick, it'll just kind of flow through the engine. Um, so as ice gets colder and colder, it stops sticking to stuff. It's like a slushy, right? It's only just frozen. You throw it at the wall, it sticks to the wall. But if you have an ice cube and you throw it at the wall, it, it doesn't stick to the wall, it just bounces off. That's basically what happens when the temp temperature gets really, really cold. Um, above freezing, when the relative humidity is high, you can get carb icing in pretty much any day. In New Zealand's climate, we're the most susceptible to it, right? Because we're normally above minus 10 degrees, we're normally below 25 degrees, and we're right next to the water, so the relative humidity is normally quite high. So in New Zealand, we have like perfect conditions for carb icing. So you want to make sure you're cycling your carb heat regularly. You will notice that, especially if you're in the cruise, you go, oh, I keep slowing down to keep adding power. Oh, I'm slowing down to keep adding power. You get full power and go, ah, oh, oh, that's right, and cycle the carb heat. Right? Remember, when you do cycle the carb heat, you're putting all that ice that's formed straight through the engine, so the engine's going to run rough as guts for a little bit. So don't put the carb, ice, carb heat off then, because then you're just going to allow it to stop and stick wherever it is. Which is not good. Yeah. Um, Frontal icing, talked about that. Frontal icing is low power settings, and again, when you're in that same temperature range as pretty much any other. Okay. Some aircraft will actually have carb air temperature um, gauges, so that's what the CAT they're talking about is. Because in the carb, the temperature is generally lower than normal, right? Because of that, as it goes through the Venturi, that air temperature will lower. So while the carb air temperature is minus 10 degrees for carb icing, if it's zero degrees outside, you're probably going to have a carb air temperature that's going to be slightly lower than minus 10 degrees, so you're not going to be at risk of carb icing. But then if you put the carb heat on, what happens? Your carb air temperature now goes back into the carb icing range. So that's where you've got to be quite careful when you're operating in cold, cold weather, is using half carb heat, never use half carb heat because you may bring the carb air temperature into the icing range. Generally, if you use full carb heat, it'll ne it should never stay in the range because that air and like goes around the exhaust pipe, so it's a fairly constant temperature. Cool? Questions? Everyone's following? Excellent. Um, causes, so impact icing is, it's like any icing on an aircraft. It can be like wing icing or anything like that. Um, and it will generally occur in the same, um, at the same time as the same area. So impact icing is when it impacts the outside of the air, um, aircraft or just inside the air inlet where it's not sort of changed. So super cool water droplets. So any water droplet that's below zero degrees but hasn't formed into ice yet. So if there's no condensation nuclei, there's nothing to stimulate that water droplet to actually freeze, it won't. It'll just sit there in a cloud or below a cloud at minus four degrees or minus five degrees. And then as soon as it hits something, it goes, yeah, I can freeze and sticks to you, right? Which isn't good. Um, super cold water droplets are actually really, really dangerous. So there's something you've got to be quite careful of because if you fly through a shower of super cold water droplets, your aircraft will go from no ice to being like looking like a snowman and then you'll bring up you weigh an extra ton more and you'll have zero airflow because it'll destroy the lift over the wings. So you'll be very, very cautious of that. Um, if the aircraft skin is below zero degrees, you can get visible moisture. Who's touched the outside of the aircraft after you've been flying, even on a summer's day? Yep, metal's quite cold, right? Now imagine it's a day like today where the weather's kind of nice, you can get up nice and high and it's real good. So you're up at 10,000 feet, maybe it's minus two degrees. There's no cloud around, there's no visible moisture. Minus two degrees, plus the aircraft's down the third of the sky, the side of the aircraft skin's starting to get pretty cold. So now the aircraft skin's sitting at sort of minus three degrees. As you start descending, it doesn't instantaneously go up as the temperature goes up, right? It takes some time to warm up. So if you descend and descend through a rain shower, that may have rain is at three or four degrees, but the aircraft skin's at minus one degree when you do it, what's gonna happen? 
by the time that the water's going to start freezing. So that's when you can get impact icing as well. Generally, it'll form on the inlet air scoop, okay, or just on the general front facing surface, depending on what sort of air intake you have. If you don't have a filtered air intake or the filter is further back, as it comes into that air inlet, it'll form at the scoop at the back and create like a little ledge, like you can see there. And that can actually restrict icing much more than icing on the air filter up here. Because see how narrow that gap is now? Real small. So you'll be quite cautious of that. So carb heat at that point can be an alternate air source because you don't have any heat to stop this icing forming. So if you use carb heat, it's now an alternate air. So your carburetor air intake is normally sort of tucked away so that it can't get impact icing. Or it's very, or it's not very susceptible to it. Yeah. So impact icing where it's likely outside air temperatures close to or below zero flying through visible moisture, doesn't just mean flying through clouds, right? So just because you're a VFR pilot and you don't have an instrument rating and you don't fly through clouds doesn't mean you can't fly through visible, visible moisture, right? I'm sure by the time you've done your training you will have flown through a million rain showers. That's visible moisture. People tend to forget that flying for a rain shower is visible moisture and if the temperature's cold you will pick up ice. So be quite cautious of that. Would that also potentially happen if you have a really high humidity day but it's also quite cold? Yeah, I mean, a high humidity day plus being very cold is a nightmare for flying. Yeah. Um, VFR, generally, it's all right because it's very real. As the temperature gets lower, the amount of water you can hold on the... Like, while the relative humidity might still be 60%, mm -hmm. the amount of water that is is significantly less. Right. Like, think about going to... Um, I don't know, you go to Queenstown, go skiing... It can still be minus three or four degrees, but the air's quite dry. Even if it's raining, the air's quite dry. But you go to the tropics on a sunny day, and the air feels really humid and really muggy, because as the air gets hotter, it can hold more water. So if it is cold, you can still get a high relative humidity, but the actual amount of water vapour in the air is significantly less, so it does get... The risk does drop of aircraft skin icing. Same reason why like commercial airliners, once they're below about minus 10 degrees, don't worry about icing, because the amount of water is pretty much nothing, um, and the ice is so cold that it doesn't want to stick anyway, so there's so little moisture that they can fly through any cloud, they're not really going to pick up icing. It's when you fly through the big fluffy ones at minus one degree, and you come out and you look like a snowman, that's when it's, that's when it's not good. Cool. Signs of carburetor, icing, okay. You have a loss of power, so loss of RPM if you're in a fixed pitch aircraft. If you're in a constant speed aircraft, loss of manifold pressure. Just the general loss of performance. Right. If you're flying up high on a summer's day, maybe you're flying at 100 knots at 2,500 RPM, and then you keep increasing the power, you get full power, then the RPM slowly starts going down. You know, carb icing, cycle the carb heat. Really important to cycle the carb heat on those days. How do we remedy carb icing? How do we fix it? Hot air. Carb heat, yeah. So we put the carb heat on, clears the ice. Okay. Impact icing, what do we do if we get impact icing and our engine performance starts reducing? Hmm? Carb alternate air. Yeah. Well, our carb heat is sometimes our alternate air. Not too many GA aircraft have alternate engine air as a, like a separate thing. Um, generally, it is just a carb heat. For example, most light fuel injected aircraft have no alternate air. All right, carb heat intake in a robin. It's that little hole just in there, okay, tucked in behind there. Generally, it's sort of out of the way um, of impact icing. Sometimes they can be just have a different air intake below it, which is generally not the best. What it does, it heats up that inlet air. It's got a tube that runs around the exhaust manifold. The exhaust's obviously very, very hot, so it heats up that air. Then as the air comes into the engine, it's nice and warm, so it can break down all the ice in the car. But because it's hot, what happens to the air density? More dense. More dense when it gets hot? Less dense when it gets hot? Yeah. What do we think? Less dense? Yeah. 
Because remember, as, as anything heats up, those particles start bouncing around more and they start taking up more space, therefore less dense. Right? If it's less dense, we're going to get a lower um, performance out of our engine. So that's why when you pull the carpet on, generally you see a small reduction in power, regardless of whether you've got icing or not. Pre-flight check when we do our run-ups, we want to make sure that the RPM decreases with carpet. Because if it doesn't, what does that mean? It's not working. Yeah, carpet doesn't work. Is not good. Cool. Um, we've talked about this already. If we have carb ice, full carb heat, initially the engine will run rough and then it will improve as the ice clears. Once the engine runs smoothly, carb heat off. Okay. This is a carb air temperature gauge. So generally it has a little yellow arc for the hazard range that it rough. Okay. Um, if you have a carb air temperature gauge, you can keep an eye on that basically keep the carb temperature out of the icing range, which is fairly easy. Cool. Um, and that way you can do a sort of finely tune the carb heat, so at that stage maybe you could use half carb heat, but if you actually think there's ice then just use full, full carb heat. Okay. Um, if it's really, really cold and the carb air temperature is maybe at minus 25, and you put the carb <coughs> on, carb heat on, and then maybe it run it up to zero degrees, you're now in that hazardous range, right? So be very cautious about using carb heat in very, like this is when you're flying outside, it's minus 20 degrees or minus 25 degrees. Um, be cautious of that. Low power operations, so descent, high humidity, so if it's a really muggy, humid day, make sure you've got carb heat on when you have a low power DC, okay? Short final, make sure you Initially, you have carb heat on as you set up into land because you want to mitigate the risks of carb icing. But you want to make sure the carb heat is off just before you uh, land so that if you need to go around, you've got full power. Really, really important. Ground ops, don't use the carb heat on the ground because it's not filtered. Generally, it's not filtered. Apparently, in an R22, it is filtered. Um, in most GA aircraft, they're not filtered. Crack on through this and we'll take a 15 minute coffee break. Okay? So, what's a fuel injection system? Someone talked to me about fuel injection. Tell me what it is. Excellent. I'll start picking people. Have a guess. John, what's fuel injection? The fuel is injected. Fuel is injected where? Into the induction. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's a few types of fuel injection system. There's direct injection and there's fuel in injection into um, individual induction manifolds. So basically, the way the system works is you'll have a fuel control unit which will be connected to um, a throttle and a mixture control. This is a manual fuel injection system. There's also electric fuel injection, which isn't that common in uh, aviation yet, but in your cars, pretty much everything is electric fuel injection. So instead of having cables and mechanical units to the fuel injection system, it's just all electronically metered. Uh, then that goes to a fuel control unit, which goes, oh, you need this much fuel for this power center. That then goes to a fuel manifold unit, which goes to um, each cylinder intake manifold, or if it's direct injection, straight into the cylinder. Okay? And each of those distributes exactly the same amount of fuel. So that means when, instead of having one air manifold where you come from your carb, you've got a nice big tube, and then it slowly splits off into tubes like, I don't know why this is a three cylinder aircraft, but whatever. Um, splits off like that, and more airflow can go this way, not much airflow can go that way, no airflow can go that way. So now this one's got heaps of charge, this one doesn't have as much, and this one doesn't have as much. So you don't get a, a purely uh, you know, it's, it's not the same throughout the entire, all the cylinders. With fuel injection, you get pretty much exactly the same fuel and air delivered to each cylinder. So, because there's no carb, it comes uh, 
it, all the inputs come straight from the throttle, the mixture, and the um, venturi position. Okay, and it'll control that, and it accurately meters it. So it'll always make sure it's at the chemically correct mixture, which is called what? Stoichiometric. Fun one. So advantages of a fuel injection system, there are a few. You can't get refrigeration ice, you can't get carb icing, um, because there is no carb. There's a more uniform fuel air mixture to each cylinder. You have less maintenance problems, right? Anyone who knows anyone with a carbed car or a bike always hears them complaining about the carb. But something to take into account is that carburetors are very simple. They work on a very simple principle, right? It's just fuel that comes through a nozzle into an inner manifold. Very, very simple. So when things break, which they tend to more, they're very easy to fix, right? It's very simple to adjust the car. Fuel injection units are much more complicated. So when they do go wrong, it's a... <laughs> it's a pain. It's a pain, yeah, that's the word I was going to use. <laughs> um, so you've got to be quite cautious in that. Better throttle response because it's pretty much immediate because you're the fuel unit. Um, and you get increased engine efficiency because everything's metered nice and perfectly the whole time. Disadvantages, you can get vapour locking. So generally the fuel injection lines, you have your engine which has been detonation, detonating for the last half an hour or whatever, whatever you're doing. So it's nice and hot. And then you have your fuel injection lines which are normally metal that come over to your injector in the engine, this is hot, right? It's going to heat up these lines. What happens if you heat up fuel inside a line? It wants to expand, right? If there's any bubbles in the fuel, what happens to the bubbles? Get bigger, and you end up with these little bubbles sitting in there. So that's what vapor lock is, right? So vapor locking is very, very common in fuel injected aircraft when the engine is hot. When they're cold, they're really easy to start. Because it's fuel injected, it goes straight in. It's nice and easy, you don't have to deal with the carb that needs airflow initially. When they're hot, they are the biggest pains in the ass to start. Right, so vapor locking can be really, really annoying. You do have increased susceptibility to fuel contamination. Why would that be? Because what though? Yep. Well, there's no, there's no, manifold that can catch heavy bits and it just goes straight into the intake manifold and sometimes straight into the cylinder, right? So there's no, because um, in that car there's normally a few filters in line. Again, you'll still have filters in line, but you're much more susceptible to getting stuff inside the engine because it's going straight into the cylinder or straight into the inner manifold. Um, you need greater awareness of fuel management because when you have excess fuel, it's still taking the fuel out of the tank, and then it goes to the metering unit, and the metering unit goes, actually, I don't need this, and then it takes it back. But maybe you took it from this tank over here, but it'll normally only have one discharge port, so it'll go, I don't need you. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the right tank. And you've been running off the left tank for 15 minutes, and suddenly your right tank's pissing fuel out the side because you're overfilling it, because all of the return fuel is coming back. Okay. So... Depending on which aircraft you're flying, you need to have awareness of which tank um, that excess fuel injected stuff gets rerouted to. Sure. All right. How does the carb work? <laughs> oh, God. Has an air intake, and then um, that uh, most of the time can be an alternate source of air or a secondary source of air into the um, intake manifold. Yep. Um, the carb heat works on the principle of air coming in uh, and the pipes wrapped around the exhaust. Yep. Um, that heats it up. Um, that's how you, um, what about the carb itself? What principles does it use? Why is it shaped the way it's shaped? Why does it have that squeeze? What's that called? It starts with a V. Venturi. Yeah. Answering all the questions, guy. Yeah, so that Venturi effect, right? Increases the speed of the airflow, decreases the static pressure, so that fuel gets sucked out of the nozzle, vaporized into the air, goes into the engine. What does the mixture control do? 
controls the ratio of um, fuel to uh, air. is that important? Um, take off landing, um, cruising at like uh, high altitudes. And yep, cool. Um, what are the two types of abnormal combustion, Devon? work, Abby? How does fuel injection work? Very simply. And why is it better? Oh, come on, we, we, we just went over this. Fuel gets injected. Let's go. Yep, into the inlight manifold or directly into the engine. Why is that better? No icing. No icing? Yep. Because there's no carb. Why else? Poor performance. Wow. More efficient, right? So it's more uniform, it's more even across all the cylinders, which generally leads to slightly more performance. What's bad about them? Vapor locking, what else? Harder to like fix if something goes wrong. Harder to fix, yep. What else? Think about what if you had stuff in the fuel? Oh, distribution, which we need to. Contamination. Contamination, right? That's very good. Alright, let's uh, take a 15 minute coffee break, <laughs> a long coffee break, and we'll be back at quarter to 11. Okay? That's okay. <laughs> Love the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go through fuel systems. Um, obviously, that's a fairly important part of aviation. If we don't have fuel, we don't go anywhere. And they just become model aircraft that are big and very expensive. So we need fuel. Um, what we're going to go through, fuel systems, components, how they work, fuel types and grades, fuel contaminants are the most common ones, how to check them, where the most sort of most locations of fuel contamination happen. If that English, that's in English, but you know what I mean. Uh, fuel checks, how do we do them, refueling, how do we do it, and fuel management, which is the most important part. So, what are the main components of a um, fuel system? Obviously, we've got the tanks, they store the fuel. Generally, they're in the aeroplane wings. In a robin, it's not, it's actually behind your back. Um, some aircraft have them in the wings, and in the back, and under the floor. It does vary a lot, but generally they're in the wings because it's sort of unused space. So you may as well put fuel in the wings there. The sump, okay, the sump is the lowest point in the tank. So each tank will have a low point designed into it with a drain valve below it. So anything, that, any heavy impurities or anything that's sort of contaminating the fuel will sink to that low point and then will be you can drain it out or check if there's anything in there. Above that will be the um, the fuel intake, I guess you call it. Yeah, intake um, will normally sit about that far above that low point, which means there is going to be some fuel you can't use, so there will be some unusable fuel. Drain point from the lowest point. Um, the Supply line or the standpipe is just above the drain as we talked about, so there's always some unusable fuel. That will be detailed in the flight manual. Sometimes it's lots, sometimes it's very little. For example, the Robin has two litres unusable fuel. Um, one of the other aircraft I fly has zero unusable fuel in some of the tanks. Right? But the downside of having zero unusable fuel is you will take in all the impurities that are sitting in the tank. Um, vents, they allow the air to enter and exit the tanks as fuel gets used because if you had a sealed fuel tank and you used up the fuel you create a vacuum and then either the wing would implode or the fuel would stop going to the engine which would be bad so we have vents generally they're in the filler caps sometimes you have um, separate fuel vents as well 
located out the bottom. Normally there's an overflow and a fuel vent. Um, generally they're one way. It just lets fuel in, they don't let fuel out. Uh, sorry, air in, try not to let fuel out. Overflow drain, so that will be located um, generally at the top somewhere in the wing. Cessnas, for example, the overflow valve is sticks up into the tank, so it's just at the top, but it comes out through the bottom of the wing there. And the Robin fuel overflow is, I think it's out the bottom, um, off to the side. But basically, if you fill it up with cold fuel on a cold day and then leave it in the sun, it will expand. As you do that, the fuel is going to start leaking. Instead of your wings or fuel tank exploding, it just starts dribbling fuel everywhere, which is all right. You'll generally have a fuel, most aircraft don't have one tank, most aircraft have more than one tank gas. Robins are kind of rare in the fact that they only have one fuel tank. So there's normally a fuel selector valve. Okay? Now that will normally have left or right, or left one, left two, right one, right two, or cross feed, or whatever, it depends on the aircraft setup. Again, all that information's in the flight manual for how to use it best. If you have a both option, so let's say you've got a left and a right tank, Sometimes there's a both option to drain from both at the same time. That's sort of your go-to setting because it allows everything to sort of stay equal. If you're in an aircraft that doesn't have equal fuel tanks, you normally have a timer for about half an hour, change the tanks. Half an hour, change the tanks. Half an hour, change the tanks. Don't forget, otherwise you run out of fuel on one tank and have heaps of fuel on the other, but the engine will still stop. Cool? All right. Supply line, so carries fuel from the tanks to the car. Okay. Somewhere along that way there'll be a strainer, so normally it's like a mesh filter um, that collects any big impurities that are in the fuel basically. So things like, um, I don't know, bugs or, or metal or whatever, chunks of anything will be picked up by that. Yeah. Generally it's also the lowest point in the fuel system and there's a drainer associated with it. So you can drain out or strain out anything that's been caught in that mesh filter. Um, fuel primer. So some aircraft have primers themselves which inject fuel directly into the um, either the cylinder head or the inlet manifold and it doesn't go through the carburetor. Now some aircraft don't have primers but they may have an accelerator pump. So for example, a Robin has an accelerator pump. That's why we pump the throttle to prime the engine. Because all you're doing is you're using the accelerator pump and the carburetor to squirt fuel into the inlet manifold. Um, on a cold day, you'll use a primer if your aircraft has it, three or four primes depending on the engine, and that'll help the engine get started. Make sure if you do have a primer, you lock it. Okay? If a primer comes out on flight, what's going to happen? <laughs> extra fuel is going to be put in there. Lots of extra fuel. So what's going to happen there? Too rich to make fuel. So the engine will start uh, running quite rough. It'll stop. The primer puts in enough fuel to stop it. So if that if that's open as well, it's creating a direct line that's bypassing whatever the fuel. Um, intake is, so then it's just going to suck heaps of fuel through the primer system and the engine will stop. Really important to make sure if you do have a primer it's locked. Okay. Alright, um, generally, well pretty much always there is an engine driven fuel pump, so always in low wing aircraft there's always an engine driven fuel pump. Now what that does is it provides fuel pressure, so it allows the fuel to be pumped to wherever it needs to go. Um, you have to have it for those that have fuel tanks below the car, so low wing aircraft. High wing aircraft can have gravity fed fuel tanks. For example, a Cessna has a gravity fed system. There's no mechanical pump. There is normally an electric pump as a redundancy system and as a priming pump. Robins have a boost pump, okay? So um, a boost pump can be used, sometimes it can be used for priming and clearing vapor locks, other times it can be used just to boost fuel pressure because sometimes it may have a low, it may be at certain settings it's got low fuel pressures so you need to pump on. Uh, the other thing is, is it provides redundancy. So in low wing aircraft you want redundancy because if the mechanical fuel pump grabs itself after takeoff, what happens? 
No fuel. No fuel. So the engine stops, which just after takeoff is good or bad? Well, any bad. time really. Very bad. Very bad, right? So we have a boost pump or something that we can use to um, ensure that if one of these pumps fails, we have redundancy, but we don't leave it on all the time. Okay, fuel quantity indicators. Generally, they're electrical. They're all shit. They all are terrible. Never rely on fuel indicators in aircraft unless you absolutely have to. Okay, um, they're normally very, very inaccurate. Best way of finding out how much fuel you have is dip the tank. So use a calibrated dipstick and dip the tank. Don't use a dipstick from another aircraft because it won't be calibrated to that aircraft, so it won't give you the right amount of fuel, which is basically about as good as looking at the fuel gauge, which will be doing this normally, because that's what the electrical ones do. Um, there are a few different types of fuel gauges. The really good ones are called capacitance probes. Basically, they're probes that run down the side of the fuel tanks, and it measures the voltage difference between it, so especially in unusual tanks, you can calibrate them to be really, really accurate. If you have those, sweet. If you have one of those crappy needles that always wanders from full to empty every time it's sort of half full or whatever it might be, probably don't use it because half the flight it's full and the other half the flight it's empty, so you want to be a bit careful. Happy with that? Dip the tanks each time. All right, fuel grades available. So what, what fuel do we have now? What fuel do we use in planes? Okay. Yep, what sort? You guys haven't done much flying, so you don't know. Abby, you should know. What colour is the fuel? Blue. So, what fuel do we use? Yeah. What's the LL? No one knows. Okay, so we used to use 100 over 130, which was green coloured. Um, so, it is still 100 octane but it had a performance rating of 130. So what that meant is the tetraether lead, which is the lead that's in the fuel, could boost the octane, so it behaved like 130 octane fuel, right? But this stuff has lots and lots of lead in it, very, very toxic, not very good for you. So now we're on 100 lower leaded, which has slightly less lead in it. It's still basically just as bad, um, but it's got slightly less of the tetraether lead. So that lead is an octane booster, and that's why it's in fuel. And that's why it used to be in low gas, because they could get away with using significantly lower grades of fuel and putting this lead in it, which would effectively boost the octane rating. That's why previously, um, you know, I'm sure you've heard your parents say, don't leave fuel in your car or fuel goes bad in your car, because this old fuel was such a low grade of fuel, being like 80 octane, that if you left it in your car, it would just go off because it all, the only thing that gave it the performance that it has now was that lead. But it still meant the fuel would go off because it's really volatile. Whereas now it's actually 91 octane or 98 octane or whatever you use. Right? Make sense? Cool. So we use 100 lower leaded now. That's the common one. The color is blue, okay? You could also use 100 over 130. Again, there's none in New Zealand, but if you went overseas, it's still, it's still a fairly common one to have. Um, the colour of that is green. There's also 115 over 145, which is purple. Now, all of these um, fuels are dyed so that you can identify them. Okay, so air gas is blue, green you can get away with, purple you probably don't want to put it unless it's approved in your climate. Is that the same <coughs> in uh, other countries? Yeah. Are they all? So those are, those are IKO colours. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's the actual colour of the fuel. That's what, so all fuel, when, it gets, when it gets produced as 100 lower leaded, it gets dyed when it's oh, produced. Okay. Um, so it's not like MoGas, for example, which gets dyed when it comes into the country. Um, it gets dyed when it's made because aviation stuff all has to be traced. Okay. Cool. MoGas, so motor gasoline, so we've got 91, generally purple, 95, 96, and 98. It's normally yellow. Okay. Um, Quite commonly, you'll see MoGas being used in uh, microlights. So Rotax engines, for example, they run on MoGas. You can run them on Avgas, but the maintenance times get shorter because Avgas is running at a slightly higher octane, so it's getting a slightly it's abusing the engine a little bit more. Whereas 
our engines are made for that higher um, power or higher power power stroke, but they can't handle the volatility of the MoGas. So again, don't put MoGas in a normal Avgas aircraft. Generally, you want to avoid putting Avgas in a MoGas aircraft as well. You can though, right? right. But again, consult your flight manual if you have any doubts. Generally, you want to use the highest octane available. So if it's purple, don't put it in your microlight, it'll blow up. Um, Avgas, so it's got really high quality control um, over MoGas. It does contain lead, which is an octane booster. Okay, so it'll have a higher octane just off the bat, straight away, it's 100 octane. Um, and it may also have a performance rating. So the performance rating is that 100 over 130. The 130 is the performance rating. So it behaves like 130 octane fuel. Cool. It's less volatile, so it doesn't want to explode as much, which is good. Um, other fuel gas. So don't use more gas in avgas powered aircraft because it's not subject to the same quality control. Right? It's not vetted, so you could in theory get anything, even though you think you're buying 98 octane, you could get whatever you want, if someone's been bad. Um, it is more vol volatile, it is more prone to vapour lock, generally can cause lower power output, cause more fouling, greater risk of detonation as well. Okay? Don't use more gas in the aircraft engine unless it specifically says you can do it. Okay? Avtur. Or Jet A1. What sort of fuel is Jet A1? Kerosene, diesel. Diesel. What happens when you put diesel in a petrol car? It don't work. It don't work. So what happens when you put Jet A1 in an Avgas plane? It definitely don't work. It don't work. But if there's enough fuel in the system, it might work long enough to get you in the air, <laughs> which is a big problem. <laughs> so be very, very careful. Do not ever put jet fuel into an air gas powered aircraft. Vice versa, I mean actually I think, yeah, no, don't do it vice versa either. It does work a little bit better. My old, um, one of the guys who used to work for me at the yacht club I used to work at, took um, my work van and he, it was, a, it was a diesel van and he put petrol in it and he managed to drive it for 80 k's before it died. I was very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was done though. It was, they wrote it off. <laughs> but, yeah, apparently there was this big black plume of smoke out of that one. <laughs> anyway, don't put it in blades. All right, fuel contaminants. Actually, you, you guys tell me what some fuel contaminants are. Rust. Rust? I sure hope not in your aircraft, but it could be. Yep. Water. Water? Where does that come from? Someone's like having a drink while they're refueling and accidentally spills their water bottle into the tank. Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Where else could it come from? Ice. Ice? And the fuel tanks? Oh, no. I think it could do. If you had ice on the wings and it melted and dripped in through the fuel vent, then, yep, yeah, sure. How else? Where are most fuel tanks located? in terms of what you refuel from, like when you go to the pumps. In the ground. Yeah. Where does water go when it rains? So sometimes there can be quite a lot of fuel in those, mm. water in those tanks, so when you put the fuel in your tank, it could be water just coming from the, from the tanks underground. Where else? What happens on a, on a nice cold morning? Do you get... Condensation. Condensation, right? So if you have a... Uh, a fuel tank that's maybe a quarter full and you leave the aircraft outside when it, everything condenses you get condensation on the inside of the fuel tank right because there's water vapor inside the air so then when that condenses it gets on the side and then it drips down and runs into the fuel so that's why if you're leaving the aircraft outside you always want to leave them in the full tank so there's very little room for that water or water vapor in the air to condense cool what other contaminants are there Bugs or potentially? Bugs, yeah. Paint, flakes of paint. Um, if you have bladders in the wings, for example, if you get rubber, chunks of rubber, when they break down, because fuel will eat rubber. So if fuel is in a rubber tank, it will slowly eat away the tank. So you may get 
things. In theory, it should be coded nicely, but theory doesn't always equal practicality. Um, yeah, all sorts of reasons. Most common one is water. Okay. So water will look like. Do we got any water in it? Maybe. Um, I'm assuming that little thing down the bottom there is water, not the bottom of the tube. But water basically, it, it sits at the bottom of a drain of fuel. It normally look if there's not heaps of it, it looks like little bubbles. You know those like lava lamp kind of things? It's like that, except water. Um, that's what it looks like. So it can leak into ground tanks, um, unsealed fuel caps when it's sitting out overnight and it's raining, condensation if you leave your tanks empty and it's out over water. So just be really, really careful. Make sure you always drain your fuel. Um, for example, I took on a South Island trip a couple of years ago, I took the twin down and we filled up in, where was it? It was one. was it Wanaka? Kaikoura. Maybe it was Kaikoura. Filled up there and I went to drain the fuel after, like, it, it, well, I pre flighted earlier on in the day, drained the fuel, it was fine, and then fueled up and I had to take three whole test tubes of water out of it. Because right. of just water in the ground tank. Also, when you've got the nozzles sitting on the pumps, if it's been raining, it just drips into the nozzle. So I make, like, when I take the hose off, I tip anything that's out of the, sitting at the nozzle out, because uh, that's normally just water. And um, if you're paying a wet rate for the aircraft, you're not trying to save every little ounce. It's not like when you fill up your car and you hold the hose up <laughs> trying to get that last drop of fuel. I did that the other day when I saw that diesel was at $1.70. <laughs> Holy Jesus. Need to ask for a raise just for fuel. How long do you need to wait to, to drain out? Um, how long does it, you need to wait for water to sink? Generally not that long, but I'd leave it as long as possible. Oh, okay. um, you know, if you're refueling, then you've got to go quickly, walk around, give the wings a bit of a wiggle, and it will help it slide down oh. and drain it. Um, again, most of the time it's pretty good, but if you did that and then you got some, and you did it again, you got some, you did it again, you got some, I'd give it like 10 minutes, and then do it again, try and get rid of all the water, and if you can't, then that's, uh, that's it. And that'd be part of your pre-flight check. So if yeah. you've got water there, so any time you you're pre flight and come back, well, if you've got water and you can do, you know, you see a little bit of water and maybe it fills up a quarter of the tube, tip it out, get another bit, you get a few bobbles, tip it out, get another bit, and there's nothing, then you've probably just got rid of all the water because it does sit at the lowest point in the tank. But just be careful with it. Um, but yeah, any time you're pre-flighting, so first flight you're doing, or after any time you refuel, always pre-flight. Always drain the fuel. Um, example of when we filled up in Kaikoura. It was fine before, refueled. If I hadn't done that, then all that fuel might have gone through the engine. You know, double engine failure, that would have been fun. <laughs> um, so, fuel storage, generally it's all just in underground tanks, but sometimes you can get drums of air gas. Um, really important, they're completely filled and then stored on their side, so you can't get any leakage coming in. Okay. Filter any fuel, um, from drums through a chamois, okay? This is still in the uh, syllabus, so we have to talk about this, even though you will probably never do this. Um, but if you're doing ag flying or strip flying or something like this, you may end up refueling through a, um, from a drum, so just be careful. Chamois are generally not the, uh, not the best way, because they do build up a whole heap of static electricity, but never pour straight from a drum into an aircraft. Always make sure you filter it somewhere. Plastic containers only use ones that have been approved as fuel storage devices. For example, your red jerry can that carries petrol, that's a good fuel storage advice. Your mum's three day old milk bottle, not a good fuel storage device. Right? So make sure you're using the appropriate ones. Um, generally, the colour coding is red is Avgas and yellow is jet fuel. So it's like petrol and diesel, it's the same, same thing. Um, but yeah, don't use blue. Alright, how do you check fuel? So you drain a small quantity from each fuel strainer drain valve. So every single one, drain a little bit. Water, that'll generally collect as either a layer on the bottom or small little blobs. Sediment can collect um, at the bottom if it sits for a while. Normally you'll just see it swirling around. If in doubt, just wait and it'll settle on the bottom. Smell the drainer, drain the drainer fluid. Smell the drained fluid. Okay, because it may not be fuel, it could be water. 
Remember, some of these test tubes also seem to be tinted slightly blue. So you can look at it and go, oh yeah, that's blue and there's nothing in it. It's cool that it could all be water, which is bad, obviously. Okay. If you don't have any contaminants, dispose of the drain fuel. Some people pour it back into the aircraft. Personally, I don't do that um, because you're paying the wet rate for fuel, so there's no point. Um, but yeah, in theory, if the fuel's all clear, you could put it back into the aircraft, but I, I, I would not do that because you don't know what could be on the outside of the test tube or whatever it is. Um, if there's contaminants, dispose of the fuel again. Don't put it back into the aircraft. Definitely, if there's stuff in it, and then repeat. If it's still there after a couple of drains, come see an instructor, give an instructor a call, call an engineer, have a chat. Okay? Check the fuel prior to the first flight of the day. Okay, so when you're pre-flighting, um, after each refuel and any time you think you may have contamination. So let's say you pre-flight it in the morning um, and you left here at like four o'clock in the morning to go to Whangarei for breakfast. And you left the aircraft hunger A, you got back, and it was kind of dewy when you got there, and now the whole aircraft's condensed over on the outside because of the, the dew in the morning. I don't know how you landed in the fog, but anyway, it's a hypothetical, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and then you come back to fly back, you may have water in the tank, so be a good idea to drain in. Just be careful of that. When you're refueling and there's condensation or rain on the wing, just be very careful when you open the fuel tanks because the amount of times I see people open the fuel cap and then tip the fuel cap up like this, and then all the water that was sitting on the fuel cap now just drips straight into the tank. So be quite cautious of that. For anything that's got um, caps on the top of the wing. Happy? How do we refuel? Someone talk me through refueling. Do you guys all have driver's license? You don't? No. Oh. Okay, maybe I'll talk you through refueling then. <laughs> All right, so to start with, make sure you have the correct type and grade, right? So, Jet A1 is black. If you see black on the handle or on the pump, you've got it wrong, right? So go find a red handle, red pump, make sure it's Avgas 100, okay? Make sure the aircraft's as far away from buildings and other aircraft as possible. Really, just put it on the apron next to the fuel pumps. If there's um, helicopters there or something like that, just bear in mind that when they start up, their swirling death blades are going to start spinning, so just be cautious of that. Make sure the engine's off, the ignition's off, no smoking around the pumps, no cell phones around the pumps, it's the same. Don't refuel with the passengers on board, it's illegal, okay? You cannot refuel with passengers on board. You need to earth the aircraft, so using the static line, okay, what that does is it keeps the pump and the aircraft at the same static charge because you're effectively putting lots of fuel through a nice big hose, it's gonna build up static electricity. If you get too much static electricity, what happens? Not. You get a spark, and a spark near fuel is bad. Yeah, or boom, yeah. <laughs> Don't refuel in an electrical storm. Yep, <laughs> cool, <laughs> yep. <laughs> like thunder and lightning, oh, very, very frightening. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but yeah, so if there's thunder, stop refueling. Make sure you know where the closest fire extinguisher is. Normally it's right next to the pumps. Park brake off so you can move if there's a fire. Some places say set the park, the, no, <laughs> set the park brake, <laughs> okay? Um, it depends on where you're at and what the procedure is. Follow the procedures detailed by AirBP or AZ or whoever it is, okay? Don't put any pressure on the intake neck, so when you stick the fuel nozzle in the fuel intake neck, don't just let it there rest, because what happens is you'll slowly crack the intake neck, and then that bit of metal will go into the fuel tank, and then the engine will stop, and it'll be bad. So be nice to it. Make sure you're holding on to it. Make sure you take all precautions against fuel contamination, so tip out the water that's in the end of the nozzle. Don't refuel in the rain. If you are refueling in the rain, get a hat, get a tea towel, get something, wrap it around the fuel nozzle, so that you're not getting water into the fuel tanks or just as a private pilot just avoid refueling in the rain really there's no reason why you have to refuel in the rain if you're a private pilot um, once you complete replace the fuel caps okay if you do not replace the fuel caps on a high wing aircraft or any wing aircraft where the fuel caps are on top what happens talk to me about a venturi and how that works there's a we just talked about this and this is 
All right, so we have the venturi, which kind of looks like a wing, right? And then we have airflow that comes over it. So it's dynamic pressure increases and the static pressure is now really, really low. Then we open our fuel tank and all this fuel is at a relatively high pressure. Tell me what happens right now. Yes. Whee! Right? What happens about five minutes after that? Engine. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. And it will come out stupid quick. Like... If you have half a tank of gas in 172 and you do one circuit, you'll probably not have very much left after that. It comes out really fast. So always, if you're on a high wing, uh, not a high wing, if you're on an aircraft where the wings, the caps are on top of the wing, make sure they're closed. Because normally, high wings are the worst because you can't see them. Because you're sitting in the plane and you can't see the wing caps. If you're sitting in a low wing aircraft, you can look out onto the wing and see them. All right? If in doubt, just check it again and check it again. The amount of times you'll get out of a plane and go, did I take the chocks out or did I put the fuel caps back in? Even though you've done it every single time, which is nuts. Okay. Um, cool. Remove the static line. Don't start up with the static line on. If you do, you'll chop it up. I don't have one for you here, but uh, it, it will be bad. Right? Someone did it the other day. It's not good. Yeah. You can rip exhaust pipes off and it's, it's not good the prop catches the static line which is normally clipped onto the exhaust pipe and if it goes the wrong way it puts some tension on it. It's also aside from the fact that you've now got this big like lanyard with a nice bit of metal swinging really quickly oh, around the prop, yeah. um, it's bad. Yeah. So take the static line off. Personally if there's, a, if there's an option of colour, because normally the static lines are coloured, pick the orange one because it's the easiest one to see. And then when you start up, look out the window and go, is there any orange? No orange. Okay, we're good. Right? Sometimes the blue ones can actually be quite hard to see on concrete. So I don't use those. If you have an option, if you don't have an option, you just have to be careful. Complete the refueling documentation. So once you start flying your own aircraft and that sort of thing, um, or someone else's aircraft for that matter, that's not the club, you want to make sure you keep a record of how much fuel you put in and that sort of thing. Um, or if you're flying flying someone else's plane using your own fuel card or whatever it may be. Just make sure you're keeping tabs on what's going on there. Cool. How do you dip the tanks? So tank dipping provides a nice accurate fuel contents, right? So it tells us exactly how much fuel is in the tank, which is good. Not an electric gauge going like a wheel of fortune. You've either got five minutes or two hours. Take your pick. Uh, only use the dipstick for that specific aircraft, and that doesn't even mean specific type. You can't take a 172 dipstick from one 172 to another. You can't take a Robin from Tankerzilla Kilo to Tankerzilla Kilo. They're different. Right? Even if they're not different, they are different. Because you don't know what maintenance has been done to that specific aircraft. The tank could have been moved slightly. It could have had repairs underneath the tank, so the tank sits higher. Any number of reasons. Never only use the dipstick for that specific aircraft. Okay? Can you identify the dipstick in that picture? His hands, right there. Yeah. What he's holding. Yes, what he's holding. No, not, <laughs> not the person. It's nice. Uh, so yeah, that is a dipstick. We stopped using these because people kept dropping them in the fuel tanks. Um, which is obviously not good. <laughs> so we now have big ones that you can't drop in the fuel tanks. So, But if you're flying another aircraft and you have dipsticks that you could drop in the fuel tanks, don't drop them in the fuel tanks. Please. Cool. Sorry. Um, yeah, because some of them, for example, the Technam, it's, that one's really easy to drop in the fuel tank because the hole's like this and the dipstick's tiny. Yes, All right, fuel management tips, fun facts. Okay, so one, make sure your aircraft is refueled with avgas if it's an avgas aircraft, jet fuel if it's a jet fuel aircraft. Make sure it's uncontaminated. Make sure you have enough fuel available for your flight. Sounds real simple, but trust me, people forget about this. They get in a hurry and they go, oh, I'm gonna go for a quick scenic. Jump in, do a quick scenic, and then someone convinces them, hey, let's go to Pawanui for lunch. Okay, cool, let's go to Pawanui. Get to Pawanui, realize there's no fuel, go, ah, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just head back and get some on the way, and then they head back and go, actually, no, we'll just go straight back and run out of fuel. It happens a lot. So make sure you have enough fuel available. Right? Carry out your fuel drains, make sure there's no leaks, the fuel caps are on, the vent's clear. Know the aircraft's flight manual, so know how much fuel you actually use, right? 
There's no point planning a uh, flight at 20 litres an hour if you use 60, because you're still not going to have enough fuel. Don't change tanks unnecessarily before takeoff and landing. So if you're in an aircraft that has multiple tanks, whatever you pick for the run-up is what you take off on. Okay? So if you run up on the left tank, you take off on the left tank. Because normally through doing the run-up in the taxi, you will have cycled enough fuel through to be pretty close to using the whole thing. If you change it to the right tank and the right tank doesn't work, there's going to be enough fuel in the system just before takeoff to let you take off. And then it may stop, which is bad. All right? So make sure if, if you're doing a run up on a tank, stay on that tank for the run up, uh, for the takeoff. Cool. So generally, what most people do is they start on the right tank, make sure that works. When they go to the run up, switch to the left tank. The left and right are true, but you can pick whatever one you want, and then stay on the tank until you take off. Fuel pumps, use them for takeoff. Some aircraft you don't use them because they're too powerful. They're sort of they'll just overpressure everything and it's, it's unnecessary wear and tear. The pumps aren't made for continuous use unless it's an emergency. So if you do it all the time you end up wearing them down. Example 172s, the pumps are used for prop the fuel injected 172s they're used for priming. But if you ran out of fuel pressure for whatever reason, you could turn it on and leave it on and come back and land and it'll be fine. But just know where they are. Make sure the tank that's being switched to contains fuel. That also happens a lot, especially if you're flying complex aircraft. Well, not even that complex aircraft. One of the, um, did you see Vax, the aircraft with the fabric wings in the hangar? Oh no, it's not in the hangar, I took it down to Ardmore. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry about that, that's a, that's a false up. Anyway, that aircraft that you haven't seen <laughs> has four different fuel tanks and it's quite easy to swap between them. Two of the tanks are very, very small. They've only got about 50 minutes of fuel in each tank. So it's quite easy if you get it wrong, let's say you burn off the left wing tank, which is about 45 minutes of fuel. Um, so you burn that off, you use 45 minutes of fuel, and then you change to the center tank, then you went, oh, I need to go back to the wing tank and change back to the left tank, thinking you were actually changing to the right tank, but you just had a, a brain mix up suddenly you're going to run out of fuel very, very quickly, right? So be cautious of that. Fuel management, the most important thing in flying. You always need to know how much fuel you have, regardless of whether you're doing a 10 minute circuit flight or a three hour cross country. You always need to know how much fuel you have. That's literally the most important thing. Because the number one reason why people have forced landings in New Zealand is they run out of fuel. Which is stupid, right? because everything we tell you to plan with, you always use conservative numbers for planning. So let's say Robin actually burns 22 to 27 litres an hour on the cruise. Right? So worst case is 27 litres, we plan with 30. So then if there's a leak or there's using a little bit of fuel more than normal, you've still got buffer. Right? If your aircraft uses 50 litres or 38 litres on the cruise, for example, VAX, plan with 50 or plan with 45. Always give yourself buffer. Flying is all about buffer. You do that, stay safe. You don't do that, you run out of fuel, end up gliding somewhere and annoying my farmer, if you're lucky. Otherwise, that will be your last flight, which isn't so. So just be careful with it, right? Fuel is so important. All right, so we talked about fuel systems. So there's a tank, there's a drain, there's a sump, right? And then you've got the standpipe or the supply line, which is just above that, sometimes right next to it. And, and then that goes through, sometimes a strainer, fuel selector valve, fuel shutoff valve, to the carb or the uh, fuel control unit if it's fuel injected. Fuel types, what are the two types? Or three types? Uh, gas. Yep. Um, no gas? Or yep. And jet fuel? Yep. Jet A1. Jet fuel, jet A1, AVTUR. So AVTUR is, I think, the, the technical name now, but the jet A1, AVTUR, jet fuel, it's the same thing. Um, what is, actually, just out of curiosity, what does jet fuel look like? What's the colour of jet fuel? Because that's quite important, right? Jet fuel, purple. Hmm? Is it purple? Nope. Yellow. Kind of. It's a straw colour, right? So, it smell. It smells very distinctive, but it's a straw colour. Now, the thing with jet fuel is it can mix in quite well with air gas, 
it won't separate. So when you drain it, you probably in the draining where it swirls around, you probably won't see a difference, which is really dangerous, right? Because if someone's just put 20 litres of jet fuel in your tank, that's going to cause some exciting issues. So really, the only way you can, one way to test for jet fuel, if you suspect it, is get a paper towel or, a, or like an oil tissue or something like that, and just pour some fuel on it. Avgas, when it evaporates, will evaporate dry. Like when you get your hands, it's dry. If you've ever driven a diesel car and you get diesel on your hands, it's oily. Same thing with jet fuel. Jet fuel will leave like an oily residue on the on the um, on that cloth or paper towel or whatever it is you just poured the fuel on. So if you see that, be very very cautious. Only if you suspect someone may have put jet fuel in your aircraft, but it's just a, a trick of the trade for later on. So it's something to keep in mind. That's not in the syllabus, but you know, useful to know. All right, when do we when do we check for fuel contaminants? Pre-flight inspection. Pre-flight, when else? After fuel, fueling. Yep, when else? Think of my terrible analogy to Fungaray. What the fuck? <laughs> First flight of that? Nope, we've already done our pre-flight, but we got up to Fungaray and then we came back and the aircraft was covered in condensation. After landing? Nope. <laughs> so what if you landed in the desert and it was lovely and dry? Probably would suspect any contamination would be maybe in the desert, there'd be sand, but still. I just gave you the answer. Anytime you suspect contamination, right? Anything you think, anytime you think that there may be something in the fuel. Cool. Um, what is the type of avgas we have in New Zealand and what colour is it? 100. Uh, um, uh, yep. What about the other type that's quite common? Uh, 100 over 130. What colour is it? Blue. Uh, green. Yep. So 100 over 130 is green, 100 LL is blue. Jet fuel is straw. Sure. Most mo gas is yellow. Ninety one is purple. Jet fuel. Cool. Fuel checks. So how do we check how much fuel we have? Dipstick. What if we don't have a dipstick? <laughs> That's never the right answer to anything. <laughs> Fuel gauges, but they're not overly yeah, accurate. Yeah, fuel gauges, but be very cautious. Right? Always take the most conservative number <laughs> from the fuel gauge. Cool. All right, now we're going to wait for half an hour for the next one to load. <laughs> oh, that was quick. <laughs> All right, let's. Uh, I need to. Engine lubrication by means of oil is primarily used to reduce friction between moving parts and dissipate heat. In this animation, we want to describe wet sump lubrication using a four-stroke engine with only one cylinder. sump in which the oil can be found. The oil pump is responsible for pumping the oil through oil galleries. When the oil has become very hot after several cycles, it is cooled by an oil cooler. The oil is then pumped to the oil filter. Inside the oil filter is a filter that catches the particles in the oil and does not allow them to pass through to the engine. The oil flows from the outside into the oil filter 
then runs through the filter, which is made invisible here, and flows through the center tube. Then, the oil flows upwards. The oil flows to the engine where it is used to lubricate the crankshaft bearings. In four-stroke engines, Crankshaft bearings are almost always plain bearings. Unlike roller bearings, which use roller elements to move the inner and outer ring against each other, plain bearings use oil to form a lubricating film. The lubricating film is created by the two contact surfaces that move. Crankshaft has oil galleries so that the connecting rod bearing can be supplied with oil. In diesel engines, the connecting rod can also have an oil gallery to use the oil for cooling and lubricating the piston and the piston pin. For gasoline engines, on the other hand, the oil, which splashes out of the sides of the bearing, is used to cool and lubricate the piston, pin, and cylinder. Holes can also help to transport the oil to the desired parts and spots. The piston has one or two compression rings and one oil scraper ring. The oil scraper ring is responsible for controlling the oil balance at the piston and the compression rings. Excess oil flows inwards through holes especially when the piston is running down. Then, the oil can drain down from the piston into the oil sump. Furthermore, the oil is pumped to the camshaft bearings, rocker arms, and valves in order to reduce friction and heat. Here, the oil flows into the oil sump via oil galleries. Mate. Very motivational music. <laughs> Makes you want to go and do something. All right. So what we'll go through is oil, why we have oil, you should know that from that video now. Um, what viscosity is, the oil system, okay? grades of oil, operational considerations, and how that helps with engine cooling. So what is the point of oil? To cool and lubricate. Yep. Anything else? Clean. clean. Right, cool, lubricate, clean. So those are the three main things. So it lubricates parts, it allows smooth movement, um, reduces what we call mechanical shock. Okay, so mechanical shock is uh, when you have a metal on metal uh, rubbing force. So if you have, you know, for example, these, this cylinder here has piston rings on it and an oil scraper ring down the bottom. If we sat here and just ran against that, it makes an awful noise. Lots of drag, lots of friction, it's going to cause lots of heat, it's going to heat up very, very quickly. But also, what's it going to do to these rings? Wear them down. It's going to wear them down heaps, right? So you've got to be quite careful. So, oil helps us reduce that mechanical shock. It also reduces friction between motoring parts, which then lowers temperature, which then reduces mechanical shock. Okay? Provides a um, seal between the cylinder walls and the pistons. So the oil sits up against the bottom of these rings here, okay, and it creates a seal so that when the engine's moving, or when the engine's moving, when the
when this piston is moving up and down, it's sealing the edge here. So now that there's no, the when it compresses, gas doesn't come down the side here, right? So it wants to keep all of that gas in there so you get good compression. That's why when you're testing if an engine's good and the cylinder rings are all good, they do compression tests. Because what that effectively is doing is measuring how much gas can leak out through these cylinder rings. That's all the compression test is. Right? So if it leaks out lots, bad compression, means as you compress that gas, you're not actually compressing that much because it's all coming down the side. Right? So that's something to keep in mind. But assist in engine cooling because it's a, um, it's a fluid, it's moving around the engine, it's transferring heat from one part of the engine back around the other. And also, it removes contaminants, so it gets rid of those nasty bits of metal that are floating around. Okay. Viscosity, so viscosity is a term to describe how thick oil is. Okay. So high viscosity is thick, so thick honey, treacle, that sort of thing. That's a very, that's a high, vis, high viscosity or a very viscous substance. Right. So, a low viscosity would be very runny, so think um, water or, um, I don't know, water, that's a good one, right, that'll be. Okay, now it's important that oil maintains the correct viscosity for its purpose, okay. If it's too thick, it's not going to be able to travel as easily, the pressure is going to get really, really high, right, and it's not going to be able to lubricate effectively because the oil is too thick and it can't get into all the nooks and crannies in a quick fashion. If it's too, if it's not viscous enough though, what's going to happen there? It's not going to grab anything. It's not going to grab anything. Um, it's going to be, it's going to just sort of fire around. It's not going to be able to pick up that much stuff. It's not going to be able to retain that, um, be able to help cool down the engine as well. So we want to make sure it's got the correct viscosity. Now, what temperature does is it reduces the viscosity. So if you, um, for example, when you start an engine up, first out of the day on a cold morning, if you look at the oil pressure, it gets quite high, right? Even though you're at a very low RPM. And that's because that oil's cold, so it's really viscous. So when that oil pump starts pumping it around, it's got a really high pressure, right? As the engine runs up, you'll see the oil pressure comes back into the green range. Then you increase the power for takeoff, you see the oil pressure comes back up again, because it still has to heat back up before it comes back to the green range. Right? So it needs to maintain the right viscosity. So if you're operating in a really cold environment, you're going to need a lower um, viscosity oil or a runnier oil because it's not going to get as hot. So it's not going to it's not going to be able to run around as much. It needs less heat. If you're in a hot environment, you want a really, really viscous oil, something that's really, really thick, because even just sitting on the tarmac, maybe you're in Aussie or something and it's 40 degrees that oil is already going to lose a lot of its viscosity just by before the engine's even going. Okay. What we use is we generally use multi-grade oils. So multi-grade oils maintain their viscosity over a huge temperature, um, which is good because when you're operating an aircraft, what's the temperature down at sea level today? Have a guess. 13. Uh-huh, yeah. 15 degrees, 16 degrees, that's probably more. Summer, 18, 19 degrees, and then up at 10,000 feet, it might be minus one or two. And in a day, we could do four lots of up and down between minus two degrees and 18 degrees. So we want to make sure we've got a temper uh, oil that can handle that. Right? Especially if you're operating in environments like, um, you know, like polar environments, so things like Alaska or down in Antarctica or North Canada or North China or anywhere like that. It gets, can get really, really hot over a, quite a short horizontal distance. So you can go from, if you're doing a cross-country flight, you fly somewhere it's minus 20, you fly somewhere else and it's 7 or 8 degrees on the ground, right? Or more. So you've got to be quite cautious of that. And that's just on the ground before you get up at altitude. Um, so we use multi-grade oils to give us sort of better wiggle room, I guess. So how the oil system works, we saw that little video. So we have the sump that collects that distributed oil. So the wet sump, that's what we saw before, is just a low point on the bottom of the engine. So when you have your engine block, if we looked at it side on, we have our engine with our cylinders, and then you'll see, just like in a car engine, there'll be something that folds down to the bottom. That is your oil sump. So in here sits all the oil, right? It's always on a low point on the engine. 
because if it was on a high point, it wouldn't work. Uh, now, a dry sump will have a scavenger pump in here that will then take it to a reservoir and then it will go from there. A wet sump, it will just stay there and it will just be used directly from the sump. It won't go into a, um, into a separate reservoir. The reason why there's a separate reservoir is, you know how I said on the low point, what happens if you're upside down? The low point's now the high point. So now your oil's not going to the right spot, you're gonna run out of oil, you're gonna overheat the engine. Or all the oil's gonna come out. Like in the 2160s, it says do not fly inverted for more than 30 seconds. Because if you do, you won't be able to see much out the windscreen because it's covered in oil. Right? Because it doesn't have a dry sump. Most high performance aerobatic aircraft have dry sumps for that reason. So that they can fly upside down for as long as they want and they've still got oil flowing through the system. Cool, oil pump, engine driven, it moves oil, right? It gives us pressure to the oil system, it allows to push oil through the galleries, which are the little veins, I guess, in the engine, okay? So in this case, this is a, uh, this is still a, uh, this is a dry sump, so we've got the scavenger pump down there, through the oil cooler up to a tank, okay? It goes through the filter into another oil pump, which will have a pressure relief valve, okay? So if the pressure is too high, it'll bypass the oil pump, or the oil pump will, um, depending on how it's set up, will basically just circulate this to reduce the pressure, and then it gets sprayed all nicely onto the onto the cylinders. Yeah, look at all that cooling action. Nice, awesome. We okay. Oil pressure relief valve. So that's normally inside the oil pump. Opens up when the pressure is too high and then it brings oil back to before the pump. Okay. So it's a bypass, basically. So it stops the oil pressure getting too high. If you have a faulty oil pressure relief valve, you can get some very high oil pressures, which can cause some very interesting things. Okay. Oil pressure gauge, normally just after the pump. Okay. So that means that if the um, pressure relief valve is working, you shouldn't see a high pressure. Yeah. So oil pressure relief valve and our gauge sitting just after that. Oil filters, so they get out all the impurities. Swarf, which is a small metal, so if you're running in an engine, for example, these cylinder rings, see how these ones are all really nicely polished? Right. Even though this piston is absolutely rooted. They're really nicely polished. Uh -huh. That's because when they've been run in, as they've been sliding up and down the, um, the cylinder wall, they've polished themselves out. And that's what running an engine is. It is. If you don't run an engine incorrectly, you can get gouges in here from running it in a too low a power setting, so it just kind of sands it. That's why you want to operate at a high power setting because it really pushes past and sands it nice and down fine. If you operate at low power settings for extended periods of time, there's not really enough force and it just kind of slowly creates little divots in these rings and on the cylinder walls, and then you get bad compression and bad engine, and it's very, very expensive. Because Aviation is expensive, so if you run in an engine, make sure you do it right, otherwise you have to buy a new engine again, after you've just bought a brand new engine. Um, oil filters, they're checked regularly, they normally change every 50 to 100 hours. Um, there's also an oil filter bypass, which if the filter gets clogged for whatever reason, it allows the engine to keep running for a little bit longer. But if that, uh, if that bypass is going, all the stuff that's been clogging the filter, if it's still in the system, it's going to go through all the cylinders and it's going to be not very nice. Oil cooler provides extra cooling. It's got a thermal valve on it, so it's not going to start cooling the oil until the oil's got up to temperature. Because remember, the oil's made to operate at a certain, inside a certain operating range, inside a certain temperature. If it starts cooling it down oil early, it's not going to have the right viscosity to do the correct job. So we've got to be quite careful with that. Um, Cool. Again, it's got another pressure bypass valve, so if the cooler is clogged or not working for whatever reason, it can bypass the cooler. But then what will happen? Oh, it'll well. overheat. Yeah, could overheat. Alright. Um, oil temperature gauge, again that's after the cooler, like the pressure gauge, so if the cooler is working properly, you should see a normal temperature range. Okay. Periodic oil changes are necessary, okay, because filters, one, 
they'll take out everything. There can still be little bits of metal in the oil. Don't want to leave it in there for too long. Um, oil oxidizes as well, so it absorbs um, or oxidizes with the oxygen and exposure to it. So it starts becoming less effective. That's why if you have, um, for example, people who do their own maintenance on their cars, I don't know if any of you guys do that as well, but when you buy oil, you only buy enough oil for what you're doing, unless you're doing lots and lots of oil changes. Because if you buy a big 25 litre thing of it, as soon as you open it and let air into that, that oil starts going off. So you always only just buy as much as you need for the oil change, so whatever you need, and then go from there. Um, water absorption, that's another big one. So any water that gets in the engine or through the engine, the oil will absorb. So because oil absorbs water, it creates its, you know, what's the lubricating portion? Properties of water. Not much. Not much, right? It's pretty crap. So if you start putting water into the oil, you start reducing the lubricating ability of the oil. The way you know there's water in oil is it starts going a milky color. And if by the time you can tell there's water in the oil by a milky color, you desperately need to get that oil changed because something's about to go very, very wrong. Okay? So when you're checking the oil, make sure you're looking at it. If it's a really milky color, there's something wrong. Okay? Generally, it'll start like a clear golden color like oil is, and then after a couple of hours, normally sort of 15, 20 hours, it'll start getting a little bit darker, and then after sort of about 50 hours, it'll be that dark, like what you see in your car, that dark color of oil. Um, and that's effectively just the way we're getting dirty. Um, but again, when you've got your car, you let it run until it's like black and then change it, but in aviation, because we do 50 and 100 hour changes, it doesn't, uh, doesn't get that dirty. So when you're changing aircraft oil, it's still relatively clean, but it's just good for Yeah, it. I mean, it's like a dark, it's never black. Like if you get aircraft oil that's black, there's something wrong. Um, because it hasn't had enough time to go through all the exhaust gases and all that burnt stuff, hasn't had enough time to taint the oil, mm -hmm. because, you know, 50 or 100 hours, you do that in your car and come couple months mm -hmm. you know and when was the last time you did an oil change in your car mm -hmm. a year ago yeah. right so it's a bit different and you would have done thousands of hours probably in your car yeah. since then. so something to, something to keep in mind um, but yeah generally 50 hours they're doing an oil change um, normally they'll change the filters at that point as well if they don't get a new mechanic only use the recommended type of oil do not use turbine oil in piston engines, it's entirely different. Okay, turbine oil is made for 1000 degree plus temperatures, piston engines are not made for that okay? So don't swap them around. However, turbine oil comes in a, it comes in a tin, right? So it's normally a little, it's like a, imagine a paint tin that's that size, that's what turbine oil looks like. Don't put turbine oil in it. Aviation oil comes in these quartz, right, like this. Um, and it has a SAE rating, so that's the that's the aviation rating. It's just half of the motor rating. So if you're used to having a hundred grade oil, we have fifty, um, or whatever it is. Okay. So the grade of oil and the SAE rating do directly correlate. So half of it is the SAE rating. Okay. Um, cool. So if you use the wrong oil, you can get poor lubrication, insufficient cooling, engine damage, um, depending on what oil you use. So it's really important you use the correct oil. There's three types. There's um, mineral, synthetic, and ashless dispersant. Um, ashless dispersant is probably the most common one. Uh, mineral oil is generally used for running in the engine, and then the synthetic or an ashless dispersant is the too most common. They're both ashless dispersants like a hybrid. But mineral oil is generally used to run it in, and that's like actual oil. Um, incorrect oil quantity. So if you have too little oil, the oil overheats, the pressure is too low, and the engine will overheat, and you won't get enough lubrication, which is bad. If you get absolutely too little oil, the engine will seize because it's too hot and the parts basically weld themselves together. So you have the metal running up and down inside the cylinders on the piston rings and it goes, oh, I'm hot enough to weld myself to the side of the piston wall. I will. And it does. And it's not good. Mm. It's, it'll stop like that. Um, too much 
oil, you'll blow seals, the engine will stop working as well. Also just as bad. Most people have a tendency to put too much oil in. There's always overflow wells, so generally it'll just spit the oil out. But, you know, for example, the Robins, we say fill it up after four, four quarts if it gets significantly below four quarts. Those engines can run on two quarts, right? Which is nothing. It's a quarter of the sump and a quarter um, in the engine. Very low oil. Um, but quite commonly I see them at seven, which is ridiculous because I'm pretty sure the maximum is six. And if you have too much oil, it's really, really bad. So just be very careful with that. Never overfill the oil. But also make sure there is some oil in the engine. Happy? All right. Low oil pressure. What could cause low oil pressure? Leak. Too much oil in certain parts. Too much oil in certain parts could cause low oil pressure. oil in some parts would cause low oil pressure. What what does it mean? So if we see low oil pressure on the gauge, what does that then mean? It's a tight. Okay. Okay. So we've got not enough oil. So we can see low pressure, so maybe we don't have enough oil. What else could it mean? Think outside the box. Don't look Right. So potentially too viscous. Uh, no, not viscous enough. Will indicate low oil pressure. So it can indicate one: you don't have enough oil. Oil pump failure. Um, failing bearings. Uh, oil pressure relief valve is stuck open. Could be anything, right? Insufficient oil. That's going to be really bad, right? What if you started with enough oil and then you start seeing a low oil pressure reading? Really? Yeah, which is bad, right? Because that means there's a hole in your engine somewhere that's leaking, which is even worse. Okay. After the start, you need to observe a positive oil pressure rise within 30 seconds of startup. If not, what would you do? Check. Cut the engine? Yeah, shut down, right? Because if there's not oil going to the engine, what's going to happen? More heat. No well. No yeah, it'll cease, right? Which is bad. So... Make sure if there's not oil pressure rising within 30 seconds, pull the mixture away. High oil pressure can cause the entire oil system to fail. So the whole oil system will just go and then you'll have low oil pressure, which is bad. Right? Fluctuating oil pressure, so that could mean a possible lack of oil. So if you're seeing it sort of start at oil and then go down and then back up and then down and then back up, that means you're probably starting to run low. In conjunction with High oil temperature could mean you don't have enough oil, right? So it confirms it. Also could mean you've got prolonged high temperatures, so you've just let the engine get too hot over too long a time. You want to read them together, okay? Because again, gauges can be um, can be an issue. The worst one is this: pressure low, temperature high, because that means you probably don't have enough oil in the system, and the oil temperature is getting hot, which means bad stuff's about to happen, right? So if you see low oil pressure and high oil temperature, get on the ground as quickly as you possibly can, right? Because it's about to stop. Pressure low and temperature's okay. Could be an oil pressure gauge fault. Could be you're just on the edge of, um, you're just on the bottom range of the oil that you should have in the engine. Some aircraft will have fluctuating oil pressure, right? Others don't, depends. Pressure okay, temperature rising. So that could mean you've got a gradual oil loss, right? Could also mean you're just running the engine too hot. But you'd always want to mixture rich, try and cool down the engine. If the temp keeps rising, then you know you've probably got an issue and the oil pressure's about to go, which is bad. Then you want to get on the ground. All right? All right. How's your car cooled? How's your car engine cooled? Someone other than Kai. No. <laughs> <laughs> like just ventilation, like just at the front of it. Ventilation, like at the front of it. Yeah. Cooling. Coolant. Oh, radiator. A radiator. There we go. Now we're getting down the right track. Yeah. 
So it's it's not air cool, right? It's it's what we call liquid cool. So you have a um, you'll have a radiator at the front. Some people have an intercooler as well, but that's not that's more for um, turbo. turbos and intake air, right? But you have the radiator at the front with coolant that runs through the engine block that cools the engine out. Because if you had an air cooled car, when you sit at the traffic lights, your, your car will overheat, and that's why you have it, right? Motorbikes, most of them are air cooled, and that's why they have. You see the have you, Do any of you guys ride bikes? No. Okay. Well, this is another shit analogy. But they look like plane engines. We'll get to that in a second. So most light aircraft are air cooled. Um, cooling fans. Some big aircraft have cooling fans. Actually, I think the Technam has a little cooling fan as well. Um, that provides airflow that's not reliant on airspeed. So when you're down at low, uh, on the ground. Waiting and it's hot can cool the engine a little bit. Generally, what's the what's the good cooling fan for the uh, engine? The prop. The prop. It's a pretty good cooling fan, right? <laughs> it works pretty well. Um, but sometimes the um, the cows here aren't big enough to get that airflow from the prop. Baffles. So baffles. If you look inside the engine bay, there'll be little grey and rubber, uh, orange rubber bits that are bent around. They direct the airflow to where we want them around the cylinders. Okay? And then when you look at the engine, same as a motorbike engine, same as any other engine, the block's just not a metal bit of, bit of engine, right? It doesn't sit there like a nice square, it's all lovely. It's got these fins on it. Why would it have these fins on it? <laughs> Distribute the heat. Yeah, how does that work? What have we just done to the surface area of this by putting fins on it? How much more surface area is there now? More. Heaps more. Yeah. Right? So it increases the surface area of that, so you've got more things that can be cooled. Right? So the airflow comes past these little fins, it helps cool down the engine. Okay? Right? It allows that uh, the engine to distribute heat, heat back to the air. Okay? So it allows that better heat transfer. Engine rundown periods, really important if we've been operating at high power settings for a long time that we allow the engine to cool down sufficiently. If we don't, we can start damaging stuff, okay? Shock cooling things is bad, right? If you take a, um, what, what happens to a, let's say a wine glass, you're washing it under the, you know, it's hot water, you're washing it and then you stick it in, um, or you pour ice cubes in a really cold water. It breaks. It breaks. Okay. That's thermal shock. Same thing happens with your engine. It doesn't shatter into a million pieces and cause a hell of a mess. But you can still have the same thing. You can get cracking forming, you can cause damage to valves, push rods because they bend and buckle because it's this long, thin bit of metal. As it buckles, it can wear. Um, really, really important. Helicopters, even more important because when they're hovering, they're at high power. When they're in the cruise, they're at a lower power setting. If you had a turbo aircraft, also really important to let a rundown period, because the oil temperature inside a turbo, really, 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 really hot, right? Really hot. So it's really important that you give yourself time to cool down. Normally, in a you know small aircraft, sort of two, three, four minutes. Um, if you've got a turbo, at least four minutes, normally six. If you've been operating at high power settings. So for example. You've been on a long cross country with a really high power setting, you keep the power setting up till short final, pull the power back and land, you're going to want to give that engine lots of time to cool down. Okay. Any big engines, it's really important. Little engines you can get away with a little bit more because they don't get as hot and when they cool down, they sort of it, they already cool down quickly because they're relatively you know, more. But if you have a big engine, hot, lots of surface area, one, it runs hotter, and two, because it's got more surface area, how's it going to cool down? Much quicker. Much quicker. So you've got to be careful. Alright, what does oil do? What is the purpose of oil? Uh, lubricate, cool, and clean. Lubricate, cool, and clean. Excellent. What's viscosity? What's high viscosity? Thick. What's low viscosity? Mm. Runny. Cool. Uh, How's the oil system work? What is the basic anatomy of the oil system? Kai, pick a part. A sump. A sump. Cool. Uh, John, pick another part. Uh, the pump. 
the pump, cool. I feel like we're going in a, going in order here. That's nice, Devin. What are you doing, mate? Are you just sitting there like dozing all night? <laughs> I have been, I have been talking about this, right? It's not just me. Pretty sure relief though. Uh, what with what? Yeah. What's the pressure relief valve next to? The oil. The oil pump. Mm. Okay. Eric. Um, cooler. The cooler. Yeah. What else? What's associated with the cooler? Uh, scavenge pump? No, nope, that's not associated with, well, I mean, it, it, it's part of the oil system, but what's associated with the oil cooler? Um, filter? Oil, nope. Oil tank? Nope. Stop listing stuff out of the book. <laughs> right, yeah. What happens if the oh. oil cooler, what if the oil's not hot enough? What do we have? Um, what's it called? It starts with thermal. Has relief in it, and it has another word at the end. Uh, thermal relief. I, don't know the last I hope you guys are better than this at school, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going to battle through this. <laughs> Abby, do you want to do you want to help him? Not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Valve. Oh, there we go. That will relief valve. Nice. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else? You already said filters, so that'll work. Um, what are the different grades of oil? Or what are they? Um, what's the most common one? Do we use a, a single grade or do we pick a, uh, a multi grade? <laughs> Yep, cool. So multi-grade, so we've got a wide temperature range. What's the connection between SAE grade and uh, SAE rating and oil grade? Half. Half. What's half? Half. The, um, one is 100, the other is 50. Which one's which? <laughs> the SAE is 50. Yep. And What's SAE? I haven't told you this. So. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I found out the other day that I got lied to about something uh -huh. in my training, and I've been teaching it for a while, so I'm just going to check that this is not a lie. So, it's not standard aircraft engines at all. No, I'm good. So it stands for Society of Automotive Engineers. So it's, that's the SAE rating. Right? So aviation rating is doable. So we put 100 in, they put 50 in. We put 80 in, they put 40 in. Still the same, but the aviation one is double. Cool. So SA. So the a aviation one is the bigger one. It's the higher one, right? Well, that's why if you look at the oil, it's got double the 100 oil. Would we describe that as the aviation oil grade? Aviation grade, yes. So oil grade. Um, yep. Uh, cool. Operational considerations. What is the worst temperature pressure combo reading? Low ten. Ah, uh, low pressure, high. What ten. does that mean? Malfunction. Getting <laughs> up a creek without a pad. Yep. What's uh? What is high oil temperature and low pressure mean, Devon? It means the oil is very hot. <laughs> 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 The engine's not going to work, but it's still working. Oil pressure's it, right? The temperature's just high. There's two things it could mean. High temperature, what's the first thing that could mean? Yeah, so the engine is, yeah, too hot. So we could cool it down a little bit, right? The other thing is we might be could be leading into the second scenario where we've got low, low oil pressure too. So maybe we're... Leaking run. Yep, losing oil. So then what's going to happen? The engine is going to seize. Yeah, well eventually the pressure gauge will start dropping and then we'll start seizing. Right? Um, what if we have a 
low pressure, normal temperature. Or fluctuating pressure, no temperature. Or normal temperature, sorry. It's not enough oil. No? Well, could be. The gauge issue? No. Nah. Could be a gauge issue, could be you've just done something which uses the oil system. So if you have a CSU and you're cycling it, you could be using oil there. Um, that's quite common. So yeah. Cool. Uh, one of the other ways we cool an engine, and how are most aviation engines cool? With the um, prop, cooling through the. Um... So they're cooled by. Yeah. Air. Excellent. So, what design of the engines do they have that make that make it more efficient at cooling? Flat things. Flat things. Fin fins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Cool. So there's a few different reasons. We've also got baffles, which are the little um, bits of rubber floating around that help direct cooling. Uh, direct air flowing cylinders. All right, you boys need a coffee. Uh -huh. Okay, I make it. How long do you guys want for lunch? We've got minutes, an hour. 45 is good. 45 is good? Okay. Uh, break? Anyone go to the bakery? So we're going to go through engine handling, so what we'll do, we'll go through starting, stopping the engine, handling in flight, rough running, and emergencies a little bit on that. So what do we need to do before we start? Pre-flight. Pre-flight, yep. What about when we get in the aircraft? Before we turn the key. We've already done that part of our pre flight. We're in the plane about to turn the key. What do we do? Oh, oh like the, the battery, is it? The, um, Not the specific actions. What are we sort of looking for in general? You do all your checks and that sort of thing, obviously. But There's no one around? Yep. There's no one around. There's no one hanging around the prop. Um, the area around you is clear. You can taxi forward and out of the way, right? So your path in front of you is clear. Um, make sure you've got the park brake on as well, just to assist you. In general, never, ever, ever trust the light aircraft's park brake, because they very rarely work properly. So always make sure you have your feet on the brakes. Hey, Abby. Uh, so when you're starting a cold engine, usually you require priming, okay? So either that's via a manual primer, so what we talked about with the primer that pushes in and out, okay? Or an electrical primer, like in a 172, where you have a pump, so mixture rich, sort of full, turn the pump on, wait till you see fuel flow, turn it off. Um, or accelerator pumps, like what we have in the Robin. So you go um, pump the throttle in, pull it out, pump the throttle in, pull it out. And that's how you can uh, prime the engine just before start. If it's really cold, sometimes you might require to hand um, turn the prop, the reason why you do that is to start getting the oil circulating through because if the oil is really, really viscous and it's not moving at all, it can almost create like a pressure stop. Uh, with the, um, when you prime it, are you doing that as you're, as you're trying to start the engine or do you do that before you before. turn it? Okay. So you do one, two, three, four primes, turn the key, set power. Okay. If it's really cold, you might have to turn it through, get some oil through, get some lubrication through, um, and then start. How, is very, how much is very cold? Like minus something. Very cold. Basically if it doesn't start. Also just be careful when it's really cold because the batteries will drain very very quickly. Over priming, so if you flood it, right, the start procedure is mixture, idle cutoff, throttle full, and then as soon as the engine fires you've got to quickly go mixture full rich excuse me, and then close the throttle all the way to idle so that it doesn't redline up. Okay? Sorry. Hang on one second.
It's your call sign. What's going on here? The four bells is calling for you. Yeah. Oh, no. That's awesome. yeah. <laughs> that was the quiet house. I was like, yes, come in. Hello. <laughs> no. I'm a dog. Most of the time. Alright. Hot engine, usually don't require priming, sometimes just a little prime or a half a prime or a full prime. Um, hot engines are very easily over primed, so then you have to end up doing the flooded start procedure. Okay? Um, fuel injected engines can have vapor lock. Now the only way to vapor lock is to, to get rid of vapor lock is to pretty much flood the engine. So you push all the fuel through till the bubbles are out and then start it using the hot start or the um, flooded procedure. How will you know if an engine flooded? If it's flooded, if you can smell fuel, that's a good one. Um, also, if the mixture's full rich and it just won't start, it won't fire at all. Um, so there'll be a process of elimination to figure out if it's Yeah, because if, if it's under primed, normally as you turn the key, it'll fire, it'll like catch a few times, it'll go pa 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 and then it just won't start at all. If it's over primed, you'll just sit there with the key turning and nothing will happen. Right. It'll just... It won't even catch you, it'll just literally yeah. have to start by the gun. Or you'll get a really loud backfire at some point. <laughs> That's the other thing that happens. Um, so yeah. When we're stopping the engine, we need to allow the engine to cool down, as we talked about before. Okay, turn the park brake on, avionics off, then we do our dead cut check, okay? So throttle below a thousand, keys to off, back to both, make sure it's all off. Then we pull the mixture to the idle cutoff. If the engine keeps running, then we open the throttle a little bit. Why would the engine keep running even if we pulled the mixture to idle cutoff? Think back to carburetors. There's still fuel in the motor? No, nope, we've used all the fuel. What on the carb will keep the engine running that's not connected to the mixture control when the throttle's at idle? Is there anything in the carb that helps the engine run when it's idling? Oil. Huh? Oil? No. Nope. If you've got oil in the carb, you've got lots of problems. What is the, what are, what's one of the systems in addition to the carb that helps the engine run when the throttle's all the way closed at idle? Because there's very little airflow and the main fuel jet doesn't work properly. Carb heat? No. Nope. Something bypasses it. Yeah. So there's an, there's an idling jet, right? There's an idling system which puts fuel in behind the throttle butterfly so that the engine keeps running. We covered this like an hour ago. <laughs> Come on, guys. Okay? So, sometimes you can pull the mixture to idle cutoff and it stops the fuel going through the jet, but the engine will keep running because of that idling jet just behind the throttle butterfly in the car. So in that case, you've got to increase the power a little bit, otherwise the engine will keep sitting there just per per and it just sits there and it just keeps going. So, Increase the power a little bit, and then it'll do it. Once the engine stops, confirm the throttle's closed, ignition off, keys out, and uh, make sure the master is off, so battery and alternator off. Make sense? Cool. Engine handling on the ground. So again, follow the recommended procedures in the flight manual. So they'll tell you what RPM setting to have, when to lean the mixture, when to enrich in the mixture, and so on and so forth. Generally, avoid long periods of idling, Right? So when you're, at, for example, in the Robins, when you're at rest, when you're parked up, we have the engine set at 1,200 RPM. Right? Because it stops the spark plugs. Ooh, did it again. The spark plugs from fouling. Right? Um, so you've got to be a little bit cautious with that. Again, if you're going down a hill, you've got the power all the way at idle, just using a little bit of brake. Once you come to a stop, increase the power again so you reduce the risk of spark plug fouling. Taxiing over rough ground. It's where you get propeller strikes, you can also pick up stones and that sort of thing, which isn't good. So make sure when you are taxiing over rough ground that you're um, keeping the weight off the nose wheel. If it's over gravel, don't increase the power if you have any brakes on, because you'll just end up kicking up stones. Okay. Generally, avoid rough ground. Okay. If you're not sure if it's flat or bumpy, don't taxi over it, get out and walk it, make sure it's good. 
jump back in, start up and taxi over or pull it over, okay? Because um, a propeller strike doesn't only break the prop, it also writes off the engine as well. Because you've got a running engine where it suddenly stops and that basically ruins everything. So propeller strikes are bad. Um, Run-ups, make sure you let the engine warm up for at least four minutes in a four-cylinder aircraft. So the rule of thumb is one minute a cylinder. So if you have a six-cylinder aircraft, you wait six cylinder, six, uh, six minutes. Funny, buddy, buddy. Fuck. <laughs> six minutes. If you have an eight-cylinder aircraft, you wait eight minutes. If you have a nine-and-a-half-cylinder aircraft, you wait nine-and-a-half minutes. Right? And that's a good rule of thumb. Okay? Some aircraft you have to wait longer, some aircraft you can wait less time. Just depends. With that idling, yep. when, you, when it says long periods of idling, is that long periods idling at 1200 or the even? No, so 1200 isn't idling. Even Idling's even. where you've got the throttle all the way closed. Right. So that's why we set the RPM at 1200. Roughly, stop that roughly the main idling ones were like, what, 6700? Yeah, yeah, so the Robins will idle at around 650, 750, which is very different to 1200. Um, don't run up on stony surfaces, right? Avoid them at all costs because uh, you'll just end up clicking up stones and that's not really good. Make sense? It's all, it's all common sense. Like, engine handling is generally common sense. When you're handling in flight, again, follow all the procedures in the flight manual. Follow the standard operation for handling that engine in flight. Okay? Go through regular SADI checks, lean the mixture as you gain altitude, avoid shock cooling. Right? So don't climb up to 7,000 feet and then pull the power and decide to descend in a glide because you will break your aircraft. Right? All right, what if the engine starts running rough? What do you do? Maybe, what if you're at high? What if you're at 6,000 feet? Carping. Hey, that's a good one. Also, you wouldn't enrich the mixture all the way, but maybe a little bit. Especially if you're descending and the engine starts running rough. Because maybe you let, you're at 10,000 feet, you leaned it out, and then you start descending. Forget about it, and then suddenly the engine starts going, you makes you rich. And then it'll run nicely. Okay? Uh, so, yeah. Generally, first port of calls, carb heat, that's, that's kind of the first thing in any carburetor aircraft, is turn the carb heat on because you probably got carb icing. Then from there, check the fuel. So turn the pump on, pressure, correct tank. Right, check the mixture, make sure it's set correctly for the altitude you're at. Ignition, make sure you're on both, you're not on one or the other. Okay? If in doubt, just get on the ground and figure it out. You'd rather be on the ground talking to an engineer and the engineer saying it's fine, then in the air, wishing you were calling an engineer, and it's about to go fits up. Right? How do you deal with an engine fire? So if you have an engine fire on startup, continue cranking. So keep cranking the engine over. Right? Pull the mixture, then put the throttle to full. So full throttle. What that does is it basically blows all the flame through the system, so there's no more fire. And then if there's still fire fuel. Um, Fuel off, ignitions off, and then get out of the aircraft. People tend to forget that when you're doing a flight test or something like that. Right, so what do you do in an engine fire? Oh, continue cranking, fuel off, throttle full, fuel mixture addition, make sure it's all off. And then what? Uh, don't know. <laughs> what would you do? Uh, get the get the fire extinguisher, uh, first aid kit, oh, I don't know. Make sure you get out of the aircraft. Right. It'll probably be quite obvious if you ever have <laughs> Any questions with that? If it does go out after you've continued crank here, what would be your next step in terms of precautionary? Still turn it all off mm -hmm. and still get out mm -hmm. and then call an engineer and apologise to the owner of the plane. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Engine fire in flight. So in a Robin or most aircraft, generally light aircraft, incombustible speed tends to be 85 knots. Um, so if you get rid of um, all the fuel and you're doing above 85 knots, the, f the fire itself should extinguish itself. But as soon as you have an engine fire, fuel off, mixture lean ignition off, make sure you get the nose down past 85 knots. 
try and get rid of the fire. Then once you've got rid of the fire, make a force landing into the closest field, closest appropriate field. Now, hopefully the fire stops because that'll make your force landing a little bit easier. If the fire does not stop, you're going to be in a quite a high stress scenario. Be uh, hot pants. All right, engine failure. So an engine failure can be caused by a few different things. So fuel is the big one, right? So starvation, running out of fuel, massive one. There is no excuse to run out of fuel, ever. Nothing. Oh, my Aunt Betty said that she had Avgas and she didn't and I had to go anyway and I left and then I ran out of fuel and I knew I would, right? No excuse. Contamination. Also no excuse, drain the fuel every time. As soon as you think there might be something wrong, drain it. If you refuel, drain it. If you haven't pre-flighted that day, drain it. Right? Um, incorrect tank selection. If the engine stops, the first thing you should do is probably the last thing you just touch. Right? Because sometimes it's bad. If you do something and the engine stops, it's probably what you just did. So if you just change the tanks to right and then the engine starts going pa -pa -pa -pa, change it back to left. Right? Don't sit there and go, oh, I wonder what could have done that. <laughs> right? Maybe there was water in my fuel. Um, you know, it's a very common one. Two liter mixture, again, the example I gave before. Um, not saying that was from personal experience, it was Joe Blocks, but descending from altitude and forgetting about the mixture, at a certain point the engine will start coughing and spluttering, and then if you keep descending, it will quit. So make sure you do that. You'll also end up running quite a hot engine. Um, Air intake issues, so maybe you've got carb ice, but maybe you've just blocked the intake. Maybe you smoked a bird on takeoff, or you ran into a drone or a plastic bag or something like that, and it covered the air intake. That's going to stop the air going to the engine. If you stop the air going to the engine, what's going to happen? Can you get a fuel air burn without in the air? Oh, no. ah, so the engine will stop. Yeah, it'll stop. Right. So we can use alternate air, so car heat on, that works pretty well. Ignition problems, um, there was actually a case a wee while ago of a student pilot out on their first cross country in a 152 and then coming up the west coast and engine was running rough as guts, right? just randomly out of nowhere, just ran rough as guts, rough as guts, rough as guts. He shat himself and went, oh no, engine's about to stop, get it in the field, so he landed in a field down on the west coast there. Called up the instructor, oh, okay, I'm in the field. Oh, okay. That's not how I expected this chat to go. Right. <laughs> I'll come and get you then. I'll bring an engineer. Engineer got in, one mag ran fine, other mag ran fine, put it on both, grrr, ran rough as. The magneto timing was just out a little bit. Right. So check the ignition, try different settings, left, right, both. Right. You might find that one magneto is just entirely crapping out so that if you're on the right mag, for example, maybe it's just running rough as guts, but not running at all, and on the left mag it just runs a little bit worse than it does than it would normally. Right? So check the ignition. Mechanical failure, very, very, very rare. Spontaneous combustion of an engine doesn't really happen. Occasionally you'll throw, a, throw parts of an engine, but with the way that aircraft are maintained and how strict it is and stringent it is, it's very rare to have an engine that will just out of nowhere fail, um, you know, or have a have a big mechanical failure. So I had a prop run away on me on one aircraft here, not a not a club aircraft on the way down to New Plymouth at night IFR, and I haven't done that many hours. And even combined with everyone who works here, no one had experienced that failure. So sometimes you're just unlucky, like me, so don't fight with me. <laughs> Other times it's just, you know, it's very, very unlikely you ever get that failure. But if you do experience a failure, good news is statistically you're probably better off if you won't experience one again. So take that away. <laughs> How do you deal with an engine failure? Aviate, navigate, communicate. Right? That is the foundation of all flying, is this aviate, navigate, communicate. Okay? So fly the aircraft. Always just fly the aircraft. So many people have killed themselves because, example, the prop running away scenario, that's only happened two other times in that aircraft. Both other times those pilots died. 
first time was because he got confused, did the wrong thing, stalled the aircraft, crashed into the ground. And the other guy got so distracted with trying to fix the problem that he didn't actually look outside where he was going. And then when he realised it was too late, he turned in and ended up running into the side of a hill. So they got distracted with a problem rather than just looking out the window and flying the plane. None of those are catastrophic failures. You'd still just end up in a paddock somewhere, you know. And if you land an aircraft, even in the worst paddock, right, it's still really, if you touch down at the right speed, it's not going to be much worse than a 50k car crash. Which statistically, you're probably going to, like, you'll probably walk away from that one as well. Right? But if you stop flying the plane, and you stall it, or you lose control of the plane, then you, you may as well throw a hoax to the head, right? So make sure anything goes wrong, fly the plane, right? Don't worry about anything else, just fly the plane, make sure you keep the air, right? Keep the wheels down, keep flying the plane, okay? Maintain speed if you've got an engine failure, so make sure you lower the nose. Um, if, it's, if you're at slow airspeed, if you're at fast airspeed, start maintaining height until you get back to the airspeed. Then once you've flown the aircraft, you've got the aircraft under control, then you can navigate. So you can find a suitable landing area, you can look around and go, okay, where am I gonna go? Am I gonna ditch in the ocean? Am I gonna go on the beach? Am I gonna have to find a paddock? What's the plan? Can I make it to an airport? People tend to forget that quite a lot. Force landing, oh, I'm going there. And there's an airport right here. <laughs> and like, well, what's the point of that? Right? Make sure if you can go to an airport. Again, that example off the west coast there. We just went to an airport. Right? We were still 55 miles away and it was a bit tight, but we got there, so it was fine. So, you know, find the most suitable landing area you can. Plan the approach, figure out how you're going to do it. Again, is it an airport? How are you going to get into the airport? Are there other people there? Do you need to tell them to move? Right? If not, plan the approach, select your field, fly into the flight. Um, fly into the there, fly into the field. Right? Then, once you've flown the aircraft, you keep flying the aircraft. If you have time, communicate. So let people know. Do a mayday call. Do a passenger briefing. Let your passenger know what's going on. Right? Even if you don't have time, don't worry about it. Fundamentally, they're going to be nervous as all hell anyway. If you yell brace at them at the last minute, they will. Um, again, you're better off flying the airplane somewhere than spending 10 minutes or two minutes trying to brief your passenger on exactly what's going to happen and then you're running into the side of a hill or something like that. Fly the plane. Okay. Always, always, always fly the plane. Then do trouble checks. So what's the problem? Fuel, mixture, ignition, throttle. See what's going on. It's probably fuel. What did I just do? Did I turn the fuel pump off? Oh yeah, I did. Turn that back on. Oh, engine works again. Sweet. Did I change tanks? I did. Let's change back. Oh, it works again. Okay. Um, is it a mixture? What did I just do? Oh, I didn't enrich in the mixture, but I have been descending for the last five minutes, so I probably should do that. Oh, there we go. That works. Ignition. Oh, well, let's try different settings, see if it works. Oh, that's much better. Let's do that. Okay, how much power do I have available? Throttle, check for partial power. Maybe the throttle cable slipped. Right? Push the throttle in. See if you've got any power. See how much power you have available. And then fly the pattern. Keep flying the plane. Always fly the plane. If you always fly the plane, you'll be alright. Even if it's into a tree canopy, as long as just before the tree canopy you slow down as much as you can, you'll also survive that. Right? Do not hold me to that, by the way. <laughs> I don't want to text from <laughs> someone's parents being like, you told these guys. <laughs> but, you know, chances are, as long as you keep flying the plane down to the ground, you will survive. Right? Statistically, you would. Trouble checks don't help, then start thinking about shutting down. So turning everything off. Fuel, mix your ignition off. Okay. Master, off. Make sure your harnesses are all nice and tight. Sounds dumb, but sometimes you might loosen them off in the cruise and turn around to grab something, grab a snack, I don't know. Use the, use the bathroom in flight, whatever it may be. Hatches ajar. Why do we go hatches ajar just before, uh, just before we're landing? Any ideas? What is hatch ajar? Opening the hatches, opening the doors, opening the hatch. Oh. Why would we do that? 
easy to get out. Yeah. What are the what are the jaws of life used for most of the time in car accidents? Getting people out, getting the doors. Yeah, out. opening doors. Right? Because when you run into something that's a metal cage, at high energy, it twists and it buckles. How well does a door work after it's been twisted and buckled? <laughs> Not that well. Right? If you open it up beforehand, it's alright. You know? It's like if you're in a car accident, open the door, jump out, tuck and roll, you'll be fine. Don't do that. That was a bad joke. <laughs> Make sure you land as slow as possible, right? Keep the cabin intact. So if there's fence posts, something like that, aim in between fence posts. If there's trees, aim in between trees. Right? Your cabin is your little safety pot. The wings, they're shock absorbers. So make sure you're aiming in between trees. Don't use your face as a shock absorber. It doesn't work too well. Cool? Sweet. Nice. Happy start to the uh, afternoon <laughs> session. Um, but yeah, look, priority, ABA. Second thing, navigate. Last thing, communicate. Right? If you land on the ground and you didn't navigate, you just flew the aircraft and you were freaked out and you just went, oh, I'm just going to glide. Okay, there's a beach. All right, I'm just going to glide and land, and I don't care. This is where I'm going. I don't have time to think about anything else. And you land, and then you call someone up. Me. Right? If you have an engine failure, and you start calling people up, and you just enter this nice spiral dive into the ocean, who's better off? <laughs> you're basically letting people know that you're screwed. You'd rather give them a call once you're on the ground. That's why we have tools in the aircraft. That's why we have radios. That's why we have ELTs. Right? Flick them on once you're on the ground. They still work. That's why ELTs have G-sensors in them. You don't even have to turn it on. If you do a proper crash, you'll be fine. If you land too nicely, though, then you have to turn it on. Right? But at that point, you probably use your fucking too. Happy with that, though? Make sense? Excellent. All right. Time to wait for the, uh, for the next presentation. Oh, no. We don't have to wait. All right, radial, two strokes, gas turbine, and turboprop engines. Who knows what any of them are? Yeah. Many. Radials are ones that you'll see on most, like, older style uh, military ones. Yep. Uh, two strokes, make on micro lock, I think sometimes you'll see them, or not really much in general aviation. No, I don't think so. Just the parasailers with the little dee. Fans on their back, right. the ones that look like office fans, strap their back. Yeah. All right. So a radial engine looks like this. It's radial because it's radial. It goes around the outside. So it has a central crankshaft, right, and all the pistons around it drive it. Okay. There's still four stroke, but it's all timed so that this crankshaft moves around in a circle like this. Okay. So. Ooh. <laughs> um, and it's also just they tend to run a little bit smoother because the power is, is a lot more constant than if you've got a 4 or a 6 or an even number of cylinders because radials tend to be odd number of cylinders and for some reason that just makes them feel a little bit smoother in flight they have a very distinctive sound though if you hear a radial in the past it Mm, that's nice. But they also produce lots and lots of horsepower. Problem is, they're big and they're round. And where are, air, where are aircraft engines normally? Front. Yeah, at the front. So when you've got something big and round in front of you, how much can you see? Yeah. <laughs> got to try and squeeze over the top, you can't see anything. So that's the downside of radial engines. No? Two stroke engines? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a two-strike engine. <laughs> Bad animation. Really. And it's having a... Um, it's not having a nice time. It's a two-frame animation. Quality Yeah. Quality. Quality animation. All right. Someone talk me through a two-strike engine. The cylinder's up here and it's going down. Still works the same way as a four stroke engine, there's just two strokes. Oh, 
All right, I'll tell you this. <laughs> There's no compression, is there? It's, it ignites on the way down with the fuel in, or is it the other way around? So it's, it's, it's a bit weird and it's a lot less efficient. So it still works fundamentally the same way. As the piston comes up, it compresses the gas, but also as it's coming up, it's also exhausting gas. Right? So it pushes gas out until a certain point, and then when it gets to about here, valve close, stops, right? Then as it comes up, compresses, and then it ignites and comes back down. As it comes back down, valve opens, air intake mix comes back in, right? Then as it comes back, so it's you're adding both of them. So this one here you have, that's not how you spell compression. Um, I'm just gonna write comp because I'm sure. So you have compression and exhaust, and then on this one you have, oh hang on, this one's going down. So this one is, I'm just gonna write them around the other way. Let's swap these two around. <laughs> <laughs> just to confuse you. So, so as it's coming up, you have compression, right? So as it starts coming up, the valve's open, so that mix is getting out, okay? As it comes up, valve closes, gets compression, comes up, gets ignited, power stroke, valve comes open, air intake comes in. As the power stroke's happening, as it's coming back up, getting compressed, exhaust as well, at the same time, there's lots of overlap. So they tend to run very inefficiently. Right? There's lots of fuel going out the whole time. Right? That's why two strokes have that very distinct fuel smell because they burn so much fuel it's not funny because half of it's coming out the exhaust. Right? But they generally tend to generate more power because every two strokes is a power stroke. Right? Every second stroke is a power stroke. So at 2000 RPM, you're generating twice as much power as you would if you were doing 2000 RPM on a four stroke. So they generate more power per RPM, which is why on they're used on things like motocross bikes and that sort of thing. But they're very, very, very inefficient, right? Because there's a whole load of air coming in, going out. Gases don't mix quite as well. It's a bit of a messy cycle. Does that make sense, sir? It's basically a four-stroke that's been cut in half and added together, and that's a bit inefficient. On the intake and power, how come the intake of stuff coming in is that also ignited? from the stuff that's already ignited so the, stroke yeah. down. So the power stroke, so it gets ignited, yep. it comes down, mm -hmm. and then it starts intaking. Mm -hmm. So it's intaking, intaking, intaking. While it's intaking, there's also an exhaust one going on mm -hmm. as it starts coming up, so then you get the scavenging. Yeah. And then as it comes back up, both valves close and it compresses, yep. and it ignites. It's, it's very messy compared to a nice clay four stroke engine. But that's why there's a whole lot of waste. That's why they're traditionally more smoky as well, because they generally have oil in the fuel too, right, to allow for better lubrication. Um, but yeah, they're not really seen in aircraft. Sometimes in like parasailers and that sort of thing. Do they normally run at a higher RPM or a lower RPM? Or uh, generally a similar RPM, yeah. It sounds a lot louder. All right, gas turbine engine. They work off the same principle as a four-stroke engine. Again, you can see this four-stroke thing, they really caught on. So, suck, pulling it in, squeeze, squeezing, into the combustion chamber, bang, banging, blowing, out. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow, nice and easy. Children. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is what we call a turbo fan, okay? So up here we have a big fan, right? It's like a propeller. Okay. Still does the same thing. It also compresses air though. Okay? So this big fan compresses air and then at some point this is what we call the bypass section. So this is the air bypassing the central core of the gas turbine. Okay? Or this is what we call a turbo fan. Right? So this fan at the front generates thrust like a propeller does but it also starts compressing air. Then these ones here, compress, compress, compress. Okay? So they're low speed compressors. So these ones are on a, um, sorry, low speed, low pressure compressors. So these ones have less pitch on them. So they're less, you know, when you look at a compressor, it looks like this, right? So it's moving down and squeezing air into a smaller gap, okay? 
So this air is getting compressed and squeezed. And then there's a second spool. So these, these shafts here are called spools. Right? Second spool is the high pressure or the high speed spool. So this compresses it significantly more. So that air is getting really, really compressed. Okay? Then it gets pushed into the combustion chamber. In here, fuel is introduced. It's so hot, it doesn't need ignition. So most gas turbine engines have igniters on them. They're generally only for start and or bad weather. Because if you start adding rain through here, it gets good. Then, so this is the bang, right? So fuel's being introduced, it's expanding rapidly. These are then getting powered, right? So as it's expanding, it's spinning these fans around at the back, okay? So these ones spin these ones, which compresses more air in. So it powers itself, right? As it gets to the rear, we've got the low speed or the low pressure compressor wheels, uh, sorry, the turbine wheels. So these are turbines, these are compressors because of the way the air's moving. Um, and then you have the exhaust. So you get thrust, right? Well, thrust going that way, exhaust coming out this way. And then you also get thrust from the fan itself, right? So what the starter does is it starts spinning the fan until it gets fast enough to compress the air enough that when they introduce fuel and have the igniters going, it starts expanding, right? Which then starts spinning the turbines, which means they can get more air in, which means it goes on and on and on until they reach a stable speed. Then it's primarily controlled by how much fuel you have. If you have more fuel in there, more expansion, therefore it goes faster, therefore more air to keep the fuel going, right? Less fuel, lower speed. But works the same as a four-stroke engine. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Continuous power though, right? So this is a constant thrust. There's no, um, you know, it's not once every four, four cycles, it's just constant thrust. Now, this is what a 1970 747 engine looked like. Now, you have a fan that's this big, and you have a compressor that's, a, uh, sorry, you have a core that's about that big. The, this is what we call a bypass ratio. So how much is going in here versus how much fan on the outside. So the bypass ratio now is so good that they can have a really small core, same size fan, tiny core, same speed, same thrust, significantly less fuel. So that's why when they talk about newer engines being more fuel efficient, this is what they're doing. They're creating better bypass ratios, but to do that, they have to compress more air to a tighter spot at a higher speed to create the same, um, the same thrust. Right? So that's why we're now having, previously, when you started aviation, um, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s, Stuff was breaking all the time, right? Because they haven't figured out how to design it strong enough. You know, square windows, they broke, people died, wasn't good. Engines failed, people died, wasn't good. Every time that happened, people got better. It's like you look at air crash investigations. Before 2000, heaps of them. After 2000, not that many, right? Okay? So, as aviation goes on, everything gets safer and better and better and better. Engines are one of these things that are reaching their limit, right? You've heard all the issues of the... Um, G9Xs on the 787s, right? The reason why is because all of those blades that are spinning at huge speeds, at really high temperatures, are right on the limit of what the materials can do. So when they break, and break down sooner, because they're right on the limit, then they create issues, where the engine basically rips itself to shreds. Which is fine, because the other engine is good, so you can you know, fire out. But... That's why we're having more issues with engines now, is because they're kind of at the limit. They can't get that bypass ratio any better. They can't get them any more fuel efficient. And because they're pushing so hard for it, stuff's breaking again because they're operating at the upper limit now. There you go, gas turbines. Make sense? So, would they avoid that if they made the actual engine bigger? Uh, so, so are they trying to get the same amount if of... You, if you look at the engines now, for example, if you look at a 747 now with the new General Electric engines in them, mm -hmm. they're like this. Mm -hmm. If you look at the old 747s, the old engines were like this. Mm -hmm. right? So the bypass ratio on this is still significantly better because the core on the old one would have been like this, mm -hmm. which is 
that big. Whereas the new one will still have a significantly smaller one. Right. So you're getting more thrust because you've got a bigger fan, right? But you're also using less fuel because you've got a smaller, um, smaller engine. So they can either do it so you can increase the amount of thrust and then because of the engineering of the systems, normally the limits for it are based off how much thrust you can produce and how much the engines weigh. So they can make them lighter, make them, the engines themselves are actually bigger, but they're lighter, they use less fuel, you know, they're, they're better. But yeah, so that's a gas turbine engine. So that's what all the big, big fancy planes use. Make sense? Any questions on that? Cool. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Is that why on like when you say like on a um, when they introduce more more fuel, that's why the RPMs will always just go straight up because there's more fuel in there to burn, i.e., yeah. more power or thrust or what? Yeah. Whatever you class that. When so the, the fuel control unit does. Uh, that that basically controls the RP, yeah. RPM of the engine. So the engine RPMs are measured in what they call percentage of N1, right? So N1 is a percentage of the max speed of this, right? Right. So they can operate up to normally 110. Mm -hmm. So it's so not so it's not really the max speed, but that's that's what their power is set off. Mm -hmm. So they will go, okay, takeoff power is. 87% N1. And that's always of the front fan, the yeah, main so N1 fan. N1's generally the front fan, and then they'll normally have N2, which will be the speed of a... The compressor. A compressor. Right. Um, and then you have ITT, which is internal turbine temperature, and... Oh, what's the other one? I can't remember. I don't fly turbine aircraft. So this is <laughs> <laughs> stretching the limits of my knowledge a little bit. NG, <laughs> Uh, NG, sorry. Yes, NG is is NG exhaust or is that yes? Because it's N one, N two, NG, ITT, and something else. Or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> suck, squeeze, bang, blow. You get thrust. It's continuous. That's what you need to know. Cool. Turbo prop engine works exactly the same, right? Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Except instead of the um, turbine producing thrust, sometimes it does produce some thrust, they're set up so they, they can do it. You'll find a lot of um, a lot of turbo props uh, have what's called a reverse flow. So instead of going this way, the air intakes up here and the air comes in this way, and then the exhaust goes back out that way. Right? So that's what they call the reverse flow one. Again, that doesn't matter, don't know why I told you that. But Air comes in, gets squeezed, gets ignited, creates uh, uh, the turbine spool up. That then goes to a gearbox, which then spills, spins the prop on the front. Right? So the reason why turbo props and turbines are used is because their power to weight ratio is huge. So much better than a piston engine. Their reliability is so much better than a piston engine. Their maintenance cost is so much less than a piston engine per horsepower, right? Because they are very simple, right? Think about a piston engine. You've got a many metal parts sliding against each other the whole time at thousands of RPM. This, you have spools running in oil, and then not much is really touching itself. You know, you've got standard gearbox oils, but there's no power and burning that's rubbing against stuff. It's fairly linear. But the problem is they're normally not practical for um, training in small aircraft, really. Um, you could put them on a Robin, but it would be... I don't know how that would work. It would be exciting. But yeah, power to weight ratio, really, really good. And they're actually quite small as well. Like a PT-6, for example, um, is the, I think, the most common turboprop engine out there. There's like over a million of them that have been made and sold. And they're tiny. You know, the engine itself is like this. It's tiny. Right? But it produces a heat to the horsepower. But because they spin so quickly, they have to go to a gearbox. So this is a reduction gearbox. Because your prop will still spin at normal prop speed. So no more than really 3,000 RPM. 
um, normally significantly lower if it's a turboprop because they can increase the torque on it. You'll also see torque on a turboprop. Um, you won't see torque on a turbine on a turbofan. Everyone understand how a turboprop works? Same way as a gas turbine, except there's a gearbox on the main spool, which goes to so reduction gearbox, which then drives the prop. The, uh, the prop from the drive shaft, which gives you thrust. And we're adjusting the torque come from the gearbox. Uh, torque is all. Uh, torque's a measure of the power setting. Um, because it's so torque will be set off the off the thrust lever, and then the RPM will be set off the RPM lever. Um, so torque is the equivalent of manifold pressure in a mm -hmm. piston aircraft. Mm -hmm. Not that that matters when you guys end up flying these and be just down the track, and you have to do another exam on these anyway. So this is all you need to know. Suck, squeeze, band blow, drive shaft, gearbox, prop. Happy. Questions? Cool. Other engines? Radials, they're round. Two strokes, they have two strokes. Gas turbine engines work the way as a normal one, continuous power. Turboprops work the same way as a gas turbine engine, except they have connected to a reduction gearbox and a propeller. So the reason why there's turboprops instead of gas turbines is that turboprops are much more efficient down low. So a gas turbine's not very efficient, uh, sorry, a turbofan is not very efficient below about 20,000 feet because they require, they want to go fast, they have lots of airflow, but they don't want the air density to be too much. So they're designed so that they can fly up high. A turboprop is designed to fly down low when the air is more dense, that's why they use a propeller instead of a fan, right? And so that way it uses less fuel. They're still not that efficient below about 15,000. So turbo, turbine aircraft in general need to fly nice and high where the air's less thin so they don't have to use as much fuel. Because if there's more air, they need more fuel right, to produce the same amount. Um, so down low, they will just burn ridiculous amounts of fuel. Whereas up high, they don't burn much fuel. Cool. Sweet. All right. Typical cylinder configuration used for aircraft piston engines, i.e., how are they laid out? Are they inline? Are they V? Are they radial? Are they. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> so, auto. Horizontally opposed. You all heard that? Good. Okay. What does the cylinder do? What is the cylinder for? It's, um kind of houses the piston. Cool. What does the cylinder head do? Compress this. It's the, it's the house over the cylinder, oh, right? Oh. Seals off the top. What do the pistons do? Compress and... Um, oh, they go up and down. Go up and down. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they're responsible for the movement and absorbing the power strokes, right? And being able to do the compression. What's the conrod? Go on, Kai. <laughs> Connects the piston to the crankshaft. Cool. What's the crankshaft? Abby. Nope. It's not an arm. What does the crankshaft do? Yeah takes the up and down into the round and round, right? Cool, what do the valves do? And what types of valves are there? Exhaust and the other one? Exhaust and the other one? The one that pushes. The yep, so what do they do? They close off um, the... Uh, what do 
What do they do? John. It opens and close. <laughs> yep. And what is it to do what? When it opens, um, you intake the fuel and air mixture. Yep. And um, when it closes, it's for compression, and then the other side opens to release the exhaust. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, how do the valves work? What makes the valves open and close? <laughs> yeah. Have you guys been thrown? Have you guys had a look at actual valves? No? <laughs> I'll give you all the equipment needed to make a valve work. I want <laughs> This is this is what makes a valve work, so you guys can tell me how the valves work. So <laughs> this is the this is the part that actually opens and closes the valves. Yeah. yeah. So what's that called? <laughs> what's that called, Kai? <laughs> yeah, come on, Kai. What's it called? Sort of space before it was the first time I didn't look confident. It was <laughs> Pass it down the room, get it on there. Have a look, see. Not get something it. timing it, though. Right. Uh, yeah, kind of. Not. So there's. there's uh, what's that shaft called? Nope. What are those little lobes on it? They're called. Is anyone here a rock climber? Jesus. So many analogies in the Uh no, those little lobes are called cams. Cams. So the shaft is called a, a cam shaft? Yeah, nice. <laughs> How is that related to rock climbing? Uh in rock climbing we have cams. Oh which yeah. are to they're, safety. They're like semi-circle things that push out and hold against rocks. And, yeah. So look, right. one side of them kind of looks, it's a bit of a stretch. But mm, not if you're a rock climber, you're if, if you're a rock climber, you're a <laughs> No. <laughs> so the cams, or the, um, the lobes on there, as that's rotating, they hit the valve, and that pushes the valve down against that spring, so it goes down, and then as the cam comes off, it flips back up again. Is that all valves, or just the exhaust one? Nope, all valves work that. Well, generally all valves. So you hold that. I'm going to be a cam shaft. Right, ready? Okay, now open. See? Opening, and now closing, because it's there. There you go. See? And now as we come around, then it opens. Nice. And then it's closing, because it's been... Yeah, it's nice. because of the spring. And it's been pushed open, and it's closing. Hey, look at this. This is a pretty good illustration. There you go. Nice. You're doing a really good job here, mate. Well done. <laughs> right, so, so that's how valves work. So, cam shaft. Now, you want this? No. Okay. Uh, Can't talk that demonstration. So, <laughs> so, what you normally have is you'll have, if you don't have an overhead cam set up, you'll just have the valves at the top and the cam shaft, and they will hit them just here. Right? Ah, sorry, if you don't have an overhead cam, you'll have the camshaft down here next to the crankshaft, so it'll be geared, and then there'll be little tappets that go up, across, and over. So it hits the tappet here, so let's say it's this one here, hits it up, right? So that then pushes this rod up, which comes over, it's on a lever, and then it pushes this down. So as it's doing that, pushes that down, opens it up, comes past, closes it, goes through that way. Overhead cams, and when you have the camshaft overhead, right, and it's doing it. Reason why they're better, they're shorter, there's less stuff to break, um, there's, it's a more direct mechanism. So that's where overhead cams from, and double overhead cams. So double overhead cams, you have cams for each side. Make sense? Mm. Sweet. Yeah. And is that driven by the crankshaft, or would that be, yeah, the so crankshaft this, would go direct to the prop and then back to the... No, so this, this will be geared directly to the crankshaft. Jesus, that love is. It's always entertaining looking at these and realizing how which wondering which engine they came off because these are totally butchered. Um, so the and the crankshaft, sorry, the camshaft will always rotate at half the speed that the crankshaft rotates at. Right? Because when you get a full rotation of that, that's only two strokes, and the valve only opens once every four strokes, right? 
So it'll rotate at half, it's geared, so then it rotates at half the speed of the crankshaft. You will need to know that for the test. Um, cool. So we talked about valves, we talked about <coughs> camshafts. What are spark plugs and where do they go and what do they do and how do they work? Nice. Come on, what are spark plugs? They can ignite the fuel. Yep, when? Abby. Um, when the piston reaches the top. Is there any advance or not advance? <laughs> Alright, injectors, what are the two types of injection? One is direct injection. Fuel. Yep, they both feel that when we're talking about fuel <laughs> injection. <laughs> then direct. <laughs> kind of, yeah. So into the into the inward manifold rather than the action. So direct injection straight into the cylinder. Um, normal injection, because that's not really indirect injection, is into the inlet manifold for that cylinder. Alright, what is the uh, basic principle of operation of a four stroke internal combustion engine? So, basically, what are the four strokes? Abby? Um, intake? Yep. Compression? Yep. Power? Yep. Cool. Why do we have valve lead and lag and overlap? Someone? So it doesn't fuel the engine. What does valve overlap do? So when they're both open at the same time? Gets everything out. Yeah, better scavenging of the gases. When you hear me say something like four or five times, normally because it's going to come up in the exam, so just, just so you know. Um, okay, what about valve lead and lag? What are they mainly for? The E word. I'm a German, I like the E word. Efficiency. There you go. See? Efficiency. Cool. Good. Alright. I just marked it off with a pen that wasn't on. Um, what's the difference between compression ignition engines and conventional ignition engines? So diesel and ABGAP. Oh, the spark plug. Um, what's it called? Ignite. Um, the diesel is just like heated up um, with the compression and yeah, no. <laughs> Got it down the right path. John? Um, long <laughs> kind of a long way to Kai? <laughs> D diesel engines um, have uh, glow plugs to start them. That just heats yeah. the hell of the hot. And then how does the ignition work thereafter? Via compression yeah. of the um, mixture. So it heats up as it's compressed it, and it gets to a point where it combusts, and then it combusts. So that's a lower flash point. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Lower, higher flash point. Hang on. So I, I, said, a, I said lower before, didn't I? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's higher. Hang on. Now I'm, I've confused myself. <laughs> All right, remember 52 and 96, and tell me what I asked you in a second. So diesel has a higher flash point, therefore you can get more compression, which gives you a better ignition. Because if, hang on, ask me this tomorrow. I've confused myself. I'm going to, I'm going to ruin your brain if I say <laughs> So I'll, I'll just, I'll come back to that tomorrow. Um, um, what's the consequences of operating with an overlead mixture? Devon. What? 
<laughs> what happens when you overlay or what happens when you lay the mixture? What happens to the temperature? Okay, so what happens to the cylinder head temperatures? Okay, so what happens to the rough or the running? The running of the engine. Yep. What happens if you keep leaning it? Stops, gets rough, what else can happen? <laughs> knock knock. <laughs> which, which word is that? You'll need these words to pass the exam. Detonation. Oh, nice. Good stuff. Yeah. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> when school kids realise they should take notes. <laughs> What? <laughs> oh, I don't feel so bad now. I thought it was my instructor. Um, Alright, let's stop. This is making me sad now. What? Deto. Oh. Deto. Deto nation. Right? Nay, Sean. Sound it out. Sound it out. De. De. To. Nay. Shh. So S H. Um, <laughs> what? Oh, <laughs> <you> like. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to go through now is we're going to go through the electrics of most modern aircraft. There's still a line on the left. Um, so we'll go through the battery, the alternator, the bus bar, over voltage protection, ammeters, how they work, the different types, circuit breakers, fuses, procedures with them, normal electrical operation, and then some electrical malfunctions. Any questions from the last section, other than how do I do it all? Nope, cool, good. All right, so what needs electricery in the aircraft? All the avionics. All the avionics. Yep. What else? Um, like maybe the flaps? Yep, flaps in some aircraft. Cool. What else? Radio. Radio? Right, you said avionics, you started very broad, so you kind of shot yourself in the foot there. <laughs> what else? Engine. Lights. Starter. Starter, yep. Starter, yeah. Lights, yep. Um, what about instrumentation? Do any of those need electricery? Which ones do? Um, nope. Think about your, um, these ones down here. Oh, oil temperatures and pressure. Yep. So some of those need electricity to work. So some of those are electrically driven. The ammeter needs electricity to work. Um, oil pressure, I don't think that one's electrical. Oil temperature, that one needs electricity. The fuel gauge does, the fuel pressure does. What about the fuel pump? We have an electric fuel pump, right? That needs electricity. Huh? What if we were, um, uh, let's say we were flying through clouds, and what extra things could we have while we're flying through clouds? In terms of equipment, or heating, or... Oh, I think. Yep, so anti-icing, so maybe pedo heat or anti-icing equipment itself. Yeah, maybe radar as well, if you had that. Literally a lot of things. Right? So lights, that's a big one. So if you're flying at night and you run out of electricery, things get exciting. Right? And starter motor, need that. If you don't have electricity, you can't start the engine. Or you can't start the engine with the starter motor. Radios, so avionics, radar, pedo heaters, fuel gauges, uh, fuel boost pumps. Right. Need lots of things. So the battery, what it does is it stores electrical energy in chemical form. Okay. Capacity is measured in amp hours. Okay, so what an amp hour is, is if the capacity of a battery is one amp hour, that means you can draw one amp of electricity from it for one hour and then it will run out. More or less. Doesn't always work out perfectly. But that's the theory behind it. So if you have a 12 volt battery that has 300 amp hours and you're drawing one amp, you can draw one amp at 12 volts for 300 hours. 
right? Or you can draw uh, 300 amps for one hour, right? Or whatever it may be. Right? So that's how that works out. Um, typically, there's two types. So there's lead acid and nickel cadmium. Now, lead acid used less and less, okay? Because the acid is highly corrosive. And what are most airplanes made out of? Metal. Metal. And what does highly corrosive material and metal do when they make together? Heat it. Yeah, it fizzles and pops and does all sorts of exciting things, right? Um, it can also heat up. So when you're charging them, if you overcharge them, so the alternator fails, the voltage regulator fails, and you overcharge them, they'll heat up, and then the gas from them will start to escape, and then they go, which also isn't good. Um, nickel cadmium can do the same, but it's smaller and lighter. Generally, they're pretty good, but if you overcharge it, they can go boom too. So overcharging batteries is generally a very bad idea. Uh, it, it, it doesn't go well. Unless it's Guy Fawkes and you're outside and then sometimes it's exciting. Um, but they're much more efficient, so their power to weight ratio, I guess, is much better than the nickel cadmium batteries. So that's what's commonly used. So an alternator, so you'll see here on the edge of, just off here, there's a belt connected to that nice little red wheel there. That's the alternator belt. That red wheel is connected to the alternator. Okay, So it's mechanically driven by the engine. Yeah. It produces AC, so alternating current, and it needs to be rectified. So when you're converting AC to DC, it's called rectification. Okay. Um, most aircrafts tend to, use, most light aircraft pretty much use everything on DC. There's very little stuff that's AC and light aircraft. Again, some aircraft systems are operate entirely on AC, but most of the time it's DC. What it does is it recharges the battery, but the important thing about an alternator that's different to a generator is it needs some current to start. Okay? If there's no initial current going through the alternator, so through the electromagnet, it won't work. Okay? So if the battery is entirely dead and you turn the alternator on, it won't work. Okay? So it's really important that if you're flying along and you notice you forgot to put the alternator on, you notice quick enough that the battery is not entirely dead. Because if the battery is kaput and there's not enough voltage to get the alternator going, you can't now recharge the battery. So then you have to land without electricity, get a jump start, and then go from there. So does that mean that so the whatever's driven from the prop isn't enough to turn on or it doesn't work that way? The alternator requires it for whatever it's... So because the alternator's got an electromagnet that's spinning inside a mm -hmm. wire coil, that initial electromagnet, because mm -hmm. it's an electromagnet, mm -hmm. Needs need some to charge, charge to work, otherwise yeah. it's just a bit of wire spinning inside a bit of wire. Right. Right. So that needs that resistance too. Yeah, so it needs a little bit of current mm -hmm. to generate a current through there, and then if you spin a current through inside wires, you generate a magnet, and then it, you can uh, generate electricity by spinning it inside other wires, and I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because we'll be here for two hours. Um, but important thing to note is you can't just look at your watch and go, oh yeah, all right, go on then. <laughs> I want to know more about alternators. Um, just make sure there's, because if it's dead flat, it won't work, because it is an electromagnet. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Sweet. Um, Excellent, sorry, well, last thing. So how come you can push start a car then, or are they a different type of alternator? Um, <laughs> it could be that the car has a generator in it, and they call it. Um, but yeah, okay. depends. Also, that small amount is a is a you know because you can push start a car, mm -hmm. but if you jump in and turn the ignition on, you can still plug the radio and use the aircon, mm -hmm. right? So there is still electricity in the battery. Not There's just not like enough to generate right. the start. Mode. So that's probably why. Okay. Because if it's fully disconnected, and then you put on a dead battery, it it won't work. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Cool. Um, it's the same thing like if you're jump starting a car mm -hmm. and you take the jumper leads off too soon and the battery is fully dead, the car stops. So you have to leave them there for a while yeah, while it charges. Um, that's why too. Generator produces DC. It can double. Dead on the back. <laughs> double. It can double as a starter motor, um, depending on what setup it is and what it's doing. 
power to weight ratio from a generator is much heavier and larger than an alternator. So that's why they're not commonly used in light aircraft. Um, they're not good on low RPM operations. So generators, great for turbines, high RPM, lots of uh, drive coming out, excellent. They can use bleed air to spin a little turbine and they use that for the generator. Good for high RPM or high RPM operations, not so good for low RPM operations. A bus bar. So a bus bar is basically a, uh, it's, a it's a connector, right? Think about it simply. It connects different um, systems. So you can have primary bus bars, you can have avionics bus bars, you can have multiple avionics bus bars. It allows you to isolate um, isolate things from each other. So normally what happens is you'll have power that will go to both bus bars, right? Then from there you'll have all the circuit breakers for the things that are being powered, okay? So in this case you can see we've got um, power, radio one circuit breaker, then it goes to the radio. Um, power to the flaps, it goes to the ignition switch and to the wing flap system. So if you pull the circuit breaker, the ignition switch won't work, so you might not be able to start it for whatever reason. So a bus bar is a connector, so it groups things. Avionics bus bars are really common, so that you can isolate the avionics from the you know, critical things for starting an aircraft. And quite commonly you have a primary bus bar, so that'll have things like the lights, uh, the starter motor, the gear, if you have retractable gear, the flaps, they'll all be on one bus bar. And then everything else, if you've got lots of different systems, will be on their own bus bar with a switch. So that then, you can turn the switch off here, and now all of these go off. Right? Which is good for starting up, so you can isolate things, you don't accidentally fry stuff. If you need to minimise electrical load, you've got a really quick way of doing it. Um, yeah, make sense? It's basically a connector, it's a middle point. Cool. It's a hub. Happy? Alright. Voltage. So, generally most aircraft have either 12 or 24 volt systems in them. It depends on the aircraft as to what system they use. Um, the alternator or generator is will be always capable of supplying more voltage than what's required. Um, the reason for that being is if you have a 12 volt battery and you want to charge it, if you use a, let's say, a 10 volt alternator, it can only fill it up to 10 volts. Beyond that, it can't increase the voltage. That's not how electricity works. So if you want to charge a 12 volt battery, normally you'll have a 14 volt ammeter, uh, alternator. Sorry. If you want to charge a 24 volt battery, you'll generally have a 28 volt alternator. So it's always a bit above so that they can charge the battery, so that you can put more in so that the battery actually charges. Right? If you only put in 12 volts, and it's drawing 12 volts, you generally won't charge the battery very much at all. Okay. Um, but because of that, there's the possibility that you can overcharge the battery. right? Because when a battery is full, you can measure its voltage. So a full 200 amp hour 12 volt battery should read about 12 volts or just over actually when it's full. Right? As you drain it, the voltage will slightly drop as well. Voltage regulator keeps the voltage under control. So when the alternator is going, if you've got a 14 volt alternator going for a four hour flight, it doesn't try and turn the battery into a 14 volt bomb, which it will do if the voltage regulator fails. Okay? Now, if the voltage regulator fails, there's normally a relay which cuts off the charge to the battery. And okay? so it goes, oh, the voltage regulator's failed, cut off the charge, now we can't overcharge the battery accidentally but you also can't charge the battery at all. So then you've got, normally it's a circuit breaker that'll pop, right? So now you've basically got an alternate failure, even though it's a voltage regulator. Does that make sense? Just nodding to keep me happy? Yeah, fair enough. All right. An ammeter measures current, so it measures amps. It measures how much electricity is being used and drawn. Okay. So there's two types, there's a left zero and a centre zero ammeter. What you can see here is a centre zero ammeter. Now this one here shows you the amount of charge and discharge to and from the battery. Okay. So it's set up in a way that if, if the alternator is um, producing current and the battery voltage is low, 
it'll show a charge because the battery is being charged. Once it's central, it'll sit pretty much zero or neutral, slightly in the positive because the alternator will be producing slightly more power to power all the other systems, right? If it's draining, it'll start going to the left and it'll start showing a draw to the left. A um, left zero ammeter, which this photo is not a left zero ammeter, so I don't know why that's on there, um, is measured only measures the output of the alternator, okay? So if it's zero, it means the alternator's not working, or the alternator's not outputting anything, so there's no draw. So the engine could be running, but if you have all the electrics off, there won't be any draw, so the alternator should read pretty much zero. Right? If you have, um, let's say you've been starting for ages, battery's really flat, and you're now charging the battery, it should show a really large draw, because it's using lots of energy from the alternator. So a left zero ammeter, you'll normally have zero, and then 10, 15, 20, whatever the scale is on it. And then as, as you're using power, it'll come up. So once you charge, it'll sit up here, just after the start. And then once the battery is all charged up and it's using less, it might sit maybe around there, because that's how much electricity you're using. If you turn all the lights and all the electricity off, it might come all the way down here. But it won't show you any discharge from the battery, it'll only show you how much work the alternate is done. Does that make sense? Um, then we have a centre zero ammeter, so that measures current to and from the battery. Okay? So if you have a positive deflection, it indicates there's a charge into the battery, so in this case if it was coming over to the right, that means the battery is getting charged. Okay? If it shows to the left, that means there's current out of the battery, so that means there's a discharge. So a centre zero ammeter, you want to see roughly zero while it's sitting there. Okay? After start, it should show a positive reading because it's charging the battery. Then once you stabilise the battery, is charged, everything's good, it should read pretty much zero because the alternator will just be powering the electronics that are being used. The battery won't need anything to charge. Make sense? Master switch, so the master switch connects all the electronic systems, or electrical systems, sorry, except the mags, because the mags are their own, they're their own thing, they've got their own little generators in them. Okay. Um, alternator equipped aircraft typically have separate alternator switches, okay, and that connects the battery to the field winding, which is that little electromagnet um, that starts spinning when the engine speeds. Switching the master off will also disconnect the alternator. Okay? So if you turn the master off, there's no way the alternator will work, so it will turn it off because there's no charge going to the alternator anymore. Circuit breakers, so they look like this. If there's too much current going through something, so let's say uh, this one, what, is it? what does that one say? Got shaky hands. I can't read it from here. What's the number Check. one? That's the RPM tack on there, is it? Yep, what's the number on the circuit breaker? Two. 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 So if there's more than two amps going through that, oh. that'll pop. Right? Same as what's in your house. Those are all circuit breakers as well. So it pops, and then now there's no current going through it, so it won't work. Right? Now you can reset them, but only once, and only if you can't smell burning. Okay? It should go without saying that if it smells like electrical burning, don't reset the circuit breaker that just popped, because um, there's probably a reason why. But you can always reset them once. After that, don't reset it again. Just leave it popped and consult an engineer. And did you say they're measured in amps, not ohms, like some? Like so fuses are measured in ohms normally. Yeah. Um, these are measured in amps. Typically, circuit breakers are measured in amps. Um, so. During the pre-flight, don't leave the battery on the whole time, okay? And don't leave things on for an extended period of time that require cooling airflow. So landing lights, typically, very bright, very hot, they need airflow before they, um, so they don't cark themselves. Pedo heaters as well, they get really, really hot because they're not, they're expecting cold air over them. Um, when you're about to start up, turn off any unnecessary electrical equipment. So radios, transponders, any avionics, because if you surge up the start, right, the alternator's on for whatever reason, you can fry your uh, avionics and equipment, so you want to leave it off. 
after you've started, make sure the alternator is on and it's showing a charge to the battery if you've got a uh, center zero or that it's showing load if you've got a left zero and then after that switch on the other equipment. Okay? Again, before shutdown, turn off anything that's unnecessary, shut down the engine. Avoid prolonged starter operation, so don't sit there for about half an hour and then stop and then you'll get the green smoke of death which is when your starter motor dies. Um, you want to be really, really careful with starter motors because they are quite compact, they're very small for the amount of power they put out and they heat up very, very quickly because they're not, they're not made for continuous operation, they're made to do a couple cranks and then hopefully that starts the engine, right? They're basically the equivalent of having some old guy sitting there prop swinging it going, one, two, three, and then the old guy gets tired and has to go have a cup of coffee before he comes back and tries again. Right, it's basically the same thing. So you want to look after your starter motor. Once the engine's running, release the starter, okay? Because that Bendix unit will keep it engaged and keep it in gear with the ring gear, and if it stays like that, you'll cook your starter motor very, very quickly, which isn't good. Yep. Good. Uh, after start, we talked about that, so make sure there's an initial charge rate after startup, slowly returning to near zero if you have a center zero. Always monitor the ammeter during flight and beware of any large deflections. So, full to the left or full to the right normally means that it's an instrument failure, but be very cautious of a positive charge or an extended positive charge on a uh, center zero ammeter because it means it may be overcharging the battery, which is not good. Right. Uh, make sure the master's off at the end of the flight because if you leave the battery on overnight, it's the same as leaving the lights on in your car, it'll die, and then when you get there in the morning and you turn the key, you'll get that click, Ow. and then you have to go get a battery, or you have to ask one of us to prop it, and it's not good. Amateur readings that indicate faults. Okay, so if there's not enough current on a left zero ammeter, it'll show either a very low abnormal reading, you'll be used to what'll be normal, or it'll show zero, right? If it's a center zero, it'll show a negative charge, right? So that's showing there's not enough current for what's going on. Minimize the electrical load, so turn off avionics, turn off lights if it's daytime, turn off things you don't need, okay? And consider landing somewhere. Too much current on a left zero, you'll get a very high reading, higher than normal. You will get used to what is normal depending on which aircraft you're in. Centre zero, you'll get a high positive charge, so that's why we've got these red on the left and the right. Okay. Recycle the alternator, because it may be a voltage regulator that's just pinged for some reason. <coughs> you turn the alternator off and on because it's all in line. It should reset it. If it doesn't and it keeps overcharging, turn it off, minimise the electrical load, come back and land. Don't let it overcharge. Because... <sighs> Not good. And that's turning off the alternator master switch, right? Just the alternator. Just the alternator. If you alternator. turn off the master, then all the electrics go off. No. And then, then you, you know, it's, it's basically the same as having a dead battery, so what was the point of, you know, anything? You may as well use up the battery while you've got it. And when you're starting, will you normally have both switches on or just the battery one? On? No, I, I leave the battery. Because again, the alternator takes a little bit of current, you're trying yep. to minimise all that load before start. Yep. So I just leave the alternator off. Yep. Okay. Because otherwise you're using the starter motor which drains electricity mm -hmm. to power the alternator which also drains electricity because it's not at a high enough RPM. And it's just like this endless loop of using more electricity yep. than you need. So, yeah. Um, if you have an alternator failure, the left zero ammeter will show a zero. The center zero will show a negative and you'll normally get a light, okay? So a voltage light or a uh, ammeter light or, a, sorry, an alternator light. Minimize the electrical load, consider landing somewhere soon. If you have a fuse blow or a circuit breaker pop, you can reset it, but only once if there's no other symptoms. If there's blue smoke, if it smells funny, don't reset the circuit breaker. I will say it because people have done it and it's then got quite hot and, and red. All right, so 
Battery, common systems, 12, 24 volt alternator, needs a little bit of current to get going. Powered normally belt driven by the uh, engine. The bus bar is basically like a connector for all the different systems. So imagine your USB port, USB extension thing. So you're plugging in all your lights and avionics into one of them. Then you plug in your landing gear and flaps into the other one. They've all got switches on them so you can turn one bus bar on and off and that sort of thing. Uh, over voltage protection, so there's an over voltage, uh, a voltage regulator which stops the alternator overcharging the battery. And then there's also a over voltage relay, which if it starts over, if the voltage regulator fails, it'll stop it charging a battery entirely. If that happens, reset the alternator. If it still keeps overcharging, turn the alternator off, minimize electrical load and land. Ammeters, left zero and center zero. So center zero shows charge to and from the battery. So after start, you're expecting to see a little bit of charge to the battery, and then in a normal flight, you're not expecting to see any discharge. Um, a left zero ammeter after start, you're expecting to see it to be relatively high, coming back to stabilize sort of around the normal range for that aircraft. It depends on aircraft to aircraft. If you've got a failure on a left zero ammeter, it'll read zero. If you've got a failure on a center zero ammeter, it'll read a negative charge. Circuit breakers, fuses, reset them once. If it smells bad, don't reset them. Um, normal electrical operation, battery on, start up, after start, turn the alternator on. Make sure it's shown a charge, then turn all the other electrics on. Um, before shutdown, make sure you turn everything off that you don't need and then shut down. Electrical malfunctions, yeah, if they're not working um, or you have to turn the alternator off for whatever reason, minimize the electrical load and then consider landing somewhere. Sound good? Alright, let's take a five minute breather, have a stretch, stretch your legs. It's weird though, Perth's coming up here. Except for, except for the summer, it's ridiculous. Yeah. But over winter, it's kind yeah, of similar quite, temperature. It's quite so you get everything, it's quite higher. Uh, you get everything from the sea as well. You get the big heat, uh, west away. The doctor. Now nah, my worst, worst one in Aussie was we did a sailing regatta in Melbourne over, and it was in January, Oof. and we had four days of 40 degree heat, and it was like someone, and it was coming off the land, so it was dry, it was like someone pointing a hairdryer in your face, it literally felt like that, and it got to the point where we were all drinking about three litres of water a day, no one went to the bathroom once, <laughs> like you just sweat. Wow, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Oh, it was, it was, it so was brutal good. though, because we'd, we'd only taken the minimum water out we were allowed to, which mm. would be about three litres per person. Um, and then we, we could be out on the water for like eight hours racing. And after about six hours, you'd drunk, well, after four hours, sometimes you'd drunk all your water. You got another two or three hours of racing to go. And you just, <laughs> oh no, and then you stop sweating, and you're like, well, oh, this is going to go bad soon. <laughs> but yeah, that's all right. Aussie's nice. Unless you're a fan of like, no, I'm not gonna make that joke. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what I'm gonna do. That's okay. You I don't even have to say it. I was like, no. <laughs> See, look at me being all PC and good, but you guys are all horrible people for thinking. <laughs> all right. Instruments. Who's excited? You know what we're going to do before instruments though? Pop quiz. Pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, why do we have a manual mixture control and idle cutoff? Why is there just... Why do we not just leave the mixture as is? Why do we have the option to adjust it? Well, efficiency and better performance at higher altitudes. Why? Because um, different the uh, different um, air yeah. uh, pressures. Cool. How do we use the mixture? Um, just like similar to the well, just push for um, rich and pull for lean. Yeah. Do I just? I want to lean it out, so I pull it all the way out. No. You um, just slowly adjust it and look at your RPM, um, and when it's uh, when it peaks, that's 
that's where you should be with it. I'm surprised at the stuff you pay attention to, to be honest. <laughs> but yes, you're right. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, what is the difference between detonation and pre-ignition? Someone other than Harry and Co. John, Devin, or Abby? Go on. <laughs> Someone go. John, <laughs> you're looking away trying not to take my contacts. <laughs> um, What's the difference between detonation and pre ignition? Pre ignition. Pre ignition would be the start. <laughs> Um, yep, so it can be the start, it can lead to detonation, that's right. Okay. What's the, what's the key characteristic of pre-ignition that's different to detonation? Pre-ignition. <laughs> Pre, um, before <laughs> detonation? Yeah. Um. Pre-ignition. <laughs> when <laughs> when the um <laughs> oh my god someone else want to want to help John out here? Yeah, everyone's like looking through their books seriously god someone help me out anyone god, is, um, is pre ignition when um the spark plug um, ignites the compressed air which pushes the piston back down um, before like, it's properly compressed all the air. Is that right? Yeah, on the right track, but it's not the spark plug. Oh, okay. Well, it can be. Oh, what's it? Maybe. Nope. No. What's it caused by? Deposits in the. Yeah. Spark. So, like heated up lead deposits or a hot, really hot cylinder temperature or really hot spark plug. And then detonation is the explosive. So pre-ignition might be a smooth burn, just at the wrong time, right? Whereas detonation is an explosive burn. It's about 25 times faster. Um, how can we avoid detonation and pre-ignition? Enrich the mixture. Yep. Reduce pressures in the cylinders by throttling back in. Increasing air speed to assist with reducing some of the Nice. How do you know that? You're in zero, zero. Yeah, so, you know, making sure, one, you do have the mixture leaned appropriately, but if you start to see high CHTs, enriching the mixture a little bit, so managing your temperatures appropriately, right? Engine management is really, really important, okay? Um, if you are operating at a high power setting, make sure you're also operating slightly richer than you need to be. If you're operating at a lower power setting, then you can leave it out of here. Um, so yeah, keep in mind that. Um, what is the advantages of a fuel injection system? Devon. Uh, more fuel. More fuel. <laughs> <laughs> what are the advantages of it? Anyone? More efficient. Yep, it's more efficient. No icing. No icing. Um, what are the downsides? Oh, yeah. The bumpers. <laughs> <laughs> Repairability. What's that? Repairability, so if it's yep. cuts itself, it's hard. Yep. Just remember, by the syllabus, that's, uh, that's an operational point rather than a syllabus point, because in the syllabus they ask you questions like, what are the disadvantages of a car? And they will say maintenance is one of the disadvantages of a car because they break even though it's similar. But yes, um, So even though they break more. So a fuel injection system mm -hmm. is significantly more reliable. However, it's just much more complex to repair. Right. A carburetor is less reliable, but very, very easy to fix. Right. Cool. Um, vapor locking, so the bubbles, it's called vapor locking, right. <laughs> and contamination as well. Um, what's the difference between direct and indirect injection? Um, in 
direct is in the into the manifold. Yep. And um, directs into the cylinder. Excellent. Um, what color is Avgas? A hundred lower leaded. Blue. What color is Mogas? Above ninety one. Yeah. What color is Avter? <laughs> GA1. Straw. Straw. Nice. It sometimes is very, very clear. It doesn't, it's only slightly straw coloured. Um, what are the problems with using MoGas in aeroplanes? Or in, in at gas engines? Okay. Huh? Lower gas. Low gas or low gas? Low gas. So using normal, like what you get at the BP station in your aeroplane, as opposed to half gas. One more. Hmm? Engine one run. Engine might run. Oh, okay. It would shut down. Yeah. If it's more gas. Damage it. Yeah. So it could be more gas is more volatile. Oh. It's got less safety precautions, less quality control. Right. So it can be. An issue. Uh, what are the common fuel contaminants? Name three. What a paint. Right. What a paint and rust. Try again. Water. Yep. Paint and rust. <laughs> 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 What's that? Is that rubble? Rubble. Rubble. Rubber. Could be. I mean, silt is probably another common one. Sorry. Uh, silt. So like dirt. Oh. Dirt. Right. That's a pretty common one because underground fuel tanks, if there's any leaks, anything like that. Um, and then just random contaminants. So dirt, rubber, whatever it might paint. be. Flex, paint, rust. <laughs> it actually just be bits of metal that have rusted. Because the rust itself would just dissolve because it's fuel. But that's all right. Um, what's the whole point of an exhaust manifold? What does the exhaust manifold do? Exhaust. Yep. What does it do with it? Where does the exhaust gas come out of? Cylinder. Yeah. And then what happens? It just comes out of the cylinder and it's sort of <laughs> into the air. This burst the waste of the engine. Yep. What else does it do? Uh, it's used for car heat. Yep. So the exhaust can be used for car heat. Also creates a little bit of back pressure as well. Right? So if it just went straight into the air, you'd end up, um, because of the valve overlap, you'd end up putting a whole lot of fuel out into the air. The back pressure allows it to be nice and efficient in the amount of fuel that gets pushed through for scavenging of gas. By back pressure, you mean the differential pressure between the manifold and the cylinder? Or yeah, so if, 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 you're, if you're taking the air and just shooting it straight out of the exhaust valve, mm -hmm. there's no pressure pushing back on it. Whereas if you have an exhaust manifold and you're trying to get so much air through that and it's a small space, mm -hmm. you can't. It'll have some pressure in it. Right. So it, it just allows for fine tuning of the engine. So is that why your exhaust manifold would normally be a quite a small tube or a large tube? No, they're generally quite large tubes. Quite large. It's not much, but it does just allow for slightly more efficient burning. Okay. Um, but fundamentally, it routes the exhaust gases away and out of the aircraft. Uh, why is it important that the exhaust manifold is properly sealed? What's bad about exhaust gases? The fumes? Yeah. You don't want it to get into the cabin. Yeah. Yep. yep. So that's why we seal it, right? Because yep. if we just like huffing carbon monoxide, then that. Uh, right. It wouldn't be so good. All right. Um, what are the possible sources of carbon monoxide gas? Exhaust. Yeah, what we were just wanting, the exhaust, right? Um, what are the indications of carbon monoxide? How can we detect it? Being that it's colourless, tasteless, and odourless. Lighthead. Yep. We can experience the symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, anyway, before then... <laughs> There's a detector in the aircraft. 
Yep, so legally we have to have a detector in the aircraft or an indicator. How else? What can you smell? Where you said exhaust gases are where carbon monoxide comes from. Can you smell exhaust gases? Yeah. Yeah. You can't smell the carbon monoxide specifically, but you can smell the exhaust oh, gas. Okay. So if you smell exhaust gas, start being a bit suspicious. Right? Well, if you smell that burning smell, be suspicious. Uh, all right. What is the purpose of an impulse coupling? I'll give you a hint, it's got to do with magnetos and starting. I've given you half the answer now. What was the question again? Sorry? What's the purpose of an impulse coupling? Starting the engine. Starting the engine, what does it do? What sort of spark? G'day. Do you have the Tim's beautiful stencils? Do I have Tim's beautiful stencils? Do you need them? Uh, I don't need them. I don't think I have them either. They're not in there. They're not there. Right. They might be in the small room. Okay. Do you Tim made up all these nice stencils so we don't have to draw stick planes all the time. <laughs> Other than Daryl, all of us instructors can't draw. Daryl's like an artist. So he's like, oh, just do it like this. And then we do it and it's like... All right, you didn't get out of that question. Um, what is the purpose of an impulse coupling? <laughs> you are on the right track. Next spark. What sort of spark? What sort of, is it a normal spark? High energy. Oh, there we go. You look like you're reading that somewhere. Well. <laughs> a high energy spark. Yep, cool. Um, we haven't gone over solid state ignitions. We need to do that. What's the procedure for starting an engine in cold temperature? Just prime the throttle. Prime the throttle? Yeah. All right, throttle. Today, you're going <laughs> to... Pump the throttle. Pump the throttle? Why? What does that do? Prime it. How? <laughs> How? <laughs> Primes the fuel one, so by the time that you go to start, there's a little bit of fuel in the cylinders to ignite. Yep. But how does it prime? By pumping the throttle. Because we could use primers, right? If we had primers. Why are we pumping the throttle instead of using primers? What system is it? Back to carbs. It's the vacuum. Uh, the vacuum. Uh, the X accelerator system, right? Accelerator system? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Right? <laughs> so as you push the throttle in quickly, it gives you a spit of fuel into the inlet manifold. So that's how you write it. Why is it when I talk through the subject, you know, I don't need to write this down, it's not important. Because every time I write like it reading down, off the syllabus, every time like, I write oh. stuff down, I miss what you're saying. <laughs> you totally look back Just tell me time. to stop. No. No. Accelerate. Accelerate. I'll be honest, the worst time I've taught this course was today. No, um, <laughs> was I had an aircraft engineer sitting in on the course. Oh. <laughs> and every time I'd say something, I'd just look at him, and his way of finding something interesting was to go, That's insane. So he'd sit there and shake his head while I'd, after I said something, I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> so at the end, I was like, Did I get some of that wrong? He's like, No. Nah. But you were shaking your head. He's like, was I? <laughs> I can sort of click. But he's like, ah, oh. okay. The time it was real good was when, he, when we were talking about um, gas turbines and one of the guys had heaps of questions and I was like, oh, I see you. Because <laughs> that's all he worked on. Um, all right. Why do we not do rapid power changes? So go from really high power to really low power. An engine. I don't know if that helps, but I'll try to be more specific. <laughs> what are the what's the hazards of going from a really high power setting for an extended period of time to a really low power setting? 
just right away. What's that? Stops. It stops? Mm. Nope. <laughs> no. What happens to the engine temperature at a really high power setting? It's hotter. It's hotter. What's the engine temperature at a really low power setting? It's cold. It's colder. Shit. So if you change really quickly... Go and shit. It shatters. It doesn't actually shatter. I feel like that one glass analogy might have been a bit lost on you there. Sure. It's not like you pull the power back and you just hit this. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> right? Um, Potential to damage. Yeah, shock cooling. Shock. Right? So thermal shock. So you have the potential in there. Shock. <laughs> um, why do we need to monitor and cross check engine instruments? So, you know, uh, oil pressure, temperature, cylinder temperatures, exhaust gas temperatures. What's the point of that? Why do we look at them? Why do we not just eh, go flying? Which you guys probably do already, so that's right. Why do we monitor the engine instruments and cross-check them? So that we can predetermine any faults uh, or like hazards while we're in the air uh, instead of finding out like the last minute. Yeah, nice. So we can start seeing trends. Oh, the engine's getting a bit hot. Okay, let's fix it. Oh, that's not fixing it. Why is it not fixing it? Oh, shit. All right, let's go back. But it's all about monitoring what's going on. Right? If you pick trends up nice and early, you can normally troubleshoot them. What's the possible cause for rough running in New Zealand normally? Not like cross country, like running over rocks, that sort of rough running, like engine rough running. Icing? Icing? What sort of icing? Wing icing? Nose icing? Face icing? Uh, Wheel icing? I'm trying to list everything other than what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Injector Carb. icing? Carb icing. Carb icing, nice. What else could cause rough running? Uh, one of the mag magnetos. Um, oh. um, Mags, fuel, anything. Uh, mixture as well. <sighs> Sorry, I was just trying to be disappointed. So. <laughs> <laughs> Systems are normally electrical in a light aircraft. Lights, radio, um, some instruments, fuel, um, fuel, <laughs> fuel. <laughs> <laughs> fuel. <laughs> fuel. <laughs> um, All right. Um, what type of batteries are there? Alternator. What type of batteries are there? Lead, acid, and someone else get the other one. Chemical. Lithium. What? Lithium. Nope. Calcium. Nope. <laughs> That's what's in your bones. <laughs> NICAD is the short name for it. There you go. Okay. Yeah, there are lithium batteries, just not in our aircraft yet. They're not certified for general aviation. They're only certified for experimental and micro lights. Um, all right. Cool. What's an alternator do? It charges the battery. Cool. How does it work? Um, oh. It gets spun by the propeller and um, it's in AC? Yep. And it needs to be rectified to DC. Oh, that's his fucking notes. Oh, wow. I'm almost <laughs> proud. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And what's the typical voltage of the alternator compared to the battery? Um, the alternator needs to be like higher so it can fully charge it. What's a bus bar? So connected. All the electronics. Cool. A lot, of, a lot of cocktail bar in the back of like a Richie's van. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alright, what does the voltage regulator do? <laughs> it's in the name. Too much voltage. Yeah, cool. Um, what type of ammeters are they? Suction. Yeah. Oh, Excellent. Um, what's the general rule with fuses and circuit breakers? You can push them back in once if there's if you don't smell any like anything wrong. Well, just if there's anything wrong. Yeah, if stuff's not on fire and burning and it's all going bad, you can reset them. 
why would we not use high power systems on the ground before start? So things like avionics and uh, yep. <laughs> so why do we not sit there on the ground with the battery on and the avionics on and all the high power lights on and the Can radar on? Drain up the battery. Cool. Yep. Uh, all right. Uh, why do we avoid prolonged operation of the starter motor? You'll break it. <laughs> yep. You'll break it, you'll drain the battery quick. Right? If it's not starting after a few cranks, it's not going to start if you just It's not like a car. You know, where you sit there, like cranking the key for 30 seconds, puffing the gas, going, come on! It's not like that. If it doesn't start after a couple cranks, let go and try again. Right? Give it another prime, do the flat and start procedure. Don't just sit there cranking it because one, you break it, two, make the battery flat. Why do we release the starter once the engine is running? Because the uh, starter is only meant to go like 200 to 250 RPM and the engine idles at like a much higher RPM. Those are arbitrary numbers by the way, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't sit there and do the exam and write in, hey, we're six. <laughs> the max, up, the, the right max right RPM of right. all starter motors is. <laughs> um, but yeah, significantly lower than normal ones. All right. Um, how do we know if the starter itself is actually released from the ring gear after start? So we let go on the key, how do we know it's actually... Is there any signal or... Is a signal? Warning? The RPM? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's lower. It could, it could be. There you go, a starter light. Right. That's important. Um, all right. Done that, done that, done that, done that, that's all good. How do we change fuel tanks when we're in flight? So we're on the left tank and we want to change to the right tank. Fuel selector. Yep. Do we do anything else? Um, I don't know if I covered this, so this would be an interesting one. Is there anything else we can do to help uh, protect us against... I don't know, maybe while we're going from left to right, the, we accidentally go through off for a little bit to, you know, maybe keep the fuel pressure up. Fuel pump. There you go. <laughs> right. So when you're changing tanks, fuel pump on, wait a couple of seconds, change the tanks, leave the fuel pump on, wait for a couple of seconds, like 15, 20 seconds, make sure the fuel pressure's all good, everything's good, then turn the pump off. Right. Just gives you a bit of extra redundancy, make sure that it's sucking fuel from there. Because when you change tanks, there will be a spot where there's not much fuel going through the line for a second. Yeah. If you have the fuel pump on, when you change tank, it's going to suck the fuel up and push it through quicker. So that catches up and you don't get the purr, purr, purr. Yeah. Well, you get... Will All the right. first pump or fuel pump normally run from one tank or both? So what the fuel pump will be in line in the fuel system, so it'll be after the tank selected. After the tank selected. Yeah, so it doesn't matter what tank you're on. Right. Um, why is it important that we earth the aircraft while we're refueling? Not so fast. Same what? static. Um, Same static as the aircraft and the fueling station. Yep, cool. Uh, what are the functions of an engine lubrication system? Why do we need engine lube? To clean the yep. system. Cool. And it's like a really crappy business slogan. <laughs> We clean, cool, and... Lubricate. Yeah. Lubricate. Right. I did say the engine lubrication system. <laughs> <Yeah. right. laughs> um, what's viscosity? Abby. No. <laughs> what is it? What is a viscous substance? Give me an example of a high viscosity substance. All right, <laughs> someone else. Abby's tapping out. Honey. Honey, or treacle. Yep. What's a low viscosity substance? Water. Yeah, no, no, I couldn't come up with any other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, what does temperature do to the viscosity of oil, Abby? Does temperature increase or decrease the viscosity of oil? 
So if we increase the viscosity, does it get thicker or thinner? So as we heat it up, it gets thicker. You just said if we increase the viscosity, does it get thinner or thicker? Yeah. So if you increase the thickness, does it get thicker? Yeah. So then the so viscosity is going up, it's getting thicker. So if it's going up when the temperature is going up, getting warmer, isn't there something wrong? You didn't mention the temperature. You've <laughs> <laughs> gone in a bit of a loop here. Okay. What was my question? <laughs> what happens to the viscosity of oil with temperature? Change the temperature. Yep, which way? If it's hot, it gets thinner. Yeah. So as the engine heats up, it sort of breaks down a little bit and gets thinner. It's like honey. Less dense. Right? If you heat up honey, it gets runny. Mm. Yeah, that's uh -huh. a good There you go. Honey is a great, it's not a great lubricant, but it's a, it's a, it explains a way. Yep. All right. Uh, what's the difference between a wet and a dry sump in an oil system? One is for aerobatic. <laughs> the, the dry, is, the dry one has a dry sump have that a wet sump doesn't? Uh, has its own reservoir. The dry so it's got its own tank and it's also got a cooler. Scavenger. Yeah. Scavenger valve. Nope. Uh, pump. Uh, pump? Yep. A scavenger pump. Right? So it's collecting all the oil in the system rather than just some of it. Um, all right. Why is it important that we use the correct type and grade of oil for the aircraft that we're using? So it can properly lubricate clean and cool. <laughs> That's such a cop out answer. <laughs> but it works. Um, yeah, because if we don't use the correct grade, the viscosity might be wrong, um, it may be the incorrect type of oil, so it may be a mineral oil when we need an ashless dispersant or a synthetic when we need a mineral or whatever it might be. Um, what happens if we have too much oil? Temperature goes down. What happens if we have way too much oil? Yeah. Stuff starts blowing and then oil goes everywhere. And then we run out of oil. So we started with too much oil, and because we had too much oil, we now have not enough oil. What if we start with not enough oil? It's too hot. And then it stops working. It stops working. Yeah. Not enough oil is bad. Alright. I think pop quiz. Is how do we do? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. <laughs> Over. Oh. Now on to pressure instruments. Yay! All right. You guys, you guys, still all right? You yes. need to stand up and a stretch for a second. You gonna manage? <laughs> Oh. Okay, so pressure instruments, we will discuss pressure and then we'll go through the three main pressure instruments. So the airspeed indicator, ASI, the altimeter and the vertical speed indicator, VSI, and then the associated malfunctions with that and what happens when they do malfunction. Again, interrupt me if you have any questions. If you want me to stop so you can write stuff down, just sing out. Alright, so three basic instruments, the airspeed, the altimeter, and the vertical speed information. They give us, or they derive all that information from two sources of pressure information. Static pressure and dynamic pressure. The sum of both of them are total pressure. Okay, So total pressure small enough so that looks a bit weird. Dim plus static. Um, so dynamic pressure, uh, total pressure is dynamic pressure plus static pressure. Okay. 
So static pressure is measured through these static vents here. So they're normally on the side of the aircraft somewhere because if they were directly into the airflow, what would they measure? The propeller. Well, they measure dynamic pressure, right? Because dynamic pressure is when you're running through a room, you feel the wind on, you, on the front of you. That's your dynamic pressure. Static pressure is when you're sitting in the room and it's the atmospheric pressure pushing on you. Dynamic pressure, okay, so that's the additional pressure as a result of movement is measured through the pitot tube. Now that dynamic pressure depends on airspeed and air density. So as we go higher, the air density gets less, so that static pressure gets less, okay? So the total pressure is going to be less as well. So the, so the pitot tube there, does that, re yeah. does that measure dynamic? <laughs> Sorry, pitot tube. <laughs> Yeah, that's what it's called. Oh. Why are you laughing at me for calling? <laughs> I thought you were laughing at me slurring, not the actual name of what I was talking about. So what pressure is the pedo tube going to measure? Dynamic. What pressure is the pedo tube going to measure? Yeah. So if I'm running through the room, yeah. I feel dynamic pressure on me. As soon as I start moving, does that mean I now no longer feel any atmospheric pressure? No. No. So what does that measure? The moving dynamic pressure. So there's no static pressure inside that. And static pressure. So it... Total. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. Good, good. So we get total pressure from the pedo tube, right? Because it's measuring the atmospheric pressure because the atmospheric pressure is there. And it's also measuring the dynamic pressure because that's the pressure as a result of movement. So the you done lads. The altimeter reads static pressure, okay, and it only needs static pressure because as we go up, what happens to the static pressure? Decreases. Yeah, it goes down, and it's in a fairly calibrated way, right? So it's fairly easy to measure, okay. The vertical speed indicator measures a rate of change of static pressure, right? Because it's measuring how fast we're going up or how fast we're going down. So it still only uses static pressure to measure our rate of climb and rate of descent. Okay? The airspeed indicator reads both static and dynamic pressure, and it compares the two and translates to airspeed. Okay? So it takes away the static pressure from the total pressure, which gives us the dynamic pressure, right? Because the dynamic pressure is how fast we're moving through the air, which is what we want for flying, because that's the important speed so that we know we're not going to fall out of the sky and so that we know we're not going too fast and the wings are going to fall off. Right? So it takes away the static pressure from the total pressure and gives us dynamic pressure. And I'll show you how it does that in a second. So there's two arrangements. Normally the uh, static vents in the pedo tube are separate. You can also have a pedostatic head. So that's where on the pedo tube there are also static ports around it measuring both uh, total pressure and static pressure. All right, so then we have the airspeed indicator. So the airspeed indicator um, looks like this. It reads airspeed, normally in knots, sometimes in miles an hour. If you're flying a Russian aircraft, kilometers an hour because everything's metric. Other than that, normally knots or miles an hour. Okay. Green, normal operating speed, so that's the speed for operation in normal flying conditions. Bottom of it is our stall speed, the top of it is what we call VNO. So in any condition we can fly up to the green arc there. Above that we need smooth air only. Okay? So the yellow range here, the caution range, goes up to VNE, so our max speed comes down to that VNO. So that's the speed we can fly in smooth air only inside the yellow arc. The white arc is our flap speed, so inside the flap, uh, inside the white arc, we can use flaps. Above that speed, so above, in this case, 97 knots, we can't use flaps. Right? At the bottom of the arc is our stall speed with flaps. You'll notice that the stall speed with flaps and the stall speed without flaps, so the green bottom of the green, bottom of the white, are slightly different. Yeah. The red radial, V and E, right? So that's our never exceed speed. So we never want to exceed that speed. Happy? Yes. 
So the airspeed indicator gets to lots of information. To start with, it gets its information from its pedo tube. So this sticking out into the airflow, pedo tube comes into this capsule here. So this is what pressure is in here. So dynamic. What pressure is in here? Stable pressure. Total, Total pressure. <laughs> don't, don't like it. Total pressure, right? Because it's measuring just what we're getting while we're going forward through the air. Then the chamber it's in is connected to the static pressure, right? So because there's static pressure in here and there's static pressure in here, they cancel each other out, right? If you think of a balloon and you have a balloon in the room that has, you haven't blown into it, so the pressure inside's the same as the pressure outside, it's all canceled out, right? There's no pressure inside the balloon. If you start running really quick through the air, you'll start inflating that balloon, but the only way you're inflating it or the force you're inflating it with is your dynamic pressure, not um, anything else. So it's vented around it which gives us dynamic pressure. So then this capsule gets inflated to its dynamic pressure. Now as it inflates, it gives us our airspeed. So it reads our airspeed up or down. Okay. Um, does that make sense to everyone? So the pedo pressure is our total pressure and then the inside chamber of the airspeed indicator is vented to the static pressure. Because of that it cancels out so the end reading we get is our dynamic pressure, which is our airspeed. So that's how fast we're going through the air. Okay? Now, our indicated airspeed is our aerodynamic airspeed. So that is basically measuring how, um, how many molecules of air we are going through at a certain time. Okay? So if we're going 75 knots at sea level, or 75 knots at 20,000 feet, we're going to be reading the same amount of airflow over the wings. Okay. If we then look at our ground speed, though, it's going to be different. Why is that? Nope. In a new one day. What happens to the air density as you go up? It's less dense, right? So there's less air molecules in the space. <coughs> All our indicated airspeed is telling us how many air molecules we're going through in a portion of time, right? So it's talking about aerodynamic speed. So if there's less air up there, are we going to have to go faster or slower to get to the same indicated airspeed? Faster, right? So as we go higher and higher, our true airspeed, right? Our true airspeed, which is our actual speed through a meter of air, is going to be higher. Okay, so think about it as your true airspeed is your ground speed in no wind conditions. That's the easiest way to think about it. Okay, as you go higher and higher, you may still fly at the same indicated airspeed, but because the air is getting thinner and thinner, you're going to have to go faster and faster. If you fly at the same true airspeed as you go higher and higher, your indicated airspeed is slowly going to drop. Make sense? Cool. Um, Density decreases with altitude, so our airspeed indicator in relation to TAS is going to underread as our altitude increases, or our TAS is going to increase with uh, altitude from given indicated airspeed. That's the easiest way to think about it. Okay? If I'm going 75 knots at sea level on an ISA day, I'm going 75 knots over the ground in the wind. If I'm going 75 knots at 10,000 feet, I'm now going significantly faster. Hang on, I'll work it out. Uh, how high do we want to fly? Give me give me an altitude that's high. 20,000 feet. 20,000? Okay. Uh, Alright. You can do it. Do you guys have nav computers yet? Your whiz wheels? Oh, I haven't got one yet. Okay. When you get these, you'll, Can't get, Can't you'll get the pleasure of doing that. Alright, so which aircraft are we in? How fast are we going? 100 knots. 100 knots. Okay. And what's the outside air temperature at 20,000 feet? Minus five. 4. No, it's going to be 5. Way less than that. But we'll call it minus 4. It's a hot day. And we're at 20. <laughs> it's a very hot day. <laughs> Alright. So it's minus four degrees, we're at 20,000 feet, we're doing 100 knots indicated, our true airspeed's 142. 
right? So at 20,000 feet, we're going nearly, four, well, we're going more than 40% faster over the ground than we were at sea level. Now do you see why airliners cruise up nice and high? Yeah. Right. So for a given airspeed, so let's take a uh, let's take a ATR that cruises at about 200 knots, okay, at minus four degrees at 20,000 feet. It's now travelling at 280 knots. So it's got an extra 80 knot bonus just from flying up nice and high. Right. Then if you take something stupid like a um, a Blackbird, which I think cruises at 450 or 550 mm -hmm. indicated, and its outside air temperature up high is going to be, to call it minus 15, and let's say it's going at 50,000 feet. I don't know if my calculator has all the data for this. Can this and computer it, work? Yeah. Uh, no, because then I have to explain how to use it. Because right? <laughs> <laughs> right that's opening a whole other can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there in a second. Okay. We'll get there tomorrow. Okay, so uh, at, actually, it goes, it goes a bit quicker. Let's call it 60,000. Just for the sake of argument, one, two, three, 60,000 feet is minus 15 degrees. So we're going 550 knots because we're a blackbird, and we're at 60,000 feet. We're actually doing 1,365 knots just because we're flying at five. Same aerodynamic speed, right? But we're doing more than double, we're nearly doing triple the speed, right? So flying up high is good because you have a higher task because the air is less done. Ground speed is the speed of the aircraft relative to the ground. Happy with that? If you're flying into a headwind, what's your ground speed going to be? Higher or lower than your tats? Higher. If you're flying into a headwind, it's going to be higher. Well, ground speed, yeah. So. Ground speed's going to be lower. Oh. Cool. Tailwind? Oh, yeah. Higher. All right. So our ground speed is um, affected by wind, okay? And our aircraft heading in TAS corrected for with wind will give us our ground speed and our ground direction. So when we get to nav, we get to use this old chat to figure out the actual numbers. Right. Again, I'm not going to go into it too much now <laughs> because we spend a lot of time on it in nav. Okay, so what errors can affect the airspeed indicator? So there's density error. Okay, so density error is to do to do to do with temperature and pressure altitude, okay? So it's the inability of the airspeed indicator to work with TAS. So as we go higher, we don't read TAS, we read airspeed. What is so funny? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why he's laughing. Yeah, I'm been just giggling laughing. the whole time. I was just laughing because he's laughing at nothing. Jesus. I'm like, I have a red dot on my forehead. Someone's about to shoot me through the window. Right? Don't laugh at that. <laughs> Jesus. Um, okay. So density error, that's all about the fact that our um, airspeed won't give us task directly, okay? Position error, so how the, um, how the aircraft is sitting in relation to the airflow. So if there's a strong wind from one side, right? You've got your air aircraft cruising along. If the relative airflow is coming from here, it's not going straight into the pitot tube, so it's not going to read a correct reading, right? Because if you're running directly into the wind, you feel more wind. If you're running across the wind, you feel less wind. Therefore, you're going to feel less pressure, so you're going to have some error. Instrument error, so that's just manufacturing dis uh, differences, wear and tear. Normally, it's disregard, right? Normally, it's pretty much nil. Um, so the correction between them all is ice tea. PCD, right? I remember it as iced tea, pussycat dolls. I don't know why someone told me now it's stuck in my head. You can remember it however you want. I probably ruined it for you. Um, so the I here is indicated airspeed. If we correct that for position and instrument error, we get calibrated. Okay. If we then correct calibrated airspeed for compressibility, I didn't spell that right, but that's right, it's a short version. 
right? So compressibility, that's when you've got your pitot tube going into an airflow and you've got the air coming from here, right? Eventually you'll get to a point where there's so much pressure in here that the airflow coming in sort of starts overflowing, right? So it can't read accurately what it is because you're going too fast. That also takes into account temperature at that point because that's how you get your um, equivalent airspeed because when you're running into air, you're effectively creating heat because you're, you know, if you run into something hard enough, it gets warm, right? It's like a car running into a brick wall. The metal, when it bends, it gets hot. Same with air, it starts heating up, so it makes it less dense. Does that say compressibility? Yes, okay. minus an L or two. Okay. <laughs> I stopped trying halfway through that one, sorry. Um, so that's what compressibility here is. So if we do that, that gives us... I've tried to crack this into a smaller spot. So that gives us our equivalent airspeed. Okay. Now our equivalent airspeed, corrected for denser destiny. Right, you are my de density. My, yep. right. If we correct our equivalent airspeed for our density, we then get pass. Right. So to go from indicated, we have to go to calibrated first, then we go to equivalent, then we get TAS. Got that all written down? That one's important. I think it comes up in tech, it definitely comes up in nav. Okay. Ice tea, pussy cat dolls. I ruined it, but it works. Happy? Uh, Everyone got it? Uh, no, nah, I don't really get it. <laughs> what don't you get? Um, Apart from that diagram, which I've now realised is horrifically complex. So is that just to get your true airspeed? Yeah, so to get to true airspeed, so you start with indicated airspeed, right? Yeah. You start with what you have on the instrument, because that's what you see. So your instrument starts with, um, you start with 100 knots. Right? And then you have to go through the process of correcting for all the errors. So to start with, you correct for position and instrument error. Let's say there was a three knot position and instrument error. Right, so once we've gone through that, we then get we're actually doing 103 knots if we had the instrument all calibrated nicely and we were going perfectly into it, right? Then we take into account compressibility, right? So at 103 knots, the compressibility is pretty much enough, right? It, only once you're going above 200 knots does compressibility start becoming an actual thing. So we can, let's call it one knot just so we've got a number down. So now we're actually doing 104 knots. This could go the other way. We could be doing 97 knots and now actually we're doing 93 knots, whatever it might be. Right? Then we correct it for density. So let's say we're at 10,000 feet. What happens to the air density at 10,000 feet? Decreases. It decreases, right? So for a given indicated airspeed, is our task going to be higher or lower? Uh, higher. Higher, right? So now instead of doing 104 knots, we're actually doing 122 knots. Right. So where, where did the uh, that eighteen knots come from? Is that just like a? I've just this is just an arbitrary number. Okay. <laughs> right. So we've gone from we had a hundred knots on the instrument, then we corrected for the position and the error and the instrument and the wear and tear and that sort of thing. We, okay, we've got that. Now we've actually got one hundred and three knots is what should be reading on the instrument. If we correct that for compressibility, then we should actually be doing one hundred and four knots indicated. Now once we've got 104 knots indicated, if we correct that for density, which is just a calculation, then we get our true airspeed, which is 122, or whatever it might be, okay. right? So can we, can we just do this on the nav computer? Yeah, so what they'll basically do is give you your, um, they'll say your calibrated airspeed is this, assume compressibility is none, or they'll say your equivalent airspeed is this, or you'll say your indicated airspeed is less assume there is no instrument or compressibility error. So basically you get this number and then you skip all these steps, you just correct for density and you get to a similar number. Right? But to do the whole process you need to go through the IC, ICT PCD. Okay. But you just need to understand how all the correction factors work because later on if you become a commercial pilot and you start flying 
bigger, better, faster things, um, compressibility starts becoming quite a big factor in what you're um, actually seeing. Are we happy with that? Yeah. Makes sense again? All right. Then we have an altimeter. So an altimeter has an aneroid capsule. Right? What that means is basically it's a sealed capsule. It's calibrated to be sealed with this much air inside it. It's just, it is what it is. Right? Then imagine it's a bag of chips. Right? What happens when you take a bag of chips on a plane? It expands, right? What happens is you come back down? Contrast. It compresses, right? Next time you go flying, take up a water bottle, take a drink once you're up at altitude, close it up, when you get back down, it's all crunched up. Right? Or don't do it the other way around. I did, made that mistake with a Coke bottle once when we went flying, and I had a drink of it before we went flying, and then you know, I had a little bit, and then got up to altitude and forgot that it would have been highly pressurised and opened it up, and I made it. <laughs> So don't take coke flying. <laughs> um, any form of it. <laughs> so it's a sealed capsule, okay? So it responds to changes in the ambient air pressure. So if we're sitting down at 4,000 feet and we climb, right, the air pressure gets less, so that static pressure reduces, so that capsule is going to expand. So it's got a gearing system on the capsule itself, okay? So as it expands, it's going to move a little wheel which in turn ends up moving the instrument up or down in relation. They're fairly well sensitive. Okay? Now, we've also got an adjustment knob. So we have a little barrow set knob. Why would we have an adjustment knob? Why not right. just leave it the same? So what's that? Like the air pressure. Um, that Why is that important? Like Surely if they were all just set at the same thing, you could just use the same. Same altitude all the day, or the same number every day, can we? Mm. Uh, pressure changes. Yep. So, why don't we just have the same setting? You won't calibrate it. Why? So that everyone's on the same page. Yep. What's the other big reason? Let's say we're at North Shore and it's set perfectly on one day to be at 200 feet, and we come back and it now says 800 feet. And we go flying, and we think the terrain is at 600 feet, so we fly over 800 feet, and actually we're at 200 feet. Again, that's an illegal example, but still, you, you get what I'm getting at, right? So it's all mainly about terrain protection, because once you get above a certain altitude, so once you get into the flight levels, past the transition altitude, which is what? Wait, you guys have done law, haven't you? Good. What's the transition altitude? 13,000 feet. Yep, 13,000 feet. So once you go up past 13,000 feet, what do you set on your altimeter? Uh, 1013. 0.25. Oh. No, 25. You're good. Oh. You were right. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> uh, so yeah, 1013.2 or 1013.25. And then it's basically the same as everyone having an altimeter that's set exactly the same, right? Why is it? Why do we do that? Because there's no you're up so high. Yep. That, There's um, no terrain issues. Yeah. But still, wouldn't it be better if we knew how high the terrain was below us? What's the main reason why? What, air, what aircraft are there that fly up that high? Uh, airline jets. How fast do they go? Yeah, uh, pretty fast. Yeah. So how much ground do they cover and how many different Q&A zones are they going to cover in half an hour? Lots, right? Yeah. So if we didn't have flight levels, your airline pilot would no longer be a pilot. They would just have an entirely automated aircraft and their job would purely just be set the Q&H every three minutes. Right? That's why. It's all about separation from traffic and the fact that once you're clear of terrain, all you're really concerned about is other aircraft. So it makes life easier for everyone. Happy with how an altimeter works? Excellent. So the subscale, it allows us to adjust for atmospheric pressure and it allows us to um, calibrate it so we know how high the terrain is. Um, okay, with the subscale set to sea level pressure, the altimeter reads altitude, which is height above mean sea level. Height above mean sea level, excellent. With the subscale set so that the uh, altimeter reads zero at, let's say, an airfield, what does the uh, altimeter read? What's it called? No? Sorry? Don't know. 
So let's say we're sitting at North Shore and we set the altimeter to zero instead of 212. AGL. Yeah, so it reads us height above the data. Right? So it gives us AGL or what we call QFE. Right? With the subscale set to 1013.25, it gives us pressure altitude. What's the Q code for pressure altitude? Q and E. Okay. So atmospheric pressure is obtained via actual stations at sea level or just what the pressure is somewhere, and then using isobanies, it's reduced to C. Level, okay. Now, if you set the altimeter to Q and H, you get height above sea level. If you set the Q, uh, the altimeter to Q and E, or one zero one three point two five, you get height above what? Height above ISA sea level, right? So it's pressure altitude. Okay? It doesn't give you actual height information above the terrain. Now, if we set QFE, right? Let's say we've got an aerodrome up here and we set QFE. We've now set it to zero at this date. So that'd be really good for doing aerobatics or something like that, because you know exactly how high the terrain is, or the, the ground it is. So it goes, okay, I'm going to do aerobatics at 3,000 feet, and I'm not going to descend below 2,000 feet above ground. Dial it in, cool. The only tricky part about that is when someone asks you how high you are and you have to figure out how high the ground is below you and then go back and then go, oh, I'm this high plus this, and then jump on the radio and tell them. No one really uses QFE in New Zealand unless you're doing a aerobatics competition. And even then it's not used that often. Cool. Q&E, 1013.25, pressure altitude, QFE, reads height above the datum. Happy with that? All right, what happens when the, uh, when the pressure changes? So let's say we're going from, uh, I don't know, New Plymouth to Napier. So we're going over some hills. And the New Plymouth Q&H is uh, 1030, and the Napier Q&H is now 990. What's going to happen to our aircraft if we stay on the same altimeter setting the whole time? So the pressure here is lower. What do we think? Contain lots of blank looks. Plane will drop. Plane will drop. Yeah, it's going to think it's higher than it actually is, right? <laughs> oh no! So if the Q&H is not adjusted, if we're flying from high to low, beware below, okay? So we use the phrase high, low, high, low. So if you're going from high to low, the altimeter will read high, you are low, okay? If you're going the other way, if you're going from low to high, the you, it will read low, you will be high, okay? High to low, beware below, low to high, clear to fly, okay? Just remember, high, low, high, low. Okay, so if you're going high to low, the first one is how you'll read. So the altimeter will read high, you will be low. If you're going from low to high, the altimeter will read low, you are high. High, low, high, low, low, high, low, high. Okay. If you can't remember the high, low, high, low, or low, high, low, high, just remember high to low, beware below, low to high, clear to fly, and then figure it out in your brain. But that tends to be high, harder than just remembering rope rules like this. All right, every hectopascal of error equals 30 feet. Okay? So if you are 10 feet out or 10 hectopascals out on your subscale setting, that's 300 feet of error. Okay? If you are 20, hectopascals out, that is 600 feet of error. If you are 30 hectopascals out, that's 900 feet of error, which is a lot, right? So you have to be really, really careful making sure that you're on the appropriate Q&H setting. Okay, so
Abidjan. Okay, VSI. So, <coughs> excuse me. The VSI measures a change in static pressure. So what it has is it's got two little chambers. It's got one chamber where the static pressure goes in immediately, okay? And then the other one has a metered chamber, so it slowly adjusts it, okay? So the metered chamber is the one in um, the capsule here. Uh, sorry, in the, uh, depends on what setup it is. But in this case, we've got a meter sitting here, right? And the static pressure comes directly into here. Okay, so it's going to, as we're going up, it's going to compress it, right? So there's going to be slightly higher pressure out here, so it's going to compress it. Slowly, it's going to correct itself. If you keep climbing at a constant rate, it's going to be correcting itself at a constant rate, so the VSI is going to reap a constant rate of change. If you climb up and then level off, as you climb up, the air is going to get less dense, so this will expand, and then as you level off, it will slowly equal out the pressure on the outside, so the capsule will come back to being where it normally is, and then it will read zero again. Right. So it's all got a um, metered, yeah, so static pressure comes in, goes into the diaphragm itself, and then there's a metering restriction into the capsule. Sometimes they have what's called a vertical acceleration pump. Basically what that does is as you pull back and go up, inertia from that puts a little bit of air in or takes a little bit of air out. To, it's what we call an instantaneous VSI. So as you do it, it immediately starts reading a climb or a descent. Whereas in most aircraft, or most older aircraft, you're set to climb, and your VSI will read zero, and then after a couple hundred feet, it'll come up and stabilize to where you're at. Cool. So it's all about measuring a rate of change of static pressure. Now, the VSI suffers from a huge amount of lag because of the inherent nature of the instrument. Right, it's relying on a meter delay. Okay? So it takes a few seconds before the instrument will display a stabilized rate, providing you're climbing at a stabilized rate. If you're not, then it's constantly going to be all over the show. That's why it's really important you never just sit and stare at this instrument, because if you sit and stare at this instrument and chase it, you'll end up doing that, and you'll just end up doing snakes around the sky and it's really funny for us to watch but not that great. Yeah. Now an instantaneous VSI can use a pitch gyro or an accelerometer or a, um, a, a vertical acceleration pump uh, to minimize that delay to try and make it as quick smart as possible. Okay. Um, position error so any pressure fluctuations at the static sensors Next time you guys are flying on a really, really windy day, when you're sitting on the ground, just have a look at the static instruments. Every time there's a wind gust, the altimeter will go down 50 feet and then come back up. The VSI will show a 100 foot a minute climb and back down. Right? So when you're sitting on the ground and there's lots of gusts, as one gust comes from the side of the aircraft and one comes from the other, you get this position error. Right? Now, in a Robin, because there's static ports on both sides, if you end up flying around sideways, it cancels each other out because you've got a high pressure on this side because it's more into the airflow, but this side's got a lower air pressure because it's being blanketed from the fuselage. So it reads more or less about the same regardless of whether you're in balance or not. That's a good look, Devin, I like it. <laughs> um, some aircraft only have one static port. Though. So if you're flying along sideways one way, it's going to read something substantially different to if you're flying along sideways the other way. That's why it's really important we fly in balance, student pilots. Right, right. You guys haven't got it yet. But once you start flying, you'll hear that phrase a gajillion times. It gives me PTSD saying right, right, because I do it every day. It's actually my employment contract. Must say right, right, at least seven times a day. All right, so right. serviceability checks. One, make sure you remove the pedo cover. Because if you don't remove the pedo cover, the airspeed indicator will read what? Zero. Right. Someone did that in a barren here. They went, rolled down the runway, took off, had the pedo cover on, and then after it was too late to abort the takeoff, realized the pedo cover was off, 
and instead of taking off and flying attitudes, they aborted the takeoff and ran through the end of the fence there. <laughs> they were fine and walked off it, but that was a million dollar aircraft, which they were, I think, about fifty thousand dollars off writing it off. No, it was a two million dollar aircraft that they were fifty thousand dollars close off writing it off. So it was cool. So uh, make sure you remove the PO cover. Check them for any damage or blockages, so it's part of your pre-flight is looking at the pedo tube and the static sources, making sure they're there. Don't blow into them, alright? I know you think you're really cool grabbing onto the pedo tube and blowing into it, but don't do that. Um, it's not good for the instruments, you know. It is entertaining when an engineer is calibrating them and you have to get it just right and they're sitting there doing that. But, don't blow into them. Okay, especially the static ports because those are really, really sensitive. The pedo tube can take a bit of abuse, um, but it, it's an interesting look seeing people blowing into a pedo tube. Um, the ASI and the VSI should read zero when you're on the ground and not moving, right? Occasionally, the VSI will have a little bit of error. Now, when it sits on the ground, if it's showing 100 foot a minute down, and you're obviously not going 100 foot a minute down because the earth is relatively stable, right? And even though it's flat because we're turning uh wait, hang on. That's uh, flat. No. <laughs> right? Um, if a VSI let's say it reads hundred foot a minute down or hundred foot a minute up, that becomes your new zero, if that makes sense. So you treat that consistent. Yeah, that'll work pretty well. Um, and it's normally just because the needles jumped a little bit or the capsule that shelves itself has jumped a little bit um, and it can get calibrated by an engineer. Obtain a Q&H reference, verify the altimeter reads within plus 30 and minus 45 feet of elevation. You need to know this, right? So what that means is find out what the Q&H is for where you're at. So let's say we're at North Shore, we can listen to the AWIP and it'll say Q&H 1022. So you put in 1022 and it reads, um, I don't know, 200, 200 feet. So it's within the plus 30 and minus 45 feet. The reason why there's less tolerance up than there is down, why do you think that is? Because if it's reading high, it means you're going to be lower than you think you are, right? So you want it, you don't want it to overread. That's really bad. If it's under reading, it just means you're going to be a little bit higher than you think you are, which isn't as bad. Right? Being a little bit higher never got anyone stuck in trees. Right? Being a little bit lower has got lots of people stuck in trees. Alright, pedostatic malfunction. So if we have a pedo blockage, it's only going to affect the airspeed indicator. Okay? It's not going to affect any other instruments because the other instruments are solely static instruments. Right? Now, let's say we uh, block the pit we're cruising along 95 knots and Instantaneously, we block the pedo tube. What's the pedo tube going to read? Zero. Is it? We've instantaneously blocked it. So the pressure in there is still there. Oh, only static pressure. Nope. Same pressure. It's going to. It's going to look exactly the same, right? We instantaneously block it. We never really instantaneously block it, but if we did, it would read the same. Now, as we start going up. What happens to the static pressure? What happens to static pressure as we go up? It gets less. So we have our pedo tube, which is now blocked, going into our capsule and our instant. Bear with me, this is a horrible drawing. Yes, that looks quite fella. <laughs> we have our. Sorry, Tate. Um, going in here. And now the static pressure is going down, right? So now we've got less pressure in here. All right, <laughs> settle down. I'll draw it out the front next time. So what's going to happen to this? So this pressure is going down in relation to what's in here. So what's going to happen to the capsule? Expand. It's going to expand. So as you go up, what's going to happen to the airspeed? It's going to stay high. Yeah, it's going to start reading high, right? As you start. Descending, what happens? Compresses. It compresses, so it's going to read low. So it's going to tell you you're doing 55 knots when actually you're doing 65 knots. Right? So generally, 
it happens because of ice, okay? So the remedy to that is to use pen of energy, right? So that stops ice forming. I mean, if you, if you smoke a, boot, a bird right on the pedo tube, you're kind of unlucky. Maybe you get a bit of flesh in there and it blocks it up all night. Um, or, yeah, I don't know. Mainly ice, right? You'd be pretty unlucky to get anything else happening. Um, but the remedy is pedo head. Um, all right. Oh, hang on, what's going on here? All right, so if we have a static source blockage, um, so the static source is entirely blocked, our airspeed indicator, so we've got our, we're gonna draw this differently now, because you guys are immature. <laughs> now it just looks like a nose, it's a very flat Um All right, so we've got this, but now our static source here is blocked, right? So there's no static anymore. As we go up, what happens to the static pressure in here? Because this is total pressure, right? What happens to the static pressure as we go up? It goes down. So now the static pressure in here is going down. So it's going to be slightly higher in here. So what's going to happen to the capture? It's going to compress, so our airspeed's going to read slower. Slow. Right. So we think we're climbing out at um, 55, actually we're climbing out at 65. As we start descending though, what happens to our static pressure? It increases. So what is that going to do to our airspeed reading? That's why it increases. Yeah. So now we think we're doing 75 knots, actually we're doing 65. What's the hazard with that? Yeah. We think we're going at an all right speed to come into land, and actually we're going 10 knots too slow and we're about to fall out of the sky. You should pick that up on this because the picture outside will look entirely wrong, but can be very, very hazardous. What is the altitude going to read if we block the static source? So there's no more change in the altimeter, uh, in, the, in the static pressure to the altimeter. Yeah, What's going to happen as we go up and down? Stop Nothing. So it's going to just stay the same. What about the VSI as we go up and down? Stay the same. It'll stay the same as well. It'll read zero. So we've got to be quite careful of that because the a um, over reading airspeed indicator in a descent is quite a hazard, right? Because that can lead you to believe you're on the wrong, wrong side of the curve. Remedy: If you have an alternate static source. Use it, and that's what it's for. Otherwise, um, there is suggestion to if what's the least useful instrument out of these three? VSI. VSI, yep. Right? So there is suggestion that if you absolutely needed static pressure, you break the glass to the VSI instrument, and then it gives you static pressure from inside the cabin um, back into the other instruments as well. So are they all connected? to the same source. Yeah. But really, I'd probably just look out the window and fly attitudes and know that your airspeed's over reading and look out the window and go, how high do I think I am? This high. But you know, if you had to for whatever reason, then you could. But then you're gonna have glass or personally sort of through the plane, it's gonna be a bit of a cluster. What are the questions? Around the room, Kai, questions. If that happens, then how would you judge what your airspeed is? Or would you, having flown it enough, would you relatively be able to tell how power, fast you're going? Power plus attitude gives you performance. So the RPM gauge works. You know, if I set this power and put the nose roughly here, mm -hmm. I should get about this. Okay. Same thing with the Baron instead. Instant. If they just set the power they knew and set the attitude, the aircraft would have climbed, took off, climbed, they could have come back and landed, would have been no problem. Mm -hmm. So basically, you know, that if you apply full power and at this attitude, eventually it will just. Yeah, so you know, if I'm at full power and the nose is here, I'm going to climb out at roughly 75 knots. Right. Well, I know if I bring the power back to this and lower the nose, put this amount of flaps on, I should be doing it like this. Okay. Cool.
John, questions? Mm, I need to go back and digest this. <laughs> <laughs> need to go over all of it? <laughs> no, just this <laughs> yeah. Just think about it practically. If Honestly, just draw it out. Like, draw out each instrument and go, okay, if I block the pedal tube, what happens as I climb and descend? If I block the static and input, what happens as I climb and descend? Devin, questions? No, I don't have questions. Really? Okay. Just need to remember this guy. Harry, questions? Uh, I'll, just, I'll just read over everything again. I'll just learn everything you can. <laughs> yeah, let's <laughs> read. Well, that's, you know what that's for? Learning. Study, yeah. Abby, questions? Don't think so? All right, pop quiz time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, I could have been a teacher. This would have been great. I get to do this every day. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> How do you know that? That's when you're sitting on Gateway, because um, we were talking about the teacher strike, and you're like, why are they complaining? They earn more than what we do. <laughs> instruments uh, that rely on air pressure for their operation. Abby, what's one? Cool. Evan? What was the question? <laughs> Three instruments that rely on static. Lance. Yeah, I couldn't show you. Abby said the airspeed indicator. What are the other instruments that use pedo or static pressure to measure stuff? Hmm? We've, we've already said that one. VSI. Cool. Harry? Nice. Excellent. Very good. Pass. Um. Uh, all right, how does the, what pressure does the pedal tube read? Total pressure. Nice. What pressure, or what does the, di or the... Dynamic pressure, that's Yeah, it's nice, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and brain's working faster than my mouth. Um, what affects static pressure the most? What's responsible for the biggest change in static pressure? Altitude. Nice. What about dynamic pressure? Yes. Cool. Good job. Well done. Pass. <laughs> All right. Where are the static vents normally located? On the side of the aircraft. Uh, Why? Someone other than Harry. Because it's not affected by wind, um, by the direction of. Movement. Yep, it's less effective by the direct airflow. What about the pedo tube? What does it do? Why and where? Um, does it measure airspeed? Oh, no, the dynamic pressure. How does it measure dynamic pressure? Um, it takes the static pressure from the air things on the side and minuses it off the total pressure to get the dynamic pressure. Cool. What is a pitot-static head? Just, I don't mean have a guess, it's a pitot-static unit head. Is this static like pressure? And? Uh, total pressure. Oh, excellent. It's a pass. It's a pedo tube and a static port in is one. Is that the one that's going <laughs> in, in the direction that it's yeah. going into, but then also the ones on the side? Yes, yeah, so on the side of the yeah. tube, it'll have the static ports. Cool. Will, that, um, will the tube itself be, um, like, will there be two different air lines within that tube then? Or? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
All right, where where is the pitot tube normally located and why? Um, like underneath the nose of the aircraft. Underneath the nose of the aircraft, just behind the propeller. Uh, no, not just. Oh, really? No. It's under something. <laughs> under the wing. It is under the wing. Yeah. Behind the propeller, or where is it? Not behind the propeller. It's oh. not behind the propeller. Okay. <laughs> Where is it generally located? Middle of the wing. Yeah. Away from stuff, right? It's normally located middle of the wing, underneath, pokes down a little bit, or sometimes it's on the front of the wing and it pokes out. Why is it like that? That's not effective. Why do we not just have it on the top of the wing? Or the side of the wing, or right next to the window. The, like, the different type of airflow yeah, cool that goes yeah. over the wing. Yeah, it's over the wing, the air accelerates a little bit more, so it's going faster. Next to junctions, there's lots of turbulence, so it's not going to flow that well, so they just want to keep it under the wing, and sort of out in a fairly neutral way. Right? So it's not in the way of anything that's going to alter the airflow around. Um, what is the basic serviceability check for a airspeed indicator? If there's uh, like no wind and you're just like stationary on the on the ground, then it should read zero. Excellent. All right, here's the fun one. I get to do some drawing as well, which is great. I can't draw. I get to draw circles, and as a German, this is going to annoy me because you know, I can't draw perfect circles. Yeah, that's it. Oh, that's not bad, eh? It's alright. Alright. For a German. <laughs> Proper German. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> alright, and then. I'm going to just have to write what colours these are because I don't have the colours. Yellow. <laughs> Alright, I want you to name this one, this one, this one, this one. This one? This one? This one? And now. Put your books away. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's start from the bottom. What is this white? For the flaps. flaps. Okay, so what's the bottom of it? With or without flaps? Sweet. Cool. What's that called? VFD. Nope. Q. V. Stall is S. F. Here. What's this one? What's the bottom of the green? Still stall, but within a uh, clean, clean configuration. V. S. One. You should probably draw this diagram so you can remember this. Or just look at your books. Not now, though. Not now. I'm out of it. <laughs> What's this white arc? Someone other than Guy. John, what's the white arc for? Also the flaps. Yep. So, we'll just call it flap operation. Operat. All right. Um, Harry, what's the green arc? Uh, is it just the airspeed that's like safe to fly? Yeah, just normal operating. Normal ops. Uh, Abby, what's the top of the white arc? Bottom of the 
What is the way down? So what's this section here? It's coloured in white and it has flat on the red and put an X to it. So what's the top of the white? I mean, to be fair, you've done some flying, so you should know the answer to this. I'm disappointed. <laughs> Not angry, disappointed. All right, who wants to jump in? How heavy? Maximum flat. Maximum cool. speed the flat can. So it's a V speed. The limit. What V speed is it? Ah, oh, there we go. Oh yeah. She piped up. <laughs> All right, what's the top of the green slash bottom of the yellow called? Devon. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, stall speed at 90 degrees angle of bank. What's this range? So this is going to be our V. Normal lots. So it's going to be our V. Normals. V and then O. Hey! V and O. So it's normal operating speed. Yeah. Velocity. Uh -huh. So anything that's a speed in aviation is V. V1, rotate. VR, VS, VS1, VS2. Uh, VLG, VLR, VMCA, VYSE, V and E, V and O, VFE. Everything's a V speed. Speed is just V, and then the code after it is what it's for. It's just a quick way of referencing speeds. So V and O is our max operating speed. So it's our max operating speed in turbulent air. So above this we have, what's the yellow arc? No, that's the top of the yellow arc. What's the yellow arc? Caution range. There you go. Caution range. So when can we operate in this? Yeah. Now keeping this in mind, some aircraft may have a turbulent air penetration speed, which will be higher, or sorry, lower than V0. So if it's an incredibly turbulent day, they may have a turbulent air penetration speed, which is something odd. Because the last thing you want to do is be right on the edge of V0 and then hit a massive gust and the wings just fold up and yeah, spiral out. It doesn't actually happen, but yeah. Cool, and then the top, the red radial, what's that? There we go, nice. B N E. What does that stand for? Velocity. Well, we covered that one. What's, yeah. <laughs> What's V and E? What is it? My drawing is terrible. Right? Never exceed. Yeah, so it's our never exceed speed, right? We go above that, things just start ripping off, and it's a total. No, it's not quite that bad. So V and E has buffer built into it. So 10% above V and E is when you start getting the first signs of flutter. You don't need to know that, just fun fact. Uh, so V and E, the yellow arc is our caution range, so it's smooth air only. Bottom of the yellow is V and O, so our max operating speed in turbulent air. So if we're above V and O, it has to be still air only. If we're below V and O, then uh, we can operate in turbulent air. Top of the white arc is our max flap extension speed. Okay, Green arc coming through, that's our normal, normal operating range. Um, flap operating range is the white arc, bottom of the green arc is VS1, bottom of the white arc is VSO. We got that right the right way? Yeah. Um, yeah. Happy? Everyone got a photo of that or copied it down or done something?
what's the relationship um, between indicated airspeed and TAT? All right, so to get to TAS, what's the first thing we correct the indicated airspeed for? Devon. Position of the Nice. And what does that give us? Abby. Oh, um, nope. Mm-hmm. So we've corrected for position and instrument error. What airspeed does that give us? Plus or minus three more. Calibrated airspeed. Those numbers are arbitrary. Don't don't oh. don't remember those numbers. Those numbers are not important at all. That's the process. Yep. So calibrated airspeed. Then if we correct calibrated airspeed for what, Harry? Uh, compressibility. We get what, Kai? Oh, we've caught him out. Yes. I know it's E. I can't remember what it stands for. Equivalent airspeed. So then if we correct that for what, John? D. Yep. If we correct it for D. The direction. Nope. Density. Density. Yeah, you are my density. Um, we get what? Nope. What's the last airspeed? The yes. TAS. Yay. Yeah. So how do we get ground speed? So what is TAS? Yeah, speed over the ground in no wind conditions, right? So how do we get our ground speed? You know your exams aren't like this, eh? You don't have me like popping up in the corner being like, it's There you go. Wind velocity. Alright, so our task corrected for wind velocity is going to give us our ground speed. Well, ground direction. Um, cool. Alright. Serviceability checks for an altimeter. Go. What's the first thing you do? Right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Turn on the... Turn on the altimeter. Nice. Okay, so the altimeter's on. Been on all night. We always leave it on. It's very weird. Um, we obtain a... Q&A. Nice. We obtain a Q&H reference. Then, what are we checking? That it's plus... Thirty and minus. Nice. There we go. Good. All right. Um, if we're flying from high to low, is the aircraft going to be higher than the altimeter or lower than the altimeter? Low. Low. What if we're flying low to high? Uh, okay. okay. Will the altimeter overread or underread if we're uh, going from low to high? Good. Um, you will get questions on that, guaranteed, pretty much every single time. Uh, if we block the pedal tube, what instruments are affected? VSI, ASI, and what's the other? Oh, wait. ASI. Just the ASI? Universal? Nice. Good. All right. Given a sample deviation card, show how to apply corrections. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Alright. Uh, state what magnetic dip is and how it's 